Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Greg Evans with Florida Department of Transportation, and I'm be serving uh, as the chair of uh, this task force. Also, thank you to uh, Jason Peters, who serves uh, as our co-chair. And I thank you for joining us today, and I hope that you and your family and your communities continue to be well and safe. And I want to take uh, just a minute for uh, everyone to join me in, with our thoughts and prayers <clears throat> going out to those uh, storm-impacted uh, uh, families out in uh, Texas and, and Louisiana. They got hit very hard last night and continue uh, through uh, today. Uh, I want to express my appreciation for your continued participation in these, uh, these meetings. As I know that uh, you're all very, very busy balancing your professional uh, and personal lives during these unprecedented times. The work that we're doing as a task force is a critical element of this program. And on behalf of FDOT and our entire state, I want to say thank you. Uh, for your continued commitment. <clears throat> Excuse me, got a little frog this morning. Um, these events uh, is, are streaming over the Florida Channel and our program website at uh, floridamcores.com. Uh, we also provided two in-person viewing locations uh, accessible to the public in the study area, one at Old Town and one at Crystal River. And we have staff there uh, to support any needs of uh, the community that may uh, have uh, questions or comments. <clears throat> As always, public input is an important uh, to our process. Uh, we have opportunities for public comments at the end of the meeting today. And if you wish to address the task force and have not registered yet, uh, you can do so by registering at uh, floridamcorp.com. Uh, but you need to do that before 4 p.m. this afternoon. Uh, we will hear from all members of the public who would like to address the task force today. And uh, first, we'll do those who registered at, uh, to comment virtually, and then we'll go to the two remote locations uh, and uh, allow that opportunity as well. Additionally, we have a community open house scheduled for September 1st at the Monticello Opera House in Jefferson County. Uh, this will also be conducted in a hybrid format. The open house uh, is another opportunity for us to share project information and receive comments from our public. And I'm sure that you have noticed <laughs> today's agenda is quite a bit longer in our previous meeting. Uh, right now, our plan is to work until around 12.30, take a lunch break, resume around 1.30, work until five. And then at that time, we will receive uh, public comment. We also have a few breaks built in to the agenda as well. Uh, this morning, you'll hear an initial report on the department's work to begin to narrow the study area to potential passing courses to guide future planning and project development. I do want to emphasize that we will show you today, what we will show you today is a uh, simple illustrative maps uh, to, to reveal the processes that uh, we're using to move forward with your recommendations to in the, the uh, corridor development. These maps reflect your guidance during the past few months on high level needs, guiding principles, uh, as well as avoidance and attraction areas. Um, as you complete your work in the next few meetings, a couple of meetings, we will be able to take your recommendation and use them to finalize these analysis. Uh, the F Florida legislator charts each task force with providing recommendations and evaluations in a final report, which will guide the FDOT in its subsequent study phases through implementation of the high level needs, guiding principles, and instructions provided by this task force. Um, our primary focus today continues to be on drafting key elements of your recommendations guiding principles and instructions for project development and beyond. Uh, we appreciate the robust discussion we had on this topic at our last meeting, uh, as well as many comments we received from you via email following that meeting. Uh, we integrated all of these comments in the uh, draft, to the revised draft. You all received uh, the draft language via email last week, and I hope you've had the opportunity uh, to review. <clears throat> We also take a few minutes toward the end of the agenda today to review the drafts of earlier section of your report uh, that staff have uh, pulled together with focus on high level needs, uh, the uh, high level needs section. Uh, the goal is to support your de uh, deliberation. So uh, please let us know what you may need throughout the day. Um, we anticipate two more meetings between now and October to complete our work. Uh, given the continued uncertainty about the timing of re resuming large gatherings, we will continue to uh, uh, setting dates and designing meeting formats for the combination of virtual and in-person ways for both task force members and the public to participate 
and remain nimble and adapting to our format over time. At this point, we are targeting the week of September 21st for meeting number eight and the week of October 19th for the final meeting number nine. We'll be in touch as soon as we have finalized the dates and other details. So it is now my pleasure to turn the, the uh, program over to our great facilitator, Mr. Greg Vaughn. Move the microphone over. Yes. There we go. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to briefly cover uh, several topics, um, like typically just kind of set everything up. We're going to talk about the pub public comment period, <clears throat> the logistics for today's meeting. Uh, we'll review the agenda and objectives as well as some of the materials, and then we'll have a brief Florida Sunshine reminder. The public comment period begins at 5 p.m. or as soon as we are done with task force member discussion. We will receive comments virtually and then subsequently from our two physical public viewing locations. Requests to provide comments virtually received by 4 p.m. today will be addressed during the public comment period in the order in which they were received. If you have not registered to provide public comment uh, during today's virtual meeting and wish to do so, please sign up on the website under today's event. If you need the link emailed to you, please use the raise your hand function and one of our team members will email you the link to sign up. Requests to provide comments at one of the public viewing locations can be made by completing a public car, a, 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 a public speaker card on site at the registration area. The meeting is being recorded and will be available with other materials on the MCORS website. You will remain muted for the presentations and once we get into the task force member discussions, we will shift to a more interactive format just so the task force members understand kind of how we'll, we'll roll today. Similar to the previous webinars, our discussion today will be more like an in-person meeting. Instead of putting up your tent card to indicate you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can simply use the raise your hand function feature. Uh, we would ask that you remain self-muted when not speaking in order to reduce the background noise though. I generally will recognize people in the order that they raise their hand, although as we do as in our in-person meetings, I may manage the flow at times uh, to allow members who we've not had an opportunity to make a comment or speak to be able to do so or to wrap up one thread of conversation before we begin another. Just as a reminder, if you have self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. And a quick reminder, please do not put the webinar on hold or take another call as we will hear your hold music. And one last note, we may have adjusted your username to readily identify you as a task force member for when, you, uh, for when we need to unmute your line. Please don't make any changes to your username so that you may be heard during roll call and the Q&A period. The objectives for today are to discuss how the task force recommendations will be used, to provide an update on recommendations framework and the work plan, to establish initial consensus on guiding principles, to discuss draft instructions for project development and beyond, to review draft task force report sections with focus on the high level needs, and to receive public comments. Here's a quick recap of today's agenda. As uh, Secretary Evans had commented, it is, it is pretty packed today. So we broke it up into two slides. This is the morning agenda. Um, we're gonna run through a government and sunshine refresher in just a second. We'll take roll call. We'll then have a presentation from Will Watts, FDOT Chief Engineer, highlighting how the task force's work on guiding principles and instructions will be used by the department to develop initial illustrative path courses. This presentation will address issues such as uh, potential termini, environmentally sensitive areas, and attraction areas. And then Wei Wei Shen, mm -hmm. FDOT Chief Planner, will discuss how needs will be evaluated moving forward, how guiding principles and instructions will be used in future phases, as well as um, an advisory group concept. 
Then we'll begin reviewing and refining the guiding principles which is and the instructions, which is the bulk of our agenda today, until we break for lunch at 12.30 p.m. We also have a stretch break thrown in at 10.45. After lunch, we'll return at 1.30 to continue reviewing and refining the guiding principles and instructions. At 3.15 p.m., we will take a stretch break, resuming at 3.30 to continue the guiding principles and instruction discussion, as well as review draft task force, uh, uh, the draft task force report sections. I want to bring your attention to materials that you were uh, notified of ahead of time. Links to the following were included in Tori Austin's email uh, on August 20th about today's meeting. Those included the high-level needs worksheet, the guiding principles and instructions worksheet, as well as the draft sections of the task force report with the introduction, the task force overview, study area overview, and the high level needs. At 4.30, we'll review the draft task force report sections, focusing on high level needs. At 4.55, we'll briefly touch on next steps, and then we'll turn to public comment. The public comment uh, period, again, is scheduled to begin at 5 p.m. or as soon as the agenda items are completed, and we certainly hope that all our task force members will be able to stay on the line. Today we have a short video reminder of the Government in the Sunshine requirements. Florida's Sunshine Law Florida's Government in the Sunshine Law provides a right of access to governmental proceedings at both the state and local levels. In the absence of a statutory exemption, it applies to any gathering of two or more members of the same board to discuss some matter which will foreseeably come before that board for action. Scope of the Sunshine Law Board members may not engage in private discussions with each other about board business, either in person or by telephone, email, texting, or any other type of electronic communication such as Facebook or blogging. While an individual board member is not prohibited from discussing board business with staff or non-board members, these individuals may not be used as a liaison to communicate information between board members. For example, a board member cannot ask staff to poll other board members to determine their views on a board issue. The Sunshine Law applies to advisory boards created pursuant to law or ordinance or otherwise established by public agencies or officials. Staff meetings are not normally subject to the Sunshine Law. However, staff committees may be subject to the Sunshine Law if they are deemed to be part of the decision-making process as opposed to traditional staff functions like fact-finding or information gathering. Board meetings. While boards may adopt reasonable rules and policies to ensure orderly conduct of meetings, the Sunshine Law does not allow boards to ban non-disruptive videotaping, tape recording, or photography at public meetings. Public Records Law Florida's Public Records Act, Chapter 119, Florida Statutes, provides a right of access to records of state and local governments, as well as private entities acting on their behalf. If materials fall within the definition of a public record, it must be disclosed to the public unless there is a statutory exemption. The term public records means all documents, papers, letters, maps, books, tapes, photographs, films, sound recordings, data processing software, or other material, regardless of the physical form, characteristics, or means of transmission. This includes electronic communication like text messaging and emails, made or received pursuant to law or ordinance, or in connection with the transaction of official business by an agency, including a private entity action on behalf of a public agency, which are used to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge. Providing public records. Public records cannot be withheld at the request of the sender. A requester is not required to show a legitimate or non-commercial interest as a condition of access. A request cannot be denied because it is overbroad. Unless authorized by another statute, an agency may not require that public records requests be in writing or require the requester to identify himself or herself.
All right. Um, I would like to, to just let the task force members know that Diane Gilmet from the Office of the Attorney General is online with us today <clears throat> on the call or on the webinar as well. And she can answer any questions regarding the Sunshine Law as it relates to the task force. Her uh, information is provided on this slide. All right, now we're going to move into the uh, the roll call. All task force members were given unique log links to sign in as task force members logged in and we noted attendance. Um, we did that before the, the meeting started and we've been keeping track of that since it has started to catch those who uh, arrived a little late. I now read through your names and organizations and note who is present and who is not in attendance. If you are a substitute and we didn't recognize your attendance on the roll call today, please send an email to Ryan Asmus. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Representing the Florida Department of Transportation, Secretary Greg Evans is present in the webinar today. Representing also the Florida Department of Transportation, Jason Peters is also present. Representing the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Chris Wynn is present. Representing the Florida Public Service Commission, Mark Futrell, is present today. Representing Enterprise Florida is Eric Anderson, and he is present. Representing the Hernando Citrus Metropolitan Planning Organization is Commissioner Jeff Kennard, and he is on the webinar today. Representing the North Central Florida Regional Planning Council is Scott Coons, who is on the webinar today. Representing Audubon Florida is Charles Lee, who is with us today on the webinar. Representing Defenders of Wildlife is Kent Wimmer, who is also with us on the webinar today. Um, representing the Citrus County Commission is uh, Commissioner Scott Cornahan, who is in attendance today at the meeting. Representing the Lafayette County Commission is Commissioner Anthony Adams, who is also present today. Um, Diane Head, who is representing Career Source Florida, is not present today. Paul Myers, representing the Florida Department of Health, contacted us ahead of time and said there was a conflict. He would not be able to be with us um, at, as well. Representing the Dixie County Commission is Commissioner Mark Hatch, who is present today at the meeting. He's actually at the uh, public viewing location in Old Town. Representing the Nature Conservancy is Janet Bowman, who is present today in the meeting. Representing Taylor County Commission is Commissioner Pam Fiegel, who is present today at the meeting. Representing the Florida Department of Business and Professional Regulation is Chris Lee, who is also present today. Lyle Siegler, who represents the Northwest Florida Water Management District, did contact us ahead of time and said that he had a conflict today, so he is not here. Um, Sherilyn Pickles, representing Madison County, is also not available today and is not present in the meeting. Representing the Southwest Florida Water Management District is Michelle Hopkins, who is present today. Representing the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council is Commissioner Ronald Kitchen, who also is present today. Representing the Florida Chamber of Commerce is Christopher Emanuel, who is present today. Representing Gilchrist County Commission is Commissioner Todd Gray, who is present at the meeting. Representing the Florida Trucking Association is Ken Armstrong, who is also present. Representing the Florida Department of Education is Mary Cross. She is also present today. Representing the Florida Rural Water Association is Randy Wilkerson, who is also present at the meeting. Representing the Florida Internet and Television Association is Chris Bailey, who is also present. Representing the Capital Region Transportation Planning Agency is Commissioner Kristen Dozier. She is also present. Representing the Levy County Commission is Commissioner Matt Brooks, who is also present at the meeting today. Representing the Florida Economic Development Council is Susan Ramsey. She is also present. Charles Shin, who represents the Florida Farm Bureau Federation, uh, did contact us ahead of time and said that he would not be able to join us until the afternoon session after lunch, uh, but he is not present at this, at this time. Representing the Florida Department of Environmental Protection is Chris Stahl, and he is present. Representing the Florida Gateway College is Dr. Lawrence Barrett, and he is present as well. 
Uh, substituting for Brian McManus, representing the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity is James Stansberry. And James has uh, attended previous meetings, so welcome James, he is present today. Representing the North Florida Community College is John Groskoff, who is present. Representing the Appalachian Regional Planning Council is Chris Rito, who is present. Representing Thousand Friends of Florida is Thomas Hawkins, who is present also at the meeting today. Representing Jefferson County Commission is Commissioner Betsy Barfield, who is present. Representing Swanee River Water Management District is Ashley Stefanik. She is present also. Representing the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services is Peggy Hanrahan, and she is present at the meeting today. And last but not least, representing Volunteer Florida is Audrey Kidwell, who is also present today. So if we did not have you marked as present and you are present, if you would please just send an email to Ryan Asmus and we will get your uh, attendance recorded. So again, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, we're gonna jump right into it. Um, now that we've got the preliminaries out of the way and I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Will Watts, FDOT Chief Engineer, to begin his presentation regarding moving from task force recommendations into corridor planning and project development. So Will. All right, thanks, Greg. <clears throat> As a note, um, the task force members sure should have noticed quite a bit of increased email traffic from Tory this week. We're trying to make sure you're receiving the most up-to-date written uh, comments received from the public as well as task force members through the FDOT Listens website or uh, email address. So right now you've got everything we have up to midnight last night. So. All right, so there are a variety of ways to start the process of taking the task force recommendations to corridor planning and project development. Some of those ways are established to the typical FDOT practices and others will be unique to the MCORs as a result of the task force process. All FDOT projects must include consideration for logical termini. In the case of the Suncoast Corridor, this has been established as I-10 at the northern end of the study area and with a connection to the Northern Turnpike Corridor in the southern end. Another goal is to provide regional connectivity to the Northern Turnpike. One of the key goals of the Suncoast Corridor is to evaluate alternatives for an improved north to south connection across the study area. Developing an effective alternative route will include considering how to link to existing major facilities such as the Florida Turnpike. This is a process that will be evaluated through the application of the guiding principles and through a process of stakeholder outreach and interagency coordination. Another key aspect is avoid and enhance. We have presented the avoidance maps, FDOT's commitment and baseline for the task force at previous meetings, and a variety of discussions have been held regarding the different types and opportunities for an enhancement. The development of the avoidance and enhancement areas and draft guiding principles over the previous task force meetings have facilitated the beginning of the process for the development and evaluation of the path and courses. To develop, to develop or derive possible alternatives of path courses, task force guiding principles and the FDOT project management process are used to find solutions which minimize impacts and maximize enhancements. Next, we're looking to connect to attraction areas. The task force work is developing guiding principles will not only help identify avoidance areas, but also help identify areas for economic growth or environmental enhancement. The continued refinement of guiding principles will continue to clarify those avoidance and enhancement criteria and focus the areas for potential path courses. During the planning or alternate corridor evaluation study, in the project development and environmental phase, areas will be further prioritized and analyzed for avoidance and or minimization and mitigation of impacts. Project development and the analyst, anal, anal, we need to analyze <laughs> the avoidance and enhancement opportunities is an iterative process that will, be, will continue to refine both now and the future phases of the project. For example, potential path courses may be removed due to inconsistency with guiding principles 
or due to impacts to the environmental areas. We've talked a lot about co-location opportunities. In line with the drafting guiding principles, co-location with existing facilities will be considered as a critical component of the development and comparative evaluation of the path courses. Using the work of the task force and listening to the task force comments related to maximizing the use of existing facilities, the area around major north-south routes after consideration for evaluation as potential path courses. Example of these would include, but are not limited to, US-19, US-98, US-27, and US-221. These options would directly address and be consistent with the other guiding principles, such as consistency with statewide, regional, and local plans and visions, as well as supporting the expansion of rural utility infrastructure, including broadband, water, and sewer. For the Suncoast corridor specifically, we may want to look at path course development from north to south. This will allow sufficient opportunity to consider the overlap with the Northern Turnpike Corridor and therefore allow the evaluate evaluations to progress. This approach could also allow for the team and the task force to discuss example focus areas or areas of natural or geographic concerns, which will be discussed later in this presentation. So in the preliminary analysis and avoidance of avoidance, enhancement and guiding principles, the team sought to recognize focus areas for discussion amongst the task force. Working north to south, department has committed to the terminus being located on I-10 in the northern part of the study area. It's important to note this focus area are being recognized for the purposes of discussion and represent a preliminary step to developing the path courses with the guiding principles in mind. The second geographic feature for consideration is the environmental and social constraints in and around the Suwannee River. This area is bound by the many natural and social resources, including springs, wildlife management areas, state parks, local communities, and social and cultural facilities that will be important to consider. While there are a variety of locations within the study area that could also be identified as environmentally sensitive, the Suwannee River crossing is near the center of the study area and represents a good overlap of different considerations in one location. Applying these efforts, we have two areas to look at closer to take a closer look at. On the next slide, we'll move into discussions on the draft northern termini options that have been developed at I-10. For existing interchange locations along I-10, logical termini have been identified for us to take a closer look at. Each of these potential termini are centered around existing interchanges and were chosen based on the avoidance enhancement and draft guiding principles. The use of existing interchanges is in line with the guiding principles and intends to maximize the use of existing facilities as a means of path and course development. The interchanges identified include the I-10 US-19 interchange in Jefferson County, the I-10 US-221 interchange in Madison County, the I-10 State Road 14 interchange in Madison County, and the I-10 North County Road 53 interchange in Madison County. The primary purpose of the southward pointing areas are to show optional draft north to south co-location path course alternatives for illustrated purposes and discussion. All right, the Suwannee River crossing is an interesting area to consider when thinking about co-location and future path course development. On the next slide, we'll go into detail regarding the geographic, environmental, and social constraints present in and around this area. This area is bound by a variety of avoidance features, communities, and social and cultural resources, which represent a unique challenge in developing alternate path courses for evaluation. The only existing crossing of the Suwannee River in this area is the Suwannee River Bridge between Old Town and Fanning Springs, which is on US 1998 and is a four-lane divided bridge. Looking at the blue area of the map, 
we are considering this environmentally sensitive area as a critical junction for the development of alternative path courses. Within this area, we see water management, wildlife management areas, including Andrews Wildlife Management Area and several conservation easements. Further, we see interaction with the Lower Suwannee National Wildlife Refuge and Florida Forever acquired properties. Interaction with the Manatee Springs and Fanning Springs State Parks and the Nature Coast Trail. Four springs, none of which are first magnitude, two are magnitude two, Fanning and Otter, and two are magnitude three, Iron and Bell. Not only do there need to be consideration of environmentally sensitive lands in this area, we must also consider social and cultural impacts to features such as cemeteries and archaeological sites, local plans, policies, and desires for the local community visions within the surrounding towns and municipalities. Should this location be, be evaluated within the alternative corridor evaluation and project development of the MCORS program, agencies and staff will look closely with these communities, determine the preference and assist in local comprehensive plan consistency. Although this is a constrained area, co-location can still be an option as well as reviewing other crossing options to avoid and minimize impacts. Next, we'll take a look at how the attraction layers may affect the development of alternate path courses, which represents pull factors for the path course development. We have chosen a few, of the hot, few to highlight how potential path and courses may be modified when introducing these factors. Beginning with opportunity zones, there are areas that are economically distressed where new, new investments under certain conditions may be eligible for preferred tax treatment. These areas have been nominated by the state of Florida and certified by the Secretary of U.S. Treasury. With increased accessibility, these areas could provide opportunity for future growth potential and economic stimulus. Secondly, we want to look at future land use that would be conductive to, to greater access provided by the improved corridor. Here you see city, industrial, and commercial future land uses determined by each individual community. These land uses were determined to be pull factors due to the potential and increased accessibility to employment centers that these land use uses provide and the additional benefits of pulling any future illustrated path or courses away from land use determined to be more sensitive such as residential or agricultural uses. Finally, in terms of co-location, it does not strictly need to apply to existing transportation corridors and can refer to co-location with existing utility right-of-ways such as gas lines and electric power transmissions. Here you see existing electrical transmission lines in the Sable Trail natural, natural gas line. These facilities have the potential to be improved and enhanced along the corridor as, a pro as the project moves forward into planning and alternative consideration. So next steps. As we move forward, we will use the guiding principles to help identify and refine illustrative path courses and assess potential bypass areas and potential co-location with existing facilities. Planning an alternative corridor evaluation will apply guiding principles and instructions to determine the criteria for de development and, co and comparative evaluation of path courses. Develop evaluation methodology with stakeholders and agency partners. Screen environmental effects of alternate corridors, including the no-build option. Maintain public engagement and interagency coordination. During the project development environmental phase, we'll apply the guiding principles and instructions to determine the best alternative alignments that are carried forward from the planning and alternate corridor evaluation. Evaluation methodology will guide decisions about the location, design, concept, and mitigation. Then develop project specific commitments and then continue public engagement and interagency coordination. So, both project feasibilities are required by Florida statute, which includes the economic and environmental feasibility. So, we want to kind of rehash a little bit what we covered in your um, uh, online training with the remake of the March meetings. 
So Florida statutes, Florida law requires the MCOR corridors to beat both, meet both environmental and economic feasibility. Statute also identify potential funding sources options, funding source options for the MCOR corridors. And just to refresh you, the, the, the pie chart on the right just gives a, a very general example that projects can be funded for multiple funding sources. All right, so the task force report is the foundation for the, the PD&E phase. Environmental feasibility is determined as a part of the project development environmental phase. Field work and resource specific technical reports completed as part of the PD&E study will help to provide details concerning the impacts and enhancements to the natural, physical, and social environments. The goal of the PD&E phase is to document that the project can be constructed in a manner that minimizes environmental impacts to the extent possible. During the PD&E phase, there is extensive coordination with regional, state, and federal agencies, including Water Management District, Regional Planning Councils, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, just to name a few. In addition, during the PD&E phase, multiple opportunities will be provided for input from the public and local governments throughout the project area. As with any project FDOT undertakes, the results of the detailed environmental analysis from the PD&E phase will be documented consistent with the policies outlined in the FDOT's PD&E manual. Economic feasibility is determined along the design phase when a detailed cost estimate is prepared and an investment grade traffic and revenue study is conducted. It can occur prior to design since the major project features will not have been determined and accurate project cost estimates and revenue forecasts are not known. The economic feasibility evaluation can also consider other funding sources beyond the project's total revenue. All right, so just to refresh, there are generally three steps to economic feasibility process. The first step involves identifying the estimated net revenues as determined from an investment grade traffic and revenue study. The next step is the determination of the turnpike funding contribution based on the turnpike bonding capacity of the corridor. In many instances, the turnpike bond funding cannot cover the entire corridor costs. Thus, a funding shortfall will exist. <laughs> The final step includes the development of the funding plan for the corridor based on the total project cost. Other, fun other funding sources will be considered to address any funding shortfall. If there is a funding short short shortfall due to revenue forecasting, the project will be prioritized in the work program alongside other priorities for, for, for funding considerations. All right, so we just wanna bring this slide back up. Uh, just kind of a focus area for questions. I do want to just make sure before I forget, uh, we've got Jason Watts uh, online with us today too. He's the Director of Office of Environmental Management and he'll help us answer questions later on as well. So Greg, back to you for any questions. All right, thanks Will. Um, so there's a lot to unpack there uh, to Task Force members uh, from that presentation. So um, some of that information may be new to you as far as the, the termini locations um, at I-10 um, and then some of the information as far as the PD&E studies and kind of what's to come as Will has said has been has been mentioned before in previous meetings but uh, we'll open it up now to questions if you have any questions uh, if you would just use the raise your hand feature and we will um, we'll come to you for um, anyone so uh, Let's see here, uh, Janet Bowman, representing the Nature Conservancy. Uh, you're unmuted, what's your, what's your question? Thank you, um, Janet Bowman with the Nature Conservancy. Um, one thing I'm wondering, um, having listened to the uh, Northern Turnpike uh, meeting yesterday is just on the, on the Southern connections, um, you, you know, the alternatives that were looked at yesterday really aren't depicted on this map per se, and just in terms of, you know, the impact of interchanges, et cetera, on the, um, on the Sun Coast. I, I'm just wondering about that. Um, yeah, Janet, good question. So <clears throat> for, for this corridor, we're, you know, we kind of decided to start from north and move south. 
and kind of let the development get further along when it comes to the turnpike uh northern northern turnpike connection so yeah there was a couple options we presented yesterday um and we certainly heard some great great, great discussions on those four options you know one of the log logical termini certainly at suncoast too right now is connecting up uh, just south of the barge canal that could be one possible connection on us 19 but but other options could start to be developed as the turnpike continues to develop their alternatives. So what we're trying to do is just uh, let that story play out, let those those studies um, get further along to understand how Suncoast needs to connect. So they kind of have to kind of both coordinate very well as you would as you would imagine. Right. I, I guess just in terms of the the uh, the Suncoast task force, I mean I, I think I mean certainly we would you know, we have preferences and, and certainly would be very concerned about, you know, some of the, um, you know, where where some of the Suncoast alignments might occur, you know, just say it was, you know, some greenfield type of, of uh, connection that went, you know, just, and I'm just making this up for purposes of illustration, yeah. through golf hammock or, you know, something along those lines. So I, I just, I feel like the task force ought to weigh in on that to, to some degree. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to, to ask that. And then the, the second question I have is on the funding, um, the shortfall issue. I mean, I understand the way it works, but, you know, I think the public very much anticipated that, you know, these improvements would be paid for with toll revenue. And, and so, you know, to the extent they aren't, um, you know, that's, that impacts, you know, the, the, the work program and, you know, the work program around the state. And so I just wanted to raise that as, as a concern um, that, that we have um, and just put that out there. Thank you. So your input on the Southern connection is, is critical. So a lot of the preferences of the guiding principles that, you, that, that Suncoast comes up with will have to be coordinated with Turnpike uh, in order to make that final connection. And you know, the tolling revenue is just certainly one one aspect of the funding source discussion. Um, if there is a shortfall, if if if, if MCOR's program direct or tolling revenue direct, and there's still a, a remainder, it has to be competed for in the work program and prioritized like any other project. One of the projects I, I do reference is, is First Coast Expressway in Jacksonville, and that particular corridor only half the funding. Uh, strategy came from the uh, toll revenue. So the other half came from the trust fund that had to be competed for and prioritized alongside with, with other priorities. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, all right. So uh, we've got a question from Commissioner Betsy Barfield representing Jefferson County. So Commissioner Barfield, uh, what's your question today? Are you there, Commissioner Barfield? I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, you sound very, very muted. Can you hear me? Um, not, not good enough to be able to to get a question in. Um, okay. Hold on. Go out. Okay. Got better. Hello? Um. Not, not really. Okay. So I, have have Ron contact me and let's figure out another way where I can call. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So Ron, if you could just touch base with her, and then we'll try to get that get that clarified. So we'll come back to we'll come back to Commissioner Barfield once her audio gets cleared uh, straightened out. Uh, representing the Capital Region Transportation Planning Agency, I'd like to go to Commissioner Kristen Dozier. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Um, Will, I wasn't going to ask this question, but since you just referenced the work plan, um, I've, I've been wondering about this recently. I had some constituents ask me about this question. If there is a shortfall, you said um, the project would have to compete along with others within the work plan. And there have been questions that have come up about the 
embedding these projects within that work plan because your MPOs, all the different districts, we go through a long process to establish that work plan. So I'm just wondering if there is a risk to tying these two together and to having Suncoast and others compete within that work plan to those projects that, for example, CRTPA, our MPO, has worked for a long time to make sure we follow the right process and have projects in our five-year work plan and our long-range work plan that are really progressing um, and are eligible for funding. So could you just unpack that a little bit, what the potential impact is in future years? Sure. So we're not, you know, MCOR is a certainly a, a visionary plan that, you know, we're trying to maximize what we can do within the corridor. It also allows us to have these robust discussions in the pre-planning phase and, 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 and give us a foundation of how to um, um, develop corridors the right way with long-term visioning in mind. Now, Programs in, in, funded by DOT happen really essentially three ways. They're either funded by the Florida Transportation Trust Fund, which is your revenue from gas taxes and other tags and fees. It's it's funded with the turnpike, either from previous toll revenues or projected toll revenues with bonding capacity. And then, then we also have federal contributions, which are about 25% of our overall budget. So if if the toll revenue uh, does become less than 100% for the funding of total project costs, then it will have to look for other funding sources. MCORS did come with um, about $100 million a year that was appropriated uh, by legislature last year. That can be used either in cash or bond format, as well as looking to, to the uh, trust fund or turnpike as well to fund the other, other parts of it. But you know, NCORS is no different when it comes to product development. It'll have to be put in the work program and proposed. It'll have to go in front of the MPOs as we get down the path of planning and PD&E. So still plenty of, of ample time for public input and local community input as well as local, local government officials. Thank you very much. Um, just to, I guess, put a point on this for those of us who sit on MPOs and I'm sure for everyone, We've heard for years that the trust fund doesn't have as much money because of the gas tax revenue. I mean, we're in this discussion about my, miles per gallon, um, how we how we fund our transportation nationwide and in Florida. And FDOT, you all have worked hard to try to keep things moving with the funds that we have. So with the budget impact of COVID-19, with other things, I think this issue is becoming more critical for some of us. But I think it is something we need to think about in the long term because we've been struggling to make sure we have enough transportation funds statewide, nationwide for a long time. Um, thank you, though, very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Dozier. Uh, representing Thousand Friends of Florida is Thomas Hawkins. And Thomas had a question in regards to things. Um, so, Thomas? Thanks, Greg. Um, I, I have a question regarding the logical termini. Um, the, the the locations seem to relate to the to existing roadways in the area. One of the statutory one of the intended statutory benefits of the program is freight and passenger rail connection. Um, why aren't we looking at the termini of existing rail lines as logical termini? Um, it, it, I mean, it seems like we need to make some discussions about, we need to make decisions about mode before we can identify logical termini. Um, can, you, can you explain that? And have any decisions been made regarding mode or kinds of infrastructure? No, no, no Thomas, you brought up the um, freight and rail options as, 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 you know, as a desire for prime, as a primary option. But that is a, that is a good co uh, comment. We do need to look at some of the uh, rail termini just to see if those can be some co-location options as well. Um, so yeah, great comment. All right, um, I think that we've gotten the audio corrected for Commissioner Barfield, Betsy Barfield from Jefferson County. So Commissioner Barfield, uh, let's try it again.
Are you there, Commissioner? I am now. There you go. Good. Okay, good deal. Yes. Good. We've got to straighten out. Thank you for helping me with that. Uh, I wanted to just uh, make a comment on the environmentally sensitive areas. Should the toll roads uh, go through Jefferson County, we have the Osceola River and um, would like to have some consideration for that area there uh, that dumps into the, actually the Wasifa dumps into the Osceola and it goes into the Gulf. And um, we're pretty fussy about that river and the archeological digs that happen along that river. So I'd like for the um, task force and um, in course to give that some consideration. Next, um, expanding on Janet and Kristen's concerns about the funding, I see you have a local funding piece there, Will, and um, that that raises a red flag uh, for our counties such as Jefferson that um, are fiscally constrained. Give us a little, um, your thought process on how that local funding is going to look, what the requirements would be. Um, that certainly plays a huge role into our decision-making process and, and how that's going to affect us. Yeah, so Commissioner, that was just an example, kind of any project uh, that DOT would put on that, that there is opportunities for different funding sources. So it's not, by any means, it's not saying that MCORS is going to require local funding. Um, but, you know, if a local municipality wants to help accelerate, promote pieces, seg segments of MCORS or any other project, quite frankly, they have the opportunity to help um, move that project along with funding sources. So definitely not a requirement. It's just showing that, that a project can have multiple funding sources to get accomplished. That's all that was trying to portray. Okay, very good. Thank you for putting that on record. All right, we've got a few more few more questions. I know we, we're running a little behind schedule, but I do want to wrap this up uh, with some more questions. Uh, so um, I'd like to go to uh, Kent Wimmer, representing uh, Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, Kent, you had a comment or question? Yes, I do. Thank you very much. This is Kent Wimmer with Defenders of Wildlife. Um, I'd like to point out that the map that uh, Will showed with the US-27 as an alternative was not the same map that was distributed to the public and to the task force. So I thought that was a little bit interesting. But that got me thinking, since we're considering alternatives to US-19, why not consider US-129 alternate 27 and US-41? since US-129 has an interchange with I-75 in Georgia, wouldn't that better comply with the legislative direction to connect to Georgia? And also, wouldn't connecting with I-75 in Georgia provide the obvious advantage for removing traffic from I-75, which this, this whole issue is about, getting traffic off of I-75, and, uh, and then that would also limit um, exposure of building a new facility on US-19, which is going to be subjected to increasing storm surge impacts and hurricane impacts in the coming years when that, when that area is going to be touted for, um, for hurricane evacuation. So, and plus, it would also avoid impacting all the environmental resources down along the Big Bend coast and crossing the Suwannee River, um, you know, down in that very sensitive area the DOT has so ably pointed out. Thank you very much. Yep, thanks for those comments, Ken, thank you. Is there gonna be a response? <laughs> Well, you know, what we've done so far, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not sure what the description of the maps you're referring to. We'll look into that. But, you know, the, the co-location maps we presented uh, two meetings ago were you know, a baseline of what features we could use to co-locate. So if we need to expand on those, um, again, you know, this is DOT's interpretation at this point. If the task force wants to encourage the guiding principles to steer other preferences, uh, that's why you guys are here today to help us do that. Well, I, I just think that this, uh, an alternative route away from 1998 solves a lot of your environmental problems, and it also better solves your traffic problems on I-75, which was a major point of, con a major point of uh, 
discussion yesterday on the North the North Turnpike um, Task Force presentation. It's all about getting traffic off of I-75 down there. This is how you do it. Okay, we'll all look right. at that a little closer. Thanks, Kent. Uh, we got a couple more questions, so we'll try to wrap this up so we can move on to Weiwei's presentation. Um, so I'm going to go to uh, Randy Wilkerson, representing the Florida Rural Water Association. Uh, Randy, your comment or question? Randy, are you there? Yeah, Greg, can you hear me? There we go. Yep. Okay. So going back to the water and sewer enhancement, um, the cohesion timing, I guess for these smaller communities, whether it be Fanning or Trenton, Chief, or whoever, um, would would the, the, the would it run, would it run at like ahead of the? Um, I mean, obviously it'd get engineered, but would it run ahead of the project as far as what the impacts might be on these on these uh, water or sewer facilities? Or would it run kind of later, laterally in the long-term visioning? So great question. So early phases can include utilities, can include broadband. So that's that's what we have to certainly prioritize as we move through the planning and PD&E. So um, you know, kind of all, I think I envision this coming coming through fruition with with different phases and steps. So. Um, I think what we can commit to is that the DOT will be at the table trying to help local local communities solve some of these utility issues, and we can be a partner uh, either with right away or other features to to help promote it. So just know that that we'll be at the table trying to figure out that right solution. Okay, thank you, Will. Well, thanks, Randy. Um, Charles Lee, representing Audubon, Florida. Charles, you had uh, some comments or questions. Yes, uh, Will, I wonder if you could put up the slide that shows the arrows. Uh, I think it may have been the next slide after this one, the one that shows the different colored arrows coming down from I-10. Okay, the close up, all right. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, I really think that one has to think about how this project works in synergy with the turnpike extension and what the likely traveler is going to be coming off of the turnpike and headed on the turnpike extension over to the west to connect with Suncoast. The destination orientation of those travelers is primarily going to be people who intend to travel to some destination in the Florida Panhandle or west on I-10 toward New Orleans. Uh, it's extremely unlikely that whether you're driving a passenger car or whether you're driving a tractor trailer, you are going to get off of um, a free road, Interstate 75, and take the tolled turnpike extension over to Suncoast and then take the told Suncoast route, if it merely gets you back to a point on I-10, which is 15 miles or 20 miles east of I-75, I mean, you then have to backtrack and, and head back east to I-75. That's sort of a non-starter in terms of what people are likely to pay tolls to achieve. And, and so, I think that with the knowledge we gained in the I-75 review task force, uh, it was fairly clear that there was a reasonably substantial movement of traffic that turned left at the I-10 interchange from I-75. With all of that said, uh, I believe that that uh, sort of moves the conversation to the more favorable traffic-oriented uh, routes, uh, primarily being the orange route, which would co-locate with US uh, 19 uh, and join with uh, with I-10 just south of Monticello. Uh, the other attractiveness of that route is that it connects with the Florida Georgia Parkway, which does have a fairly extensive 
flow of traffic north into uh, that area of Georgia. Uh, the others uh, simply don't have, I think, a north northward traffic base. Um, the sorry about that. Um, the other discussion I'd like to have relates to uh, U.S. 19 and uh, 98 and co-location. And if you could go back to the um, uh, larger map uh, that shows the concentration of environmentally sensitive areas around uh, the Suwannee River crossing. Take slides down, please. Thank you. Um, you also have within this map the attraction areas of opportunity zones and the planned uh, commercial and industrial development areas associated with the towns that are listed in the, uh, in the exhibit. Um, one of the distinct advantages of staying on US 19 and 98 through this area uh, is the service of those zones which are a feature of the comprehensive plans of the counties and the cities that are there. The other is that by avoiding a new road footprint, um, you eliminate uh, most of the environmental impacts. And because US 19 and 98 was built largely in the 1950s and the 1960s, there currently is no modern environmental treatment of that highway. In other words, US 19 and 98 today is sort of a bleeding sore in terms of pollution runoff because there are no retention pond facilities. Um, likewise, uh, as was mentioned by Kent Wimmer, US 98 uh, is deficient in the sense that it currently is not at an elevation that responds to modern thinking with regard to hurricane evacuation, sea level rise, and the conveyance of water. There's a, there's a good, good shortfall in the bridging. You can see that by uh, when you pass through there uh, after a big rain. There's a dam effect where the east side of the road water is piling up and waiting to gradually flow through culverts. Those points basically lead me to saying that there's a tremendous opportunity to attain environmental benefits in upgrading that road by putting retention in, by elevating the crest of the road to respond to sea level rise and hurricane evacuation concerns and by improving the bridges. Commissioner Barfield mentioned the Osceola River. And every time that I cross that bridge on US 19, uh, I think, gosh, it's a shame that this is such a narrow constricted bridge in the floodplain of that river and the very significant wildlife crossing that that river consists of. Uh, if that bridge could be improved and lengthened in the process, it would be a significant environmental benefit. So with regard to the concept of, of going out to the east, in the matter that manner that uh, Kent Wimmer suggested, so as to get closer to I-75, I hear the point about I-75. Don't think that necessarily performs from a toll standpoint, but what it does do, if you put the road out to the east away from US-19, is you've created the classic can opener effect where the rural area along that road is going to be subjected to undue development pressure. Above all, that's a very undesirable result of locating a road in this area. It would also tend to suck the life out of the existing towns on US 19, and because you would be diverting the commerce away from them. And so I, I really think that this needs to be looked at uh, fairly straightforwardly as an effort to upgrade US 19 and 98. The, follow, the final thing that I'll say is about the Southern Termini. Uh, we had a, a very good and robust discussion yesterday on the Turnpike Task Force. 
And it appeared that all of the local government representatives that commented, which included the representatives from Citrus County, as well as the representatives from, from uh, Marion County and Sumter County, uh, it, it led pretty clearly toward a conclusion that the two most viable options for the Turnpike extension would likely proceed to connect with Suncoast at a point either very close to the current plan joining of Suncoast with US-19 at red level, or just before that uh, along State Road 44. Um, and if that's the case, then it pretty it, it kind of lights up a fairly bright flashing light that the likely termini point for the Sun Coast is going to be at red uh, red level, uh, which has long been the plan for the northern terminus of Sun Coast uh, two before MCORS came along. And so I I would hope that a very sharp focus is cast on upgrading US 9819 all the way to I-75, uh, I, to I-10. Uh, I, I think that's the most logical route from a revenue planning standpoint. I think it's the most logical route from an environmental standpoint. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's the thing that the brightest focus ought to be put on in my view. Thank you. Yep, thanks for sharing what, <clears throat> some of the uh, great discussion we had yesterday. And I think that the important point you bring up, uh, Charles, is, is this the enhance, enhancement discussion. Because there's, there's a lot of things we can do to the existing road to make, to make some great improvements. So thanks for the insight. All right, thanks, Charles. Uh, the last question we have uh, is from Chris Stahl, representative uh, from Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So Chris, uh, your comment or question? Uh, yeah, just a quick comment. Um, part of when as the thing goes forward, as far as um, one of the alternatives, since this appears to be fairly um, isolated, this whole corridor isolated, not really well accessed from the the end of the turnpike to I-75, I'd kind of like to, I'd really like to see one of the alternatives that gets it that if this goes forward and gets examined in the future, that is you know if the northern turnpike is built and that's it you know how will that affect will that greatly improve this whole the utilization of this whole area in itself without having to do anything else I'd like to see that as one of the alternatives going through. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, just to just to close that out. So certainly, when uh, we, we we get down the path of of refining those those final corridors with turnpike, all that traffic modeling will will be accomplished uh, for the full region. Uh, right now, the turnpike has a statewide model, and as those corridors get further down, we'll plug those model or those corridors into the model so we can see what the the usage is and whether there's needs for certain certain segments. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, last question, just uh, uh, Commissioner Pam Fiegel from Taylor County. She just raised her hand. So Commissioner Fiegel, um, you had a question, comment? Uh, yes, thank you for taking my question. I've got two. two. Uh, the first one, has there been any consideration for enhancing the current two lane roads from I-75 in Gainesville to US-19 by making those roads into four lane divided highways. Um, currently, there are two roads uh, from I 10 and Gainesville. One is through um, Gilcrest County, and the other one is through Lafette County. Both of these are two lane roads, and they're very heavily traveled. So, has, has anybody talked about perhaps? Um, changing those into four lane divided highways. So Commissioner, we do have various stages of PD and E and we can get get back to you and we can get back to the whole group and kind of refresh everybody where those are. Um, but but there is some current studies out there so we can we can get that back to you. 
Okay, the next thing, I want to go back to the funding uh, issue. As you know, Taylor County is a small rural physically constrained area, and we rely heavily on the scrap and scop programs. Will they be affected? Well, I think that's one of the positives of the MCOR legislation that actually increased both those pots of money by $10 million. So the first year, this current fiscal year, they were uh, targeted towards some of the uh, hurricane affected counties of Michael, but uh, overall scrap and scop program has grown as a result of the MCOR legislation. So that's actually good news. Thank you. All right. Um, well, Will, that's all the comments or questions that we've got. Um, I think if, if you're ready, we can go ahead and move it over to Weiwei's presentation. Yep, thank you, Will. Weiwei? Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everyone. As your chair had mentioned earlier today, the primary focus of today's meeting will be to continue refining your recommendations with regard to guiding principles and instructions. Before we get started, I would like to take a few minutes to cover a few overarching topics. In response to some of the questions and comments we heard at the last meeting and in your written comments. Next slide, please. We had a lot of conversation at your last meeting about the task force's role in identifying and evaluating needs. Because we're in pre-planning phase now, our focus is on identifying high-level regional needs that are consistent with the statutory purposes for MCORS. Many of you pointed out the need to conduct a robust analysis to determine the magnitude of these needs and the feasibility of the proposed corridors. We recognize the importance of these questions and we have been giving lots of thoughts to how that will occur post task force as part of planning and project development. There is language in your draft report to reflect how this needs analysis will take place. Some of the highlights are here. Evaluate both conventional transportation needs and broader regional needs or co-benefits, such as the impact on economic development and quality of life. Consider a full range of alternatives include a no-build option. Evaluate economic, environmental, land use, and emergency management impacts. Assess the financial feasibility of the potential alternatives, including the economic feasibility standard required in statute for turnpike projects. Make sure we address all statutory requirements and industry standards for a project of this magnitude. Support the needs evaluation through extensive public input, including potentially a corridor advisory group. More on that in a few moments. We'll have a chance to go through the language later today, but we wanted to acknowledge that this has been added to the needs draft so you can have that in mind as we begin the discussion of guiding principles. We also wanted to respond to your questions about how the guiding principles and instructions carry forward from your report. As noted at the last meeting, the MCOR statute stipulates that to the extent, to the maximum extent feasible, FDOT will adhere to the task force's recommendations in designing each corridor. The guiding principles and the instructions function as a set of directions to FDOT and partners in implementing your recommendations. And the statutory direction to adhere to the maximum extent feasible applies to both. The guiding principles provide high level values to apply in all decisions, while the instructions provide detailed specific commitments and actions. So as we work through the language today, I want to encourage you that both guiding principles and instructions matter, and they both carry forward. Let's focus today on making sure the right guidance is being developed for the principles and, and instructions as a set, recognizing that there may be some differences in perspective on whether the appropriate levels of detail for each. 
Next slide, please. Your guiding principles are updated <coughs> based on your discussion at your last meeting <coughs> and your input in writing sense. We will be working through these changes over the course of today, but here are some highlights. The qualifier languages have been eliminated, such as to the extent feasible. The cross-cutting principles have been up updated based on your discussion. The principle about consistency with existing plans now specifies the statutorily required plans that are part of this process. The principle about maximizing existing facilities has clearer language now about the priority for working through these options, which we will cover today, later today. The principles and instructions related to environment and community resources have been revised at your request. A more direct linkage to the areas identified for avoidance has been added. In some cases, this is in the principles, and in other cases, it's in the instructions. As noted, they both play, uh, they both carry weight and will, move, will be moved forward into future processes. There are also there also are expanded instructions to document future analyses, commitments, and coordination activities. Other guiding principles have been revised based on your discussion and input. Finally, I want to take a moment to discuss our thinking regarding how to continue to engage the public, agencies, and other partners moving forward after the task force completes its work. The intent is for public and agency involvement to moving forward to exceed, to exceed requirements of planning and pd and &E. A key element would be potentially to create an ongoing corridor advisory group, an idea some of you have raised in the past few meetings. We anticipate the corridor advisory group could include many of the organizations around the virtual table today, local governments, state agencies, regional agencies such as MPOs and RPCs, environmental groups, and industry partners. This group would advise DOT on implementation of task force recommendations, help track FDOT and partner commitments, review and provide feedback on needs evaluation, PD&E, and other documents, assist with a robust outreach process. For Today's discussion, we just wanted you to know that the department, well, the department welcomes the opportunity to create and work with an advisory group um, to help implement your recommendations. Today, our plan is to keep making progress on your recommendations. Our focus will be on refining guiding principles and instructions as a set of recommendations. We have a lot to cover, but this language is important because it will direct future planning and development decisions. Toward the end of the day, we also will review the revised high-level needs and other initial sections of the task force report. Thank you. Let me close by uh, providing an update on your work plan. Meeting number eight is tentatively scheduled for September 24th. Um, we have additional future community open houses scheduled as well in September, as well as in uh, October. And we have scheduled a public comment period on your draft recommendations during the month of October. And meeting number nine is tentatively scheduled um, during the week of October 19th. Next slide, please. As you can see from this graphic, um, the original work plan anticipated seven task force meetings. By the time we finish, we will have had nine task force meetings and four webinars, virtual meetings. We appreciate everyone's commitment to Florida's future. We also appreciate the extensive public input we have received. By the end of this process, this task force will have, have held um, public comment periods at all meetings and virtual meetings, plus 
eight standalone community open houses. We have received a total of 12,308 uh, written public comments as of this weekend. We provided you an update of all these comments and we'll provide another update before your next meeting. So um, with that, I would like to turn it over to Greg Garrett to um, help us get started with the discussion on the guiding principles and instructions. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, well, thank you, Weiwei, and good morning to the task force members. Um, we are, after Weiwei's presentation, we'll be ready to move on to the next part of our meeting, which is discussing the guiding principles. Uh, of course, before we jump straight to that, we did want to pause uh, and see if there were any questions or comments uh, for Weiwei or the team regarding her presentation. Okay. Uh, right. Chairman Evans, we were actually thinking, okay. we do have some questions, okay. okay. Um, Jeff Kennard, Commissioner. Sure. Jeff Kennard. Uh, Jeff yes. Kennard. Yes, good morning. Uh, I would just like to say that um, uh, that I, I would oppose the formation of an advisory committee uh, that would um, take you know that would be put together that would that would take action after this task force completes its work um, there's a large group here that was carefully put together we've put in uh, over a year's worth of work on this and when we're done uh, there will be a work document uh, that will be put together and presented and uh, i think that our work at that point should be done and left to dot I would uh, I would sure hate to see that we put in all this time and then a small advisory group uh, has somewhat of an inside track on making decisions about a you know this this road proposal. So uh, I would not be in favor of that advisory group. Commissioner, thank you for your comment, and then we appreciate your trust in, in DOT's intention and capability in carrying out the task force's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kennard. Uh, we also had a comment or question from uh, Commissioner Ronald Kitchen uh, from the Tampa Bay RPC. Yes, and thank you very much. Just want to say that I 1,000% agree with what Commissioner Kennard just said. Uh, for all the reasons he said it also it's just a continuation of cost um what well, you know if we consider what just the what fdot has invested just from their end not what communities and other governments and agencies have invested in their time and effort in this task force it just seems like a duplication of bureaucracy and spending that's unnecessary so if that it could also probably would be made up of the same components of people that you have on this force. So uh, again, it, you know, planning is great, but there's got to be a point in time when it's moved forward. So just echoing his comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Joe Weiwei. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner Kitchen. Uh, we're going to take one last comment, and then we're going to actually move on from there. So uh, last comment uh, for this one, uh, Kent Wimmer. Thank you very much. Kent Wimmer with Defenders of Wildlife. The point of his advisory body is to, can you, is to actually provide a voice to the local governments and to the parties that have been involved with this process through. We're just, we're, we're, we're basically providing a very, very general guidance. I mean, the rubber hasn't hit the road, so to speak, and there's gonna be a lot of decisions coming up down the road that, um, that the public is going to be interested in having a voice and participating in. And I would also consider the public to be the public elected officials that are involved with the community, this, this uh, road going through their lands, through their counties. So I just think um, this whole process was set up on mirroring the Wakaiva. So if we're going to truly mirror the Wakaiva, follow the example of the Wakaiva, have an advisory body that helps provide direction and guidance so you actually get what you think you're gonna get out of this at the very end. Thank you very much. Ken, thank you for your comment. 
um, our intention is moving forward that we're going to exceed requirements of planning and PDNE. So with or without the advisory group, public is going to a robust pu public involvement process is what we're committed to. Just just to clarify. Uh, looks like we had one last hand come up uh, before we uh, come, uh, wrap up on this section. Uh, so maybe we have a question from Charles Lee. <clears throat> Charles yeah, it, yes, yes. Uh, it, it's just a comment, and that is that um, I don't know if a formal advisory committee is needed or not. What I do believe is needed is a system of continuing contact and outreach and the ability of stakeholders to comment in the process as it moves forward. I know, for example, that in the case of the Wakaiva, after the task force process ended, um, there was a statutory continuation of the task force as a monitoring entity. We don't necessarily have that here. But in the case of the Wakaiva, both the Orlando Orange County Expressway Authority, now known as CFX, uh, and DOT District 5, continued very robust outreach to the public. And there were regular meetings during the PD&E process in which the public, which really consisted mainly of the stakeholders that were many of the same people that served on the task force showed up to comment. And I know that there were at least two or three instances where the ability of the public to comment averted some problems that otherwise could have resulted in delays. And so I'm, uh, whether you call it an advisory committee, uh, whether you simply call it scheduling meetings for public input as part of the PD&E process, I merely want to encourage the department to keep the to keep the channel open for input and access. Charles, thank you for that comment. That's what we're committed to doing, and I think um, the task force members can kind of work on instruction or guiding principle just to ensure that this gets um, sort of memorialized in, in your document that this is, this is the task force's desire to um, keep the contact and outreach and the robust public engagement program. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Weiwei. Uh, I do understand we have uh, uh, one follow-up, uh, a follow-up comment from uh, Commissioner Kitchen. Uh, Commissioner? Also want to note that at the end of the agenda, we have a discussion topic on the task force report and this aspect is part of the task force report. So if we get to the end of the day and there's more time and, and we want to unpack this further, there might be a you know, better time for it then as well. Uh, but Commissioner Kitchen, please uh, proceed. Yes, just a quick, quick follow-up. There is ongoing public comment. It's called county commission meetings and city council meetings. They happen regularly and we hear from the public at all of them. Uh, so I don't believe you have to have a separate standalone committee to take public comment uh, because believe me, for t over 20 years, Citrus County has been taking public comment on the Suncoast Corridor and we continue to. As a matter of fact, as you know, in Citrus County, there's a uh, in-place viewing of uh, this meeting today in Crystal River. So the community is always involved in it. I don't think you need another established task force set up or committee or ongoing whatever uh, the public has every opportunity at any duly uh, advertised uh, or they can pick up the phone or send an email to any of their elected officials at any time so uh, again uh, you know planning is great but at some point in time there there has to be uh, some decisions made about what's going to happen and if it just keeps getting pushed back down to uh, boards and recommendations and so on. And it goes back to what Commissioner Kennard said. If all that's going to happen, then why are we here today? So um, you would think there's going to be an end to this process. So that's my follow final follow-up. So I start for talking so long. Yeah, as we get into the guiding principle and instructions discussions, you know, let's take a look and make sure that uh, the coordination with local governments, with the regional partners and um, 
robust public engagement, all that's covered in our guiding principles. You know, I, I see the DOT normal processes would um, ensure that these things all happen. But if task force wants to make sure that they make it, these languages make their way into the guiding principles or instructions, that's what we're here to do today. Thank you all for the, for the comments. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carnahan uh, from Citrus County. You're self-muted, self sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. No, I just want to re reiterate what my fellow commissioner said. You know, this came up yesterday about advisory groups, and, and this task force was put together to make decisions. And, and you know, we have to deal with advisory groups at, at a local level, and, and, and they can be difficult. Um, I think we have too many educated and smart uh, individuals that are on this task force. We need to be making the um, decisions. You know, I know that the local officials, we have many, many workshops for our off ramps. Uh, we, we get the community involved in, in advisory groups. It's just prolonging this and, and I am not for that at all. Thank you. All right, thank you for your commission or your comment, uh, Commissioner Carnahan. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on with the uh, today's agenda. Uh, so uh, I'm Greg Garrett and be assisting with facilitation uh, during the discussion for the guiding principles and instructions. Uh, we also have project staff uh, that are off screen that are gonna be producing the formal meeting summary and taking notes of any of our discussions as we move forward today. Uh, as you know, Will Weiwei, uh, Jason Watts, uh, and we also have additional subject matter experts uh, that are gonna be available uh, to the task force and everyone uh, present for any questions that we might have, technical questions. Um, they want, to, they, they want to bring him in to finish it up. I'm sorry. And before we talk about any more of the guiding principles, uh, we're going to go back. I'm getting a note in. This just in, hot off the press. Uh, we're going to go back to uh, Kent Wimmer uh, one more time. Wait, wait. So if you can put your camera back on for us. I think Kent had a uh, follow-up comment. Um, and we want to make sure Thank we give everybody much. an option to share their thoughts. Yes, sir, Kent. Go ahead. Thank you very much. This is Kent Wimmer, Defenders of Wildlife. I would just like to point out that absolutely no decisions are being made by this task force, all the decisions will be made in the future. And it is, is appropriate to provide some type of formal forum where folks can come out together and advise the, and, and offer opinions to DEP, to DOT in a forum. And because no decisions are being made at this point, all decisions will be made in the future by DOT. This is an enchant, it's an opportunity to influence those decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kent. Wait, wait, any follow-up? Yeah. Kent, thank you for your um, comments. We understand uh, the importance of following through with the task force recommendations, and there are different ways that this could happen. Um, we've, I've been thinking about that. Um, we'll have a environmental stakeholder um, group that we can uh, regularly update you guys on um, what's going on. So um, this advisory group idea is a bit broader with local governments, with with agencies, but we can explore some options of keeping everyone engaged um, throughout the process in the way that's conducive to, to their desires. So Kent, we can explore some options. Okay, well, my original concept was an, envi an environmental advisory group that was based, that was modeled on what was done for Wakaiva. It was expanded into a larger corridor advisory group, but my original recommendation for was an advisory, environmental advisory group modeled on Wakaiva. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Kent. We can, we can go back to that idea and explore a bit more. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, well, here's, here's the situation. We're coming up at, uh, I'm going to hand over my facilitation duties to my folks to the left here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, so so here's what we're going to try to do. Uh, we're going to go to Commissioner Carnahan. Uh, we really need to kind of wrap up this discussion uh, so that we can get into the guiding principles. The guiding principles, I think, you know, will be a, a key thing that will address a lot of the concerns that we are discussing so far. So we really want to get to that. That's the, really the bulk of the agenda today. 
But uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually adjust the agenda a little bit. Instead of going to break at 1045, I'm going to ask Commissioner uh, Scott Carnahan, representing Citrus County, uh, to make a final comment. And then we are going to then take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll pick up the guiding principles discussion, that presentation and be able to run uh, and hit through that. So um, with that, Commissioner Carnahan, uh, you have the final word, sir. No, uh, th thank you guys. Uh, again, this is not the Wakaiva project. Uh, this is not the Wakaiva Parkway. This is a total, you know, this, this, the land that we're dealing with is, is different. And, um, you know, we keep referring, you know, I hear uh, different individuals keep referring to the Wakaiva Parkway and um, it's not. And, uh, and again, I'll just leave it at that. It's not the Wakaiva Parkway and we need to focus on, uh, you know, our task. Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, the Wakaiva Parkway covers a much smaller area and the transportation need is very, very well defined. And please also keep in mind that the guiding principles for Wakaiva generally were high level and shorter than those that this task force has been drafting. So I think um, in certain aspect, aspect this task force has been drafting a very detailed guiding principles and instructions that covers uh, more of the uh, elements of planning, um, project development, and design than what's in the Wakaiva report. So, Commissioner, thank you for your comment. And I think it's also important, Weiwei, to, to comment that as the project does move forward, that there are other opportunities and chances for the public to have uh, an opportunity at public meetings for public involvement opportunities also obviously a coordination with local governments and and stakeholders throughout um, as in, in future you know phases of the project so uh, I, I did see that uh, that Kent Wimmer raised his hand Kent I'd like to go back to you but if we could keep it brief so we could get the break and then get back to uh, the actual guiding principles Kent yourself muted Kent Oh, thank you very much. Um, actually, I was I was done, but I will I'll just make the final point since since Commissioner Carnahan um, brought up the Wakaiva again. You know, DOT at the beginning of this process played up the Wakaiva greatly. It showed videos. It, it provided it provided copies of their plan. I mean, this is this is not something you know task force members dreamed up. This is what DOT was presenting to us as a model for how our process could be followed. So this isn't just something that um, I've dreamed up. This is something that DOT has emphasized from the very beginning. So thank you. Wait, wait, any final comments? Yeah, Kent, um, the, the scope of this task force is much broader. Than what than what what kind of task force covered? So you know, so far when we look our guiding principles and the instructions, it covers a lot more um, in terms of uh, economic development, quality of life, um, creating jobs. So um, there there are differences between this and what kind of because at the beginning of the process, uh, what kind of was used as a model but i think the, the the work that we've done have exceeded what, what's contained in in the wakaiva report and i think way way i think another thing too from a from a model standpoint and the reason why i think we focus so much on wakaiva initially is because of the similarities with the task force but it was the collaboration model that it kind of set that collaboration model with the task force to work towards um, recommendations and, and principles and things like that, um, that was that was really key. And that's a great segue. We couldn't have done that any better because that's what we're gonna hit next in regards to guiding principles, but we are gonna take a 10 minute break. So it is uh, 1039 on the nose right now. So let's just call it 1040. If you could please, uh, please be back at uh, 1050. So we can start our discussion there. Um, we ask that you keep your meeting on or open on your computer during our break so that we can get back to work promptly at uh, 1050. Mm -hmm. And we will have the program muted during this time. If you need any technical assistance, please reach out to Tommy Bull. So again, it's now 1040. We will reconvene after a 10 minute break at 1050.
Thank you. As we discussed, uh, we're going to talk about the review and refine the guiding principles. Uh, we're going to discuss that as, as we have in the past meetings. Um, Will, Weiwei, Jason, and various other subject matter experts, experts are available to address technical questions as we jump into this today. Uh, for the guiding principles, like with Task Force Meeting 6, our desire is to focus on the major comments, items that are unclear or missing, uh, or where this is a major concern. Uh, any task force members that have you know, minor editorial comments, uh, feel free as you did with the last meeting and, and as we have done in between meetings, uh, you can send those to Ryan Asmus and we'll be sure to reflect some of those editorial comments in the next draft. The approach today is to look at each guiding principle as a row. Uh, so we'll cover the purpose, high level needs, the guiding principle and instructions. Um, and then we'll be taking comments on both the guiding principles and instructions as they all go together. As a refresher from our last meeting, the guiding principles are core values that guide decisions about the corridors. They are the how we develop a corridor and address the needs. They're generally short statements supported by technical notes where needed. The guiding principles help identify avoidance and attraction areas and evaluate and narrow potential corridor path courses. They also will guide decisions about the corridor location, their comparative analysis and evaluations, as well as design mitigation and other commitments long after the report is submitted. The next step in the, this process is the instructions for project development and beyond. It's not enough to recommend why and how, but we also need to specify what's next. The instructions are how we make the connection from the principles back to what FDOT or specific partners do next. This could mean addressing corridor location, such as the input you've already provided to use on areas a corridor should avo avoid or areas that should attract the corridor. It could also mean identifying existing facilities that could be enhanced or might be opportunities for co-location. It could also mean identifying connectivity gaps that may need to be addressed through a new corridor in some parts of the study area. The instructions also could go beyond those specific location decisions to note implementation strategies that should be carried forward, refined, and implemented during planning, project development, design, and other activities. For example, you might want to give general instructions about consistency with local plan land use plans today, recognizing that the details will be worked out over time as we move from, from a path course to more specific alignment. Or you might want to make general statements about creating wildlife crossings or bridging wetlands, recognizing that the locations for where that will happen will get detailed over time. Ultimately, the instructions communicate the intent of the task force in applying the guiding principles. This is where we can also document some of the issues that may not, may not be fully resolved when the report is adopted, or you might want to flag as needing more attention moving forward. <clears throat> as the task force reviews and discusses the guiding principle instructions, remember that these principles and their instructions are intended to function as a set. So it'd be important that we consider these thoughts holistically. Here are the guiding principle topics shown at task force meeting number six. During our meeting last month, we were able to review most of the guiding principle topics. However, we did not discuss these five guiding principles topics shown here in green. So we're going to start today's guiding principles discussion with these five topics. Additionally, project staff has made updates to the guiding principles discussed last month based on your feedback. Those updates will be shared today after we review the five guiding principle topics that were not reviewed at task force meeting six. Further, in an attempt to simplify the guiding principles, we have combined conservation lands, wildlife habitats, water resources, and ecosystem connectivity guiding principles under one topic, natural resources. <clears throat> what you see on the screen now shows the order in which we will review the guiding principle topics today. As mentioned, we'll start with those not covered at Task Force Meeting 6 and then move to those which were updated based on the discussion at the last Task Force Meeting. Our first guiding principle to topic today is emergency management. And while we've discussed this in general terms at previous meetings, we wanted to provide you with some more information before we begin reviewing the draft guiding principles and instructions. As some of you heard as we were coming back from break, uh, Mr. Don Lewis is a nationally known expert in emergency planning and is with us today. 
uh, and is uh, going to provide a brief presentation on MCORs and emergency considerations. Don? There he is. You're good to go, Don. We can see you, and I don't know if you can hear us, but if you can speak, we're good. Try again. Okay, I'm unmuted now, so I'm assuming y'all can hear me. Uh, good morning, Task Force. I really appreciate you letting me speak to you today about a subject that is uh, obviously quite timely. Um, uh, I uh, am very passionate about this subject, having spent a 40-year career working hurricane evacuation studies for FEMA and the Corps and doing other types of emergency evacuation work uh, beyond hurricane evacuation for nuclear power plants, um, catastrophic planning for urban areas, and, and a host of other things. Um, I, I've been very fortunate to get to work in these areas that the uh, MCORS projects um, actually cover. So I'm uh, pretty familiar with the vulnerability and some of the issues uh, that are involved there. I've also gotten to uh, one thing I've just really enjoyed over the last uh, couple decades is I've been one of the leaders uh, for the National Hurricane Conference, the Evacuation Planning Committee, where we decide what speakers uh, come to that each year. And, uh, and so I've enjoyed that assignment as well. Um, I really want to say up front that I appreciate Secretary Evans uh, reminding us of the need to have our thoughts and prayers with the people in Louisiana. I did a lot of work with Southwest Louisiana and the Sabine Lake area of Texas. So I know those people personally and I, my heart is just really uh, broken for them. So let me jump into the uh, analysis uh, next. Yeah, first slide. For those of you on the task force who have worked with emergency management fairly closely, you already know that there's basically four phases of emergency management. Uh, the first one is mitigation, then preparedness, response, and recovery. Mitigation has to do with doing things now to lessen the impacts of actual events that occur in the future. Preparedness has to do with developing plans and tools that allow us to uh, uh, take the right actions right before the event happens. Response is what goes on during the event, and, um, and then recovery uh, has a lot to do with returning to normalcy, re-entry, getting resources into areas efficiently and timely. And, I, and I'll just tell you, I think MCORs will impact every, every one of these phases. Next slide. You also know, those of you who've worked uh, with emergency management issues, you know quite well the different roles in Florida emergency management. The state implements the state emergency operates, uh, operations plan. It uh, coordinates uh, a lot of the phases that go on during, during uh, an emergency, including getting Florida Highway Patrol mobilized uh, and uh, activated to do the things that they do. Um, they play an important role in facilitating communication with the federal partners. And one thing that I really pay attention to is their work in monitoring the congestion on state highways, both before, during, and after an emergency. At the regional level, you, know, you probably know that the state has like 11 or 12 regions that are typically made up of, say, four or five different counties. They are obviously communicating pretty closely during an actual event. But one thing you may not be aware of, of is that the hurricane evacuation studies that are performed around the state of Florida are done at the regional level. Uh, the RPCs play a big role in that. And, and those studies actually define uh, the storm surge um, uh, vulnerability, translating those into evacuation zones, um, defining the uh, uh, traffic clearance times that are required to move people for certain events, and then um, looking at some of the shelter possibilities. So those are very important. But, but I'll tell you, the real heavy lifting is done at the local level. And at the local level, uh, you know, especially you county commissioners, you know that, that you have some really heavy duty decisions uh, that are in your court. 
and those include making evacuation decisions, uh, weighing when the storm might arrive versus the traffic and clearance time needs of your people. Um, you're dealing with shelter openings and actually running those shelters, providing the right resources. Um, and then you have the unenviable task after a storm passes of clearing the roadways, managing the recovery efforts, and uh, that includes resources as well as um, doing debris removal, and those are not easy tasks. Next slide. As we look at the state of Florida, um, we don't have to, to guess what the needs are. We, we have actually had some events that have given us a, a pretty definitive glimpse of what can happen uh, if we get um, the you know, threat of a major hurricane. And, and it becomes pretty clear looking at the traffic count data and the timing information that more north-south capacity is needed for evacuation and for re-entry. We need to realize it's very important after an event to get people back to their jobs, get resources into the state so that people can earn a living. And, uh, and part of that equation is roadway capacity. Hurricane Irma really provided a glimpse of what can happen. Uh, as Hurricane Irma approached, we can see from the traffic counts that Southeast Florida conducted some evacuations and the turnpike traffic showed us that uh, vividly. As the track began to look like it was not gonna hit Southeast Florida, we saw Southwest Florida uh, really pick up its evacuation in earnest. Uh, what didn't happen because of the Irma track is we didn't, although we had some evacuation from Tampa Bay, we didn't have nearly what we could have had. And, and one of the points I wanna make is, is that if that track had shifted or been 25 to 40 miles to the west of its uh, uh, actual track, we would have been talking about a whole different level of traffic congestion and evacuation. And uh, I think the congestion, not only on I-75, but I US-19, which were actually pretty substantial in Irma, would have been a, an order of magnitude greater. One thing we know behaviorally is that stronger events produce more out-of-county evacuation. And that's a behavioral aspect that, that we can influence, but uh, um, just like what happened last night, uh, people in Lake Charles were smart enough to know that they did not want to be in the path of 150 mile per hour sustained winds. And we'll have people in Florida, whether they're in storm surge areas or not, or whether they're told to stay in place, they are going to hit the roadways and we need to be planning for that. Next slide. One of the areas that uh, I'll just tell you truthfully is in a state of flux is this whole area of public sheltering and particular in county public sheltering. And uh, there's a lot of different opinions about this. And with COVID, it's really complicated uh, the, the situation in Louisiana the last couple of days, I, I, it, from what I read, and I've really tracked it pretty closely, they, they really opened uh, not a lot of shelters because they wanted to discourage people from, from uh, being close together with the virus thing going on. So, um, you know, the philosophy on fo local sheltering changes over time. Uh, I, will, I will tell you that one of the terms you'll hear is sheltering in place. And what that means from a definition standpoint is, is basically uh, deciding to stay in your dwelling unit and hunker down to, to basically weather uh, the, the event that's going on. Um, and certainly there's a place for that in less severe emergency events. Um, we need to recognize that public sheltering does play a critical role. Um, there are people that will not want to leave their home county. They don't have a home of a friend or relative to go to locally. And so public sheltering will be their option. And we need to plan for that. Uh, we know, I'll, I will tell you this, we know from past events that public, the percent of evacuees going to public shelter has, has declined over the last 20 years pretty dramatically. 
I remember even 30 years ago when I started doing these hurricane studies and the traffic analysis, I would literally assume 20% would go to local public shelter. And what we saw from post-storm uh, evacuation assessments we did is that really only about 10% were going. And in the last few years, only about 4% of the evacuees have actually gone to local sheltering for whatever reason. Uh, it's certainly a behavioral issue. Um, I would assume that by the time that uh, MCORS projects are, uh, if they're implemented, that the COVID uh, virus uh, hopefully would be gone, but uh, I think people will still be fairly germ conscious. And we need to remember that from a privacy standpoint, people, uh, just some people don't want to go to a public shelter. That's just the reality. All right, next slide. I want to uh, sympathize with you local commissioners and officials that are on the task force uh, that, I, that I and the team recognize that you face some pretty significant challenges when it comes to uh, hurricane evacuation and other emergencies. The number one thing is long traffic clearance times. What these times, when you take into account multiple regions of the state evacuating, you start generating these long times that force you to make evacuation decisions before you even know uh, or are confident in the, in the storm track or the intensity of the storm. And that puts you in a very difficult position. For the counties in our Suncoast quarter, you face the situation where uh, perhaps evacuees from uh, South Florida or Tampa Bay have had to start moving quite early and they're clogging your roadways before your local evacuees need to or want to evacuate. And that is a very difficult dilemma. So uh, I would hope that MCORS could help with, with uh, depending on the design of the facilities, uh, perhaps making it so that evacuees in your county can get out more efficiently and we can separate some of the traffic coming from other parts of the state. Um, you also have a big challenge in terms of, of opening and running local shelters. And uh, I, I'm thinking and guessing that you probably would like to preserve some of that local shelter space so that your own people are taken care of. And then um, uh, as the storm progresses, um, uh, maybe you will end up with some other evacuees from other parts of the state. MCORS provides an opportunity to message to those evacuees uh, uh, messages that will direct them um, and let them know uh, what is available locally versus upstate in, in places like Tallahassee. Okay, last slide. All right, so this, this slide, I, I can't overemphasize how strongly I feel about this. The the utility of the MCORS projects are very scenario specific, okay? And when, I, when I'm when i talking about emergency scenarios and particularly in the, the area of hurricanes, we're really talking about a combination of track and intensity. And if you think about it, that defines who needs to respond, who is responding, and to what degree um, are they telling their people to evacuate? And then public participation. Um, you know, we give messages about what we want people to do, but but the actual participation rates drives what we see on the roadways, and that includes people from the uh, storm surge vulnerable areas, which we do want to relocate, and then shadow evacuation, and that's people that are in non-surge areas that choose to evacuate because they're simply afraid of the effects. Um, and uh, so we have to take into account both of those things when we analyze different MCORS alternatives. We also need to look at in-county versus out-of-county out destinations in terms of the percent of evacuees that will, that will go out or stay in. And that is highly variable on the intensity of the hurricane. We know that from looking at post-evacuation behavioral surveys. Um, traffic control and messaging. Um, whatever Florida DEM is, is working with the local county emergency managers, managers come up with in terms of messaging 
impacts what will happen. And then we have to also not forget in the state of Florida that, that, that there may be a certain ambient tourist population some in it sometimes the years the the type of tourists that come in have flown in and then at other times of the year it's a, it's a drive population and we need to think about okay are they also on the roadways and if so uh how is congestion variable depending on that a couple more things before i i shut up here but i i have to say emphatically that that you need to recognize as a task force that emergency managers as a manner, manner of protocol or a matter of protocol try to conclude evacuations before the arrival of pre lamp all hazards. And what that means is, is that they're going to uh, try to have people off the roadways before sustained tropical storm winds arrive, which are about 39 miles per hour. And those winds typically arrive well before the flooding of those roadways occur. So, so we conduct evacuations before the flooding uh, uh, occurs. And I wanna make sure you understand that. The other thing is, is that, is that we want to lessen some of these horrendously long evacuation times so that decisions can be made by you when you have more confidence in the track and the intensity. And then the last thing I wanna to mention to you is I've been very fortunate to give several presentations over uh, several decades to the National Hurricane Conference where I've actually ranked the most difficult areas in the country to evacuate based on all these studies I've done up and down the coast. And, um, and I will tell you in every one of those presentations I've made that Southwest Florida, the Tampa Bay area is consistently in the top three areas nationally of the most difficult areas in the country to evacuate. The Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council just ran a simulated Hurricane Phoenix, which has a worst case track that uh, landfalls in Indian Rocks Beach. The findings of that I thought were just incredible. And I would encourage you as task force members, Google that. Um, I believe uh, yesterday we had a representative from the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council that really helped us with that. And I think he may be on today, but um, that's a very important uh, look at what could happen. And it emphasizes the need for, uh, or suggests the need for more capacity that perhaps the, the uh, M-Course project um, can give us. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Uh, I would love to answer any questions you have and I'll do it to the best of my ability. Um, just appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Awesome, thank you, Don. That was a really great presentation. Uh, before we jump to anything, can you hear me? I'm gonna take that one as a no. Take that as a no. Right. Um, so we would definitely like to uh, be so able to do we have the ability that. to get uh, Don on the phone and we could, can get he can listen to the question by phone and we'll try it that way. But we can definitely hear him. So right. give us uh, task force, give us one minute, please. We're reaching out to Don now. Hey there. Hey, Don, can you hear us? Okay. All right. So while while uh, they're having that discussion, uh, so we can work on that. Uh, the plan here is going to, um, since Don spoke about emergency management, and our first guiding principle happens to be emergency management, uh, we're going to shift over and uh, kind of queue up that guiding principle. And the intention here, of course, is we'd love to give you the opportunity to have your questions and discussions with Don about what he presented, um, but also uh, so that we could also consider those questions from the context of the first guiding principle that, that you all will be discussing, you know, on the tail end of that. Um, so all right, so we're gonna try this. Uh, this is what you call- Technology on technology. That's man. right, we are, we, are, we are trying this thing out. So we've got Don, on cell phone and so we're going to try to see we've got his him right beside the speaker here and uh at, at the dot uh complex here in lake city so we have a couple of uh folks who have uh 
uh, raise their hands. I, I'm going to go first to Commissioner Kristen Dozier with representing the Capital Region Transportation Planning Agency. So, uh, Commissioner Dozier, you're first. We'll give this a shot and see if this will work. Thank you, sir. All right, so I get to be the guinea pig. Mr. Lewis, can you hear me? I sure can. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. All of our different devices, we're getting used to it finally after a few months. Um, so thank you for your presentation. Thank you for your service. Um, this is a huge and ever evolving question for all of us. And as you said, quite a day to be talking about this. Um, yeah. So I serve on the Appalachia Regional Planning Council and the Florida Regional Planning Council Association. And I appreciate you mentioning that they do conduct the regional evacuation studies. We, our study is out of date. I'm grateful to the governor and to Director Moskowitz for helping get that funding. And the study, the updated study is just now getting started. So I took note of what you said that we don't need to guess about where we are right now. Southwest Florida to Tampa is a challenging area. Um, but I guess my question, sir, is we have not updated this study since the more recent round of storms from Irma, Matthew, Michael. Michael in our area developed very quickly, so the evacuation actually came later than perhaps um, we might have if we had known it was going to be a really big storm. Um, so there are different construction patterns. There are different communication patterns since the last time we did the study. And my question is, will that study inform how we implement evacuation, including the roads that we need and how quickly the clearance times that we need for those roads. That's one part of it, will the study help? And the second part is, I hear what you're saying that MCORs will, could help this situation, particularly in Southwest Florida, but it's my impression that limited access roads, toll roads, interstates might be helpful in evacuation. We might have more control over them, but we can conduct good evacuation on a divided two-lane road um, with first responders helping out as well. It doesn't dictate that we have to have a toll road, correct, to meet those goals and the benefits of MCORs that you were describing. Is that correct? Um, yeah, let me, let me answer. Uh, you brought up two excellent uh, sets of questions. Let me answer your um, questions about the hurricane study first, and that is that there, there's a, several ways that the hurricane study will inform any analysis that we do regarding uh, alternatives um, during the PD&E study on the on this MCORS project. One is is that there'll be a, a pretty significant behavioral effort, from what I understand, and it will gauge. Uh, sort of where the public is in terms of their attitudes and what they plan to do in terms of, you know, for different categories of storms, what, what they'll actually do. The other thing that the studies will do is they'll update the demographic data so that we have really good numbers in terms of, of, uh, resident population and then translating that into evacuating populations for different events. All right. Um, and then the second, the second question you raised, uh, oh yeah, the second, I'm sorry, the second thing you raised was this issue about, you know, will access control roadways do anything beyond just being able to communicate with the, the evacuees? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, and what I mean by that is in terms of the evacuation time requirements, if you look at a, you know, if you look at a, a uh, four-lane divided rural highway that's not access controlled. Um, traffic engineers tell us that that you're looking at maybe getting 1,800 to 2,000 vehicles per hour through those areas. 
But if we move to more of an interstate facility where it is access controlled, that number jumps up to about 2,800 to 3,000 vehicles per hour in one direction. And I don't mean to get overly technical, but when you translate that into it, the number of additional people that can get out each hour, it does have the potential to reduce evacuation clearance time. So there are some other benefits, and I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir, it did. And if I may, one quick follow-up. Um, I agree the behavioral element and the demographic study is going to be critical. And we, as I said, we have a lot of different communication. We have, we have different construction standards. And I guess that really, this may be more editorial, Mr. Lewis, I'll say it this way. Um, I'll acknowledge that rather. Um, if a limited access toll road, something like that, is needed for the west coast of the state, primarily for evacuation, a lot of the other things we're talking about that maybe benefits from a toll road could just fall by the side. I mean, if that's going to be our primary focus, I would question whether or not we could ever evacuate Southwest Florida fully, even if we increase from 1,800 to 2,000 up to 2,800 to 3,000 cars per hour. Um, we're still going to need to do a lot of other types of mitigation and look at those behavioral studies in order to respond to any type of storm from Matthew Irma up to Michael. Um, so I appreciate what you're saying, and I think improving our limited access roads is really good. I'm not sure it's the it's the silver bullet, right? We need a lot of different oh, options. Oh, you couldn't have, yeah, you couldn't have said it better. Yep, yep. Thank you, sir, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Greg. Yep. Uh, Weiwei, you, you, you came on for a second. Did you want to add anything to uh, what Don had said? Hey, Commissioner Dozier, I'm so glad that you brought up the update of the Regional Planning Council's hurricane study. Um, I was involved with the first study and um, was involved with the modeling efforts with the um, evacuation models. Um, yesterday, at uh, I think at the Southwest Central Florida Corridor Task Force meeting, Pat Steed brought up the issue of the updating of that study, and she suggested to have a draft, to have an instruction to kind of instruct DOT to coordinate and um, kind of work with the recommendations from the study. So that could be one thing that we can consider for this task force as well. All right, thanks, Wei Wei. Uh, we have a, uh, also a, a, a task force member who wanted to, to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, Charles Lee representing Audubon, Florida. Charles? Yes. Um, I really think we have to go back to look at the approach that we took to hurricane emergency preparedness uh, prior to the advent of the what I would describe as the stampede toward evacuation that was initiated by some very improvident remarks and recommendations made by a former governor with regard to Hurricane Irma. Um, the, re the reality is uh, that we used to have a fellow in charge of our emergency management in Florida by the name of Craig Fugate. And at the time that Mr. Fugate was managing emergency, including hurricane preparedness in Florida, we had a much more structured approach to how the priority for evacuation should be conducted. And in those days, the primary focus on evacuation was really limited. It was limited to barrier islands and it was limited to areas where you have a coastal storm surge that is known to be a danger that structural, uh, the, the strength of structures doesn't matter if they go underwater. And so those places must be evacuated and that's where the focus is. Um, the, very recently after Mr. Fugate departed Florida, we've, I, I think, begun to drift on the prioritization question. 
And instead of targeting toward areas that are going to go underwater, we now have public officials who, in the face of a probable storm, are bleeding out the words to the general public, evacuate, evacuate. And so we are putting people on the road uh, who may be leaving a post-Andrew constructed home, in other words, under the post-Andrew building codes, that could easily withstand a 150 mile an hour storm. Instead of those people being in that safe home, they are getting in their cars and getting out on the road. And frankly, I think we are inviting disaster in that situation. It's not possible given the lead times on evacuation. Uh, if, if we were to robustly improve all of our turnpikes in Florida to speed up the transit times, nonetheless, if we are going to get a large number of people out of Southwest Florida, uh, including those not in the flood zone, ahead of any major storm, uh, we're essentially going to be telling them two, three, four times a summer or a summer and fall, we're going to be telling them get in their cars and start driving when the hurricane threat may be three or four days away because those kind of lead times are necessary. So by doing that, we're going to be springing constant false alarms on people. And by springing false alarms on people, we will basically uh, cause them to doubt the necessity of any evacuation. So I, I think that I think we really have to get back to a more structured approach, rather than encouraging rather blindly um, general populace evacuations. Uh, with that said, uh, I think that a key feature of managed evacuations has got to be the preparation of emergency depots for fuel supplies and increasingly electric car charging. Uh, but uh, I, I don't want my enthusiasm for those features uh, to uh, overshadow the basic point. And the basic point is that general evacuations in hurricanes are not prudent in most cases and that they blur the focus on what really needs to be done, which is coastal evacuations of people who are going to be in the storm surge area. So Don, I'd like to, I, you know, you can, you can address that. Obviously, as you said, you know, I've known, known you uh, as for years, as far as, you know, your expertise and, and, and this. So you, you've done a lot of work in the state of Florida for decades. Um, just, you, you know, you can, you can address that and, and speak to, to, Charles's concerns there. Yeah, see, it, it, this is not just a Florida issue. I mean, all all the states that I've dealt with have wrestled with this issue. But I, but I want to I want to be clear with the task force that the the state of Florida, the protocol, uh, uh, the emergency operations plans, the and you can talk to any emergency management person. The, the instructions to the public is get out of life-threatening storm surge, and, we, and we've developed a set of evacuation zones that relate to that, and get out of mobile homes and structures that are substandard, um, and, uh, and that's the instruction. I, I'm not aware of, of some, his, I, I'm not aware of this historical uh, shift that Charles was talking about, uh, I, I will say this, it would be quite interesting to have someone from Lake Charles, Louisiana here uh, on, on this meeting to tell you what it's like to sit in your home uh, during 150 mile per hour sustained winds when the, the roof is coming off and the house is shaking. And I just read this morning uh, that, that a number of people who chose not to evacuate um, uh, went through that, and of course we don't have any information about casualties. But uh, this notion of a Category Four or Five hurricane, uh, just writing it out, uh, maybe you're okay doing that. But uh, I, knowing what I know, I'm, I'm getting out of dodge, and my family is not going to go through that type of trauma. 
Well, if you're in a mobile home, uh, you need to get out of DOT. But if you're in a post Andrew building code home, the roof is not going to come off. And that's that's the distinction. Uh, if, and, and, you know, clearly, uh, you know, I'm sure that the homes in Lake Ch Charles, Louisiana, because they were not under the Florida building code were much more at risk. Uh, but we need to we need to look to building codes as a key element of the preparedness in this situation. Um, and, and all you have to do is run the tape of what Governor Scott was saying with regard to Irma. And you will, you will see that uh, it, it in essence engendered an unnecessary panic because it was not a focus call for the appropriate time. It was not, it was not a call for evacuations in a structured way. And that's the problem. We need to get back to structure. If you're in a mobile home or a pre-Andrew uh, constructed us, home, that's yeah, different. We, the pace. We, got the, we got to get moving here. We're, we're well behind schedules. So let's pick up the pace. Um, all right, Charles, thanks. Thanks for the clarification on that. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Chris Rito with the Appalachian Regional Planning Council. Chris, did you have a comment or a question? Good morning, everyone. I, I just figured it would probably be a good time to, to give everyone an update on where the regional planning councils are with respect to an update to the regional evacuation studies. I, I think I, I updated the group at our kickoff meeting in Tampa that we, uh, we were hoping to get funded uh, a legislative appropriation or some funding through the Division of Emergency Management uh, to, to update the regional evacuation studies since the last comprehensive update was completed in 2010. So uh, as Commissioner Dozier announced, we were very thankful that the governor did appropriate the funding to finally do this. It's long overdue. And to echo Don's comments, if one of the most important things is the behavioral study. Since you know, over the last three or four years, we've seen kind of an increase in the number of hurricanes. Florida's population has increased. Uh, there has been, you know, we have that 10 year lull. Obviously attitudes will, will probably have, um, have changed when it comes to evacuation and that behavioral study is used in conjunction with an update to demographics, an update to surge modeling, and then as well as traffic modeling for the copulate clearance times. And then those county emergency managers use that, all that information uh, to establish their evacuation, and that comes down to being able to do this at the statewide level with collaboration between all 10 regional planning councils means, in theory, you can coordinate the evacuations effectively. And, and some of the things that were being talked about, it, I think, is kind of this, this problem with shadow vacuums. We've noticed you know, there is, and this is probably in, in all states that are vulnerable to hurricanes, that there's this problem of trying to get in, in the rush to try to get people out. There are certain people that, you know, as Charles Lee mentioned, that don't actually need to evacuate. So that, that's another part of the studies are completed. You know, there's an education component, making sure people understand what evacuation zones they're in and when, and, uh, and, or, or, and the bigger question, should they evacuate? And that will definitely, with alleviating uh, traffic congestion during evacuation. But back to my original comment, we, we just ex executed a contract with DEM to begin this process. It's typically a three or four year process to update the regional evacuation studies, but we are going to completely overhaul how um, we update these strategies. So this, you know, this plan and or the study is really is, is what it is. And we're gonna try to complete it in a little over a year. We're going to take advantage of you know, innovative technology and, and data. A lot has changed in 10 years, but we are we are hoping. I, I really like Weiwei's comments based on what Pat Steed said. We we are trying to be more inclusive, having the emergency managers and our state partners involved in this process. We're going to have to move really fast, but I just wanted to let everyone know that these regional evacuation studies won't be completed at the earliest until a year from now. 
All right, Chris, thanks for that. Thanks for that update. Um, timely information, no what we're talking about. Um, I want to bring to everybody's attention the, the guiding principle that you'll see on your screen. So this is the guiding principle towards emergency management, and we're going to we're, we're, we're working our way there. There's a couple of more comments that I want to get to in regards to Don's presentation. Uh, Janet Bowman, representing the Nature Conservancy. Uh, Janet, you had a question? Uh, yes, and, and this really gets to the guiding principle and following up on Chris. I mean, to me, what's critical is that um, uh, the, the updated um, data from the regional studies is is the data that's used to evaluate um, evacuation need a, a, as it's relevant to the to the Sun Coast Parkway uh, I mean the Sun Coast corridor I mean that's that's the issue and, and beyond um, the regional planning council's update which I, I'm so grateful that they're they're got the funding to do it is really what the state emergency evacuation policy is because certainly you know what the governor does um, you know which of course is in, in consultation with local governments in terms of how broad or how narrow their evacuation orders are is very relevant so I, you know I would I would really like to hear from DEM um, because I don't know what the state policy is um, on that front and I guess the other point is, you know, given the stronger storms and sea level rise um, and, you know, some of the FEMA updates to, to mapping, uh, you know, the storm surge zones have changed. And in preparation for this meeting, I was pulling up the evacuation zones for, for Levy County and noticed that, you know, there's 19 is in the middle of, of you know, a significant storm surge zone. So all of that obviously has to be considered in um, evaluating um, the need for for 19 and you know whether or not it's the best hurricane evacuation option. Um, so I, I mean my personal um, thought is that we need to to kind of um, strengthen the, the language to specifically refer use, using the uh, regional um evacuation data when that's available yeah. thank you and, and don just to kind of kind of piggyback on what she had, she had said about the concern of using 19 i think can can you reiterate and, and restate uh what you had made at near the end of the end of your presentation about uh you know timing for evacuation and the fact that it's it's to you know be utilized and done prior to the event uh, at some point in time, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to evacuate because it, you, you, people may have waited too late. But yeah, the, the, you know, it's it's hard to keep this time frame in mind. But but it is important to reiterate that you know, our local emergency managers in this state, they know that they've got to shut down these evacuations uh, before the arrival of tropical storm winds. And if you've ever driven in winds that were 30 mile, 35 mile per hour sustain, you know, you know how uncomfortable that is. Well, 39 miles per hour is the cutoff. And then what typically happens is, is several hours later, depending on the characteristics of, a, of the storm, um, you begin to get that surge flooding. But that surge flooding starts at the coast and it works its way inland. So, so the evacuation should be well completed before we see flooding of you know of evacuation rounds gotcha. and uh, but anyway it, it's in a, it, it's I understand the concern yeah and Janet we'll talk we'll talk about the the details of the guiding principle in just a few minutes um, I do want to get there a few few more people who made some comments so if we could just be succinct with your comments so that we can move forward um, and really get into the meat of what we need to discuss today uh, Chris Emanuel with the Florida Chamber of Commerce Chris uh, you had a comment for Mr. Lewis well, I, I really appreciate you coming here and uh, thank you for spurring some of the conversation. I think what I'm taking away from this is that there's a lot of experts that have looked at this um, issue and evacuations over the course of uh, their entire careers and have got a lot of data to back up. Um, kind of narrowing our focus, which I think is something this task force has an issue with, 
instead of trying to figure out how to recalibrate emergency management or the state budget or things like that, how would you recommend this task force uh, create a guiding principle that allows us to adapt to the best information available, move the most people as safely as possible, and then potentially um, shut down the uh, infrastructure asset when it's bad and get picked back up when we need it again? Yeah, Frank, can I, yeah, I think that's you did, did you? Yeah, did you hear? Did you hear? Were you able to hear I, all I that? Did. Okay. I did. And that, that's a that's a great question and comment. Um, I I like to you know as we talk about guiding principles and draft instructions, you know I I like for us to move towards measurable things. Okay, so so if we're going to evaluate different imports uh, quarters and and alternatives uh, alternative alignments, you know I, I'd like for us to you know measure. Okay, well if the roadway uh, saves us six hours or 12 hours or two hours of clearance time, what is the significant savings? And I look at it, at it in terms of what county commissioners have to deal with, and that is, can we buy county commissioners a couple of different advisories uh, later to have to pull the trigger? That, that to me, is a significant um, uh, positive impact. So we're going to have to evaluate that at some point, um, you know, and we're going to need to pull in the latest and best information from these hurricane studies that the RPCs are talking about. Um, so, yeah, that's my response to that. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple of county commissioners, uh, local officials we'd like to go to. Um, representing Citrus County is Commissioner Scott Carnahan. Uh, Commissioner Carnahan, you had a question or comment? Well, I, I, the last comment that was made, you know, when you're a commissioner in a county, especially on a coastal area, and, and you're having meetings with the uh, state uh, emergency management, and they're, and they're advising you, the last thing I'm going to do is tell uh, a citizen, just stay in your home. Um, because, I, you know, even with the building codes today, 150 miles an hour wind, can definitely uh, take your roof off. But, uh I just want to say, Don, uh, really enjoyed your uh, conversation yesterday and uh, today, and I think you gave uh, us local officials a lot of great insights. So thank you. Thank you. Um, from uh, Jefferson County, Commissioner Betsy Barfield. Commissioner Barfield, you're self-muted. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Right. Two quick comments. Great mini lesson on emergency management. I do I would do want to point out on if the corridor does come through US 19, that is our very south end of, of our county, and we are very vulnerable in this area in terms of communication and EMS, fire, law enforcement access. So perhaps we want to take a look at as we are building our um, exits and our areas um, where they access the road um, to co-locate -lo our um, uh, substation for EMS, fire, and law enforcement, particularly in the rural counties in which um, the road might be located. Additionally, our communications in the south end of the county is spotty at best. And every day we put all of our law enforcement EMS folks at risk. And I would pass the DOT um, and the task force, um, all of the powers that be to upgrade the communications uh, along the corridor. We've talked about that. I'm reaffirming my comments about communications along there, um, particularly in my area, communications power. Um, it, it, we have none and we are constantly looking for opportunities in which we can fund one and we've just not been successful. So I'd like to add those two uh, comments to the conversation. Thank you. Good. I'm a Jefferson County resident, so I would echo every one of the things you've said. Yay. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Greg B. Muffle, we're about an hour behind. Today. Yeah, I know, I know. We got to go. Um, <laughs> so Charles, Charles, uh, Charles Lee, we're gonna leave you with the last comment. If you could make it succinct and quick, so we can move forward. Uh, but Charles from uh, Audubon, Florida. We have a draft uh, guiding principle in front of us and a draft set of instructions in front of us. I think that in general, they are good the way they are. Uh, my only suggestion would be that in the draft instructions, there be consideration given to adding a bullet point that talks about the location of um, fueling uh, facilities uh, to maintain an emergency fuel supply to be available during evacuation events, as well as charging stations, that that be incorporated in a design. But other than that suggestion for the instructions, I'm fine with the guiding principle the way it is. Thank you, Charles. Uh, with that being said, if we'd like to say, I'm sorry, uh, Christian Dozer, uh, you had a question? I'm so sorry. Very quickly, for the draft instructions, do we need to reference um, the updated evacuation plan? Um, I appreciated Weiwei's comments about Pat Seed's uh, suggestion at yesterday's meeting. Chris Rito referenced that. I just wondered if that needed to be in the instructions or if it's already embedded somewhere in the document. I was so, Kristen. I was thinking about that too when when I was listening to the conversations, and I. I I would interpret the guiding principle where it says support and enhance local, regional, and state emergency management plans at all phases. Um, I would I would assume, and I think it's a safe assumption, that anyone that was applying that guiding principle would, in fact, seek to obtain the most up-to-date plans by which they would then enact, you know, and carry forward that principle. Um, of course, it's at the preference of the task force to decide if that's clear enough. Um, but I could not imagine a circumstance where where the DOT or anyone else would take that and 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 not apply it to what would be the most updated information, or accounting for when that might come to make sure that when they do their analysis, if it's on the horizon, to know that that's that's how it would be applied. I am comfortable with that response. I just wanted to ask the question. So long as there is some direction to look at the updated plan and not just what's on the book so far. Correct. Thank yeah, I agree. Good point. All right, good. So now we are headed in the right direction. The last so two let comments. Me, let me interrupt right there. I, yeah. I want to apologize to Charles. I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just I wanted to encourage us to get to the, the finish line there, Charles. Um, right. So, well, so yeah, we leave Dawn on, but we're probably going to mute some of these yeah. things to get rid of some of the background yep. noise. Yep. Um, Janet Bowman from the Nature Conservancy, you had your uh, you had your hand up. Yes, I'm um, following uh, Commissioner Dozier's comment. I, I really think it's important that it's explicit and to refer to the Regional Planning Council study and and you know perhaps best available data um, because I, I I do think it's important that it's clear that the analysis isn't done prior to that um, information being available. Um, so that that's my preference. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. I mean, I think it's it's very easy uh, as we've as the task force has done, you know, last meeting and then in between this meeting come up here for us to accommodate an instruction bullet that I think we you know we can come up with language uh, that recognizes uh, just what you and Christian have asked, um, you know, noting that most up to date and uh, horizon level updated information be accounted for in the input in the how we do this part. So thank you for that comment. Do we have other commenters on? No other commenters on that page. All right, so I'm actually, you know, I will read really quickly. I, I did read the draft guiding principle. I'm going to go through the instructions that are on screen uh, very briefly. Um, and then if there are any more comments on that, we'll entertain them. And if not, we'll move on to the next guiding principle. Uh, so the draft instructions that we currently have uh, for emergency management state evaluate the need and demand for emergency evacuation and sheltering at the local, regional, and state levels. Use best practices currently available to evaluate the impacts of storm surge and sea level rise during the development analysis, comparative evaluation of project alternatives, and support emergency evacuation needs by enhancing emergency evacuation and response time, including providing or maintaining access to emergency shelters and other emergency facilities. So that's what we've got on the guiding. I'm sure you guys have been staring at the screen for a while and you, you, 
probably didn't need me to read that, but uh, if there are any more comments or questions on the emergency evacuation principle, I know we got some notes uh, to revise for next time. Yeah. Um, all right. So we got uh, Chris Wynn um, from Fish Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. You had your hand raised. I did. Thanks, Greg. Um, there's a there's a couple of draft instructions here that are focusing on um, shelter and evacuation. I just kind of want to think about, you know, the response and recovery for a minute, possibly suggest a uh, another draft instruction that relates to uh, Michael um, and having to clear a lot of debris on I-10. Um, you know, our, our agency is responsible for some of the initial response, search and rescue. Um, thankfully, we've got very good staff, um, you know, to help us out after the storm. Um, but I wanted to kind of key in on, you know, some some studies that showcase uh, native plants being uh, more resistant to storm impacts. So um, I sent in some some draft language, um, and if the, if the task force is okay with it, um, I'd like to quickly read it off. It just says, while creating a naturally rural look, strive to plant and maintain natural buffers using storm resistant natural vegetation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's an excellent comment. Uh, Greg, Mandy, do we have any other hands raised? No. All right. Uh, thank you for that. We're going to move on to the next guiding principle. Uh, this one is uh, regarding highway safety. Um, we actually, in, in the previous meetings, got comments uh, about this guiding principle uh, from Ken Armstrong and Commissioner Kitchen. So, uh, Mr. Armstrong and Commissioner Kitchen, I just let you know that I'm going to come to you guys first uh, after we go through this revised guiding principle or the comments on this guiding principle. So, what it states. Plan, design, construct, and operate a corridor that safely accommodates multiple modes of transportation and types of users. We have one draft instruction for this guiding principle. Reduce transportation incidents and improve response by using advanced safety strategies, including innovative technology, design, and operations. Uh, so with that being said, and again, in light of uh, just previous discussions, uh, I'd like to uh, open up with uh, Ken Armstrong, if you have any thoughts on that. And I know I'm putting you on the spot. If you don't have any, that's okay. You can just say so and we'll move on. Uh, Ken? Yeah, um, honestly, I don't remember what my comment was on this last, the last time. But if you include my comment from last time, I'm sure we were both brilliant. <laughs> uh, sounds good. Well, I know that I know that Ken, you had you had had some concerns as far as you know providing uh, parking for for trucks and for overnight parking uh, for that from a, you know just a, a, a safety standpoint of of making a a uh, accommodations for truckers. Um, so I don't know if it was maybe something in regards to that, but um, I don't know if you wanted to, to to mention that or if you feel like that maybe hey. Yeah, maybe we need to put a, a draft instruction in here to, to specifically call that out. Well, if not with my comment, that, that it appears to me that the uh, that it is not covered here. Um, but, but as I say, I don't uh, I don't remember and I don't have those uh, those comments with me from before. So uh, it's all good. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Commissioner Kitchen? Commissioner, yeah. All right. So, Commissioner Kitchen, you're self muted, but didn't know if you had any comments in regards to the, the highway safety guiding principle or instructions, if you had any suggestions or if you were comfortable with where this at. Again, representing the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. It still shows yourself muted, Commissioner Kitchen. And similarly, at the same time, if there are other task force members that wanted to speak on this one, you can go ahead and start raising your hands and we'll begin to queue those up. Yeah, absolutely. All right, no other comments? All right, we will move to the next guiding principle. 
this one is speaking to economic development. Uh, again, in previous meetings, I know that, that we did not cover this in test for meeting six, but in previous meetings, we did have individuals that spoke uh, to these topics. Uh, and we actually had a list on this one. So Chris Emanuel, Sue Ramsey, uh, James Stansby, and Eric Anderson uh, have had comments previously. So I'm going to read them, and then I'll go to that list of individuals to get their feedback. Uh, draft guiding principle for uh, economic development states maximize opportunities to enhance local community and economic development with an emphasis on rural areas. Avoid and minimize adverse economic impacts to individual communities, businesses, and resources. We have three draft instructions for this guiding principle. Uh, states work with communities on preferences and consistency with economic development plans and visions. Conduct early outreach to communities and the public and private sectors to fully understand economic development needs including job training, education, and workforce development. And then give priority to and enhance potential economic development opportunities and employment benefits in the study area by providing, improving, or maintaining accessibility to activity centers, employment centers, learning institutions, agricultural lands, and locating interchanges in a manner that preserves and maintains the local land use vision and goals. Uh, so that's what we have to work with today. Uh, Chris, Emmanuel, if you wanted to share your thoughts, Thank you. I think that this is um, these are good guiding principles overall. Um, this is something we really haven't talked about much, but one of the reasons that we're having this discussion, one of the reasons the M course was pushed through the Florida legislature, was the hope of bringing some more economic opportunity to rural areas in Florida that have largely been left behind over the last 10 years of economic growth. So, really appreciate um, the the guiding principles, and I think that the draft instructions that touch on community preferences and needs, I think would um, there's probably a lot of people on this task force that like to see that there and are really hopeful that uh, local communities get the help that they want, not that other people are imposing on them. So good work. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Sue Ramsey. All right, Sue. Sorry. I okay. think we were getting Can you on. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, Yes, so thank you. I think that we've had some of the discussions that we've had on other categories have fit well into economic development, and it is definitely a broad category. And rural economic development is something that I am extremely um, passionate about, and I think that there will be a lot of opportunities for these communities. There was a discussion about the truck parking. I actually um, have a note about that also because one of the things would be to improve logistics industry, um, moving freight as kind of a targeted industry and having truck parking as part of that, um, you know, can support that industry. Um, because when you are involving freight, you will have a lot of trucks. So having that parking and a place for truckers um, will be an asset. Also, maybe a park and uh, share a ride where you park and ride together like a ride share program. And if you can have some employment centers, that could be um, as well. If uh, broadband, I know that's its own category and it's been discussed, perhaps if the priority for the initial, um, you know, the laying the last mile, maybe identifying some high employment areas, targeted industries areas, um, maybe to begin, that might be a priority area. Um, increasing economic diversity is um, extremely important in especially rural communities providing access to jobs and training and that's you know something that you have a diverse audience in the rural area and being able to have maybe some sort of um, prioritizing or coordinating with the training center education center and maybe tying that back into the high schools and the education side maybe identifying targeted industries for the region um, emerging industries, targeted industries, and that would go back to having discussions with the economic development offices for not only the counties 
the areas that are directly impacted, but those within the region, because an economic development project will benefit the entire region, not just one specific municipality or county. So having those economic development officials voices, you know, providing some input as to their targeted industries. Do they have a strategy for attracting industries? That would be um, consideration. And I know we talked a lot about reviewing the local comp plans. Um, also, just want to make sure we include the SEDS strategy, um, and that can be found on the Regional Planning Council site. Um, they kind of manage and, and run that, but uh, cons following consistently with the SEDS strategy in addition to the comp plans and utilizing those planning council resources. Um, opportunity zones, we've talked about that a little bit, maybe enhancing investments in opportunity zones for economic development. Um, just engaging our economic development stakeholders, and that um, will be your large existing employers, and as well as tourism, agritourism, ecotourism, um, the entire agribusiness field, and education facilities as well. And access to outdoor recreation and nature tourism, um, the greenway trails, hunting and fishing, maybe provide, um, you know, coordinate ease of access to those and promotion of those. There's a lot of the existing agribusinesses in our region and ecotourism, and there's potential to for those to expand and increase as well. Um, we talk a lot about recruiting new businesses in economic development. But I think also keeping in mind the existing businesses, uh, business retention and expansion programs and opportunities for existing businesses to grow and expand and make sure that they have access and um, opportunity as well. Um, increasing well, I'm, care. I'm in that region. I thought it was manageable to go into. Right. <laughs> I, I gotta Sorry, I have a lot. <laughs> No, this is, um, it's, it's great feedback. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, I, I agree with, with Greg. We'll, we'll have to find a way to work with you to, to condense those. Sure. Interests. So I just wanted to throw out there some of those ideas. I know that is a lot. I know it's it's kind of broad, but I just you know want to throw that out there as food for thought for some of the others to maybe be thinking about and how we you know incorporate that. And a lot of those things are covered in different ways. I know in even some of the other principles, but just to show that it does tie into economic development. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Thank you. That's great feedback. Um, since I apparently am on the bloopers reel for this MCOR meeting today, uh, it's James Stansbury, and I apologize for getting your name wrong the first time. Uh, so, we go to James next. Thank you for the opportunity. Was looking at the last two lines of the third bullet under draft instructions, and where it talks about look finishing up with locating interchanges in a manner that preserves and maintains, was thinking that uh, first that consistent with rather than preserves and maintains, uh, because preserves and maintains to me doesn't sound like something is moving forward uh, or advancing, uh, which may or may not be the case, uh, but consistent with and then also putting in there uh, reference to the local comprehensive plan. Uh, perhaps that was meant what was meant by goals, but the comprehensive plan to me provides a community adopted vision and goals that everybody can refer to, everybody can have input on, in terms of amending if they think necessary to achieve that, whether it's to preserve something or to uh, change something, whatever the character the community chooses for itself. So that was the limit of my comment. Thank you. Oh, thank you, very good feedback. Uh, and then uh, lastly, just from the individuals we were gonna go to uh, from what we have here is Eric Anderson. Yeah. 
Eric, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm here. You know, I'm, you know, with those with those changes that he just mentioned, I think you we you really grasp the um, generalization of the whole economic development and keeping it within the communities and allowing them to actually develop it in the way that they they see it developing. So I'm I'm good with it. All right, thank you. Appreciate that feedback. Uh, yeah. We, yeah, we've got a couple other comments um, that have come in in addition. Uh, representing Gilchrist County, uh, Commissioner Todd Gray. Commissioner Gray? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, this economic development discussion, we we have a, a group that's been operating for years, and I believe all of the member uh, or the, the counties that are in the uh, Suncoast study area, and that's the North Florida Economic Development Partnership. And in addition to being a you know, the, uh, on our uh, board as a county commissioner, I'm also chair of this group, and they've been they've been around for years, but they're also funded by DEO, and I didn't know that we need to be that specific, but they cover a lot of these issues that we're, we're bringing up, you know, workforce development, and um, they coordinate with other rural counties and communities, and their specific mission is to work on economic development in rural counties. So I, I don't, again, I don't know that we need to list them by name, but the NFEDP is a established organization that is working in these rural counties and has been for years, and I just thought it might be beneficial to either list them or reference uh, working with those organizations that are in place that have been, again, they're very familiar with the issues that I think would uh, be beneficial to uh, coordinate with. That's all. Thank you. Hey, this Thank is you. Sue. Comment. Appreciate that. Hey, Sue. Hey, She might have been. Yeah, um, is she good? Well, uh, her hand was right. Sue, do you have a uh, Sue Ramsey? Do you have a, a comment in regards Just to Just really quick, a follow up on the NFEDP. That certainly is a, a resource. I, I I'm not sure if all of the counties uh, NFEDP covers a 14 county region. I think most of the counties uh, in this path are included in that, but I'm not sure like about Citrus County or that it encompasses every county in the um, region for the parkway, but you just mentioning that, like the FEDC that I represent, of course, represents the entire state. The NFEDP is a 14 uh, county, I believe it's 14 county regional economic development organization, and we do partner and work with them through FEDC. And certainly, you know, they have some resources as well. I believe Jeff Hendry spoke at one of our meetings um, when we were meeting in person. Uh, when we had one of our panels, I believe. Yes, you did. Yeah. No, that's good feedback. And I think, you know, to your comment and and uh, and to Commissioner Gray's comment, uh, you know, we've set precedent to some of the revisions to the other instructions about, you know, listing whether it's a specific plan or another agency, uh, just as, again, you know, recommendations in the instructions. So I think it's, it's fitting to both what you mentioned with the FEDC and, and uh, NFEDP that, um, you know, just adding that in there is is future further clarification, you know, for the implementation later. So thank you for that feedback. Um, so uh, representing career source, uh, Ms. Diane Head. Diane, uh, you had a comment? Yeah, just a quick comment to, to piggyback on what Todd was um, speaking of with NFEDP. Um, they actually did a, a study um, probably been about 18 months ago now that we started it. Um, but it is out. I can I can forward that to you just for consideration. There's um, a lot of what we've been talking about referenced in there. I mean, it, it it's obviously not referenced too because the task force didn't exist at that time. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of things, um, uh, topics that that kind of intersect there. So, um, and I I think. Some may have it, some may not, but I can definitely send it forward just for review um, and pull out some pieces. But there is a lot of a lot of work that went into that um, and a lot of consideration. So it is the I want to say like the plan for NFEDP moving forward. Got you. No, that'd be great. Yeah, if you could share that resource. Um, thank you. That'd be awesome. Ken Armstrong from Florida Trucking Association. Ken, you had a comment? Yes, two quick questions. Uh, can you all hear me? I got a message earlier that I was garbled. 
No, we can hear you. There's there's a little bit of background, but it's it's certainly clear enough to understand and hear you. Okay. Uh, one is I think on any comments that you make in the report about comprehensive plans, the moving needs to be pretty careful to allow for, for sort of the chicken and egg part of comp planning as it relates to uh, to this corridor. Some counties may want their comp plans to stay exactly the same. Other counties may want to do some fairly substantial revisions to their comp plan if M cores is a possibility for them. So I think the language just needs to be careful when we refer to comp plans to allow for the sort of constantly changing possible uh, landscape for what uh, individual comp plans look like. The second comment is somebody like Don Lewis to talk to us who is a national expert on what sort of highways and uh, not just highways, what sort of corridors, I guess, I go back to that word, facilitate economic development and which ones don't. Uh, we have a really good I-10 example of building a big highway highway and then not doing much for economic development in local communities um, and there are other highways that get built that do help economic development so i'm sure there are national experts out there that say if you do a b and c while you're building this corridor it will help. If you don't do a b and c then it's not going to do any good so and, Maybe finding who those that person or uh, some of those national people are, perhaps even who reside here in Florida, might be instructive to either FDOT or to our whole task force on uh, on the role of economic development and how you facilitate it. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Ken, I'm going to, I'm just going to reiterate what you said and just kind of restate it just in case if other people were not able to understand. So I, if, if I captured it right, and I'll summarize it, the, um, the, the, you just expressed a little bit of a concern in regards to when we reference the local comprehensive plans about the chicken and the egg. Some, some counties may want to update their, their plans to be consistent with a potential of MCORs coming through. Uh, through their area to be able to, 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 you know, incorporate it, while others may feel less, uh, less uh, motivated to make adjustments there. And then the last comment was in regards to how we had a, a Don Lewis as an expert for emergency management, maybe a consideration would be to reach out, find a, a national expert in regards to economic development and, and, and roadways and how that transportation corridors can assist with that and make sure we're incorporating some of those uh, characteristics uh, for for enhancing that. So I, hopefully that captured what you what you said. That's 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 what I heard anyway. So okay. All right. Um, Commissioner Kristen Dozier from the Capital Region Transportation Planning Agency. Commissioner Dozier, uh, real quick before we go on, I know that uh, Ken mention the chicken and egg thing on the comp plan and i just want to steer if we're going to have further dialogue about that we actually have a guiding principle that's just about consistency with local comp plans and that would be a great time to unpack that conversation yeah um mm -hmm. so i just wanted to mention like if we're going to go down that road let's table it for now and then we can we'll be able to grab it in earnest uh for the guiding principle that speaks exactly to that so i'm sorry uh and commissioner Dozier, if you weren't going to talk about that i apologize for interrupting that's just fine. I think it's a good point, but no, I wasn't going to talk about it. Um, right. So um, I, I've got to compliment all the speakers who've come before, and I'm just going to point to uh, Sue Ramsey, your extensive list of issues related to economic development. I mean, th those are the types of strategies that will get us to the goals that are in the statute and um, in our guiding principles here. So. I think a lot of us who've worked in economic development, medium-sized counties, or with our partners in rural counties, 
know that our area um, and I'm North Central and North Florida has not received as much investment. Um, we don't have as much coordination. Um, I'm going to put a caveat on that and say I've seen incredible improvement over the last 10 years. And I was actually looking at the uh, North Florida um, Economic Development Partnership websites um, when Todd mentioned it. So I think there are a lot of great assets out there. The question I had listed for this section was who will carry out these instructions? We keep coming back to this that a, a number of these uh, goals, things that um, are going to be in the report are not necessarily within FDOT's scope not necessarily funded, and from my perspective, they would be goals whether we were talking about MCORs or not. You've got a lot of people who've been working on these issues for a long time, as I said. So I think that um, kind of drilling down here, and you, um, one of you guys said it earlier, and forgive me for not remembering her, who, but that we could record instructions to work with other groups and the principals. Is that and in, in those instructions in our report, is that correct? Yeah, I was, uh, as you were mentioning that, Kristen, yeah, that is correct. And that's what I was thinking that as you brought that question forward was we have a lot of language in our other instructions that speak to something to the effect of like coordinate any, you know, discussions with these particular agencies or these groups or, you know, work with their planning processes to, you know, account for in your analyses, that kind of stuff. So I was thinking something to that effect. And I think that's what the question you're asking is. Is that the type of language that would get us there? That, that's great, yes. I think in addition to that, and this may not be something that we can do or that would resonate with a full task force, but could we encourage increased funding for the rural areas of opportunity or other programs like that that help support North Florida Economic Development Partnerships and other groups? And I'm just gonna pick out one thing from Sue's list. The, said strategy. Um, this is connected to Department of Commerce and Economic Development Administration. If we improve our SEDs, we are better qualified for federal dollars. So it has a um, an impact on other funding sources, which has been a theme throughout our task force meetings. So um, I'm just wondering if we can kind of step this up a bit for what I've described as these aspirational goals to say, mm -hmm not just work with other groups, but we should actually fund these groups and look for other strategies and workforce, career source through others that will help us meet these goals. So that's a great question. And I guess I would, I would ask Will, uh, if you could, I know that you've had to address this sort of a, a question as it came to things like broadband or some of the other times that this came up, we were talking about infrastructure improvements and utilities and such. So I'm not sure if you have a, a thought uh, as it concerns, you know, the way Christian asked about um, language and the guiding principles or instructions that would speak to things like SEDS or other programs. We'll get with Will and I'll find an answer for that, Christian, for us to, oh, there's way, way. Well, the, the MCORS legislation does give us the broad scope of these co-benefits and purposes. Um, if DOT, even if DOT is not going to be the lead agency implementing these recommendations, we can, we can take an active role in working with our partner agencies. Okay. Uh, thank you, Weiwei. And um, I would just reiterate this point that we've had a tremendous amount of good work, as I said, and improved coordination year in year out funding remains a problem and so if there's anything the task force could do to say we may be able to meet these goals if other partner agencies increase funding i i think that would be beneficial um the last thing that i um Actually, I think I, I covered all my questions. Forgive me, I thought I had one more. Um, I think this may be covered. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna say one last thing. This will just prevent me from chiming in another time later on, but there, um, there are some 
references, actually there's one in here, locating interchange in a manner that preserves and maintains. We, um, we had some discussion about that a few minutes ago. Um, that I think is kind of a separate issue, more related to existing businesses and not impacting our current economic centers in some of our counties. I just wonder if unpacking those a little bit to improving what we have versus not impacting negatively what we have might be a helpful distinction. Um, I'm also going to keep coming back to any reference to interchanges when we're not, we have other guiding principles that focus on existing infrastructure. So I think maybe some clarity on that given our guiding principle on existing might be helpful. All right. I will mute myself now. Thank you all very much. Good discussion. Thanks, Kristen. Appreciate the feedback. Uh, Greg, do we have any other speakers on this topic? The only other hand up right now is uh, Chris Wynn with Florida Fish and Wildlife. Thanks. Yeah, real quick, I, I uh, was going to go back to one thing Sue brought up. I appreciate her mentioning, uh, you know, outdoor recreation and, and, and protection of, uh, you know, natural environments. Um, I wanted to quickly reference an economic uh, analysis that was done a few years ago uh, by the Conservation Fund um, in which they identified forestry, fishing, bird watching, agriculture support industries are 10 times more important to the Big Bend region than anywhere else in Florida. And so I think um, I really like to kind of highlight what Sue brought up and ask that uh, we consider adding uh, uh, at least one more bullet uh, instruction to support uh, local tourism and recreation economy by providing opportunities for access and connection uh, to the outdoors. Thank you. No, I think it's good. Yeah, great, great insight. Appreciate that, Chris. All right, so uh, if there is no further, I'm looking over my, my counterparts here. If there's no further hands on this, we're going to move on. We're going to do broadband as the last one, and uh, we'll go through that, and then we'll, we'll break for lunch. We're, so broadband between us and lunch. That's right, broadband is between <laughs> you and lunch. Um, and like I've done with the, uh, the last few, um, we did have some individuals that uh, have spoke about this topic previously, so I'm going to go to them uh, to share their thoughts um, as soon as I read this quickly. So, broadband guiding principle states, plan and design the corridor to enable co-location of broadband and other utility infrastructure in right-of-way. Plan for broadband and other utility needs at a regional scale, independent from tran the transportation facility. Address these needs through the corridor where feasible. We have two draft instructions currently on this. Uh, ensure broadband provider access to FDOT right away is non-discriminatory and competitively neutral. And then the second bullet is assist in providing broadband for schools, libraries, and other civic buildings. Uh, Chris Bailey, you are our, our, one of our broadband experts on the task force. So um, I'm going to ask you to share your thoughts on this. And then you have some particular thoughts on the second bullet. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and uh, Greg and Greg and task force members. I just have a, a couple of comments, um, one relating to broadband specifically and then the other as it relates to utilities. Um, so regarding the, the, the draft guiding principle um, on broadband specific to right-of-way, um, I see this language as acceptable and it certainly positions the private internet service providers uh, well to expand broadband when and where it's feasible uh, throughout the development of the corridor. Um, however, I do have a question about that second bullet, as you just mentioned, and that uh, we want to assist in providing broadband for schools, libraries, and civic buildings. Um, I don't believe we discussed that in our previous uh, panel discussions. But I wanted to make you aware of a federal program that is run by the Federal Communications Commission it's called E-Rates. And that is a program that actually provides significant funds to K-12 uh, schools and libraries to help deploy telecommunication services and technology. So I'm thinking that might be a little out of the wheelhouse of, uh, or a little out of the scope for DOT in this, uh, in this study. So Chris, are you are you suggesting that that bullet be removed? Sounds like it. I am suggesting I'm suggesting that that be removed because it may conflict with what's already provided for by the uh, the Federal Communications Commission. Okay. 
unless anybody there there may have any thoughts as to where that where that bull was uh, came from where it was developed or if perhaps it was discussed and I perhaps missed it. No, no, I think you're right. And I would, I guess I would just add to that because, you know, this is, this was something that, that you had shared um, in a discussion that you and I had had. Uh, just that if there was questions from the task force members about that, because I think, you know, you were very clear on, as you unpack this a little bit, that, you know, as a result of the E-rate program, uh, you know, DOT trying to carry this instruction forward as an implementation principle, uh, like you said, it was kind of, it's, it's, there are two different lanes and they don't really interact. Uh, so I guess if I, if I may say so, it'd be DOT getting out of their lane um, because of how the E-rate program operates. Um, so I would just say that to follow up on your comment about if there was follow-up from the task force uh, about that bullet and how that interaction occurs, that you might be able to help with that. Do you want to go to Mark Futrell? Yeah, we got, we got some hands. But. So yeah, so we got some hands on this. I was going to go to Mark Futrell next and then Sue Ramsey, and then I, we do have some hands up on this one. So. Uh, Let's go ahead and do that. So, Mark? Yes, hi. Um, I just had a comment um, on uh, comparing what we have here on this guiding principle to what we've seen in some of the other task forces. Um, it, it, in the high-level needs column and in the draft instructions, it is broadband-centric um, um, without recognition, recognizing other utilities. And I think in some of the other um, task forces, there's more recognition of other utility, um, other utility activities, water and wastewater, electric, gas, for example, um, that would probably be appropriate to consider including in the needs and the instructions. Gotcha. That's a good observation. Uh, Sue Ramsey. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you call? I just, just now, though, you, you, you're on the spot. <laughs> okay. Um, what exactly would you like me to? Um, oh, no, as far the, and I don't. There's no. I'm not asking for anything. Here. I just know that, like, you had. had okay. Previous, okay. Um, I was just making sure about. because I, I do. I know that broadband is a really important issue, and you know, targeting. You can't do it all at once. It seems we've had this discussion in other, you know conversations and meetings and groups, but targeting a specific area, perhaps to kind of complete that last mile first might be of interest and also support, you know, talking to the businesses that are there. Sometimes they will invest to, um, they will invest to have the service and that may be something to consider discussion, discussing. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Thomas Hawkins from Thousand Friends of Florida. Thomas. Hey, thanks, Greg. Um, I, if when I look at the infrastructure that the statute says MCORS is supposed to provide, I think broadband is absolutely the most uh, exciting for economic development for folks who live in these areas. Uh, in terms of your bang for buck of what you invest and the kinds of benefit that you get, uh, you. And we talked about this when we had our broadband meetings, but it's absolutely essential. Um, it's absolutely essential for uh, folks to be able to live in these areas and, and work remotely or to access entertainment. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a utility that's becoming more and more apparent how absolutely essential it is. Um, so I, I, would I, the concern that I have about the way that we've set up uh, this guiding principle and the draft instructions is it uses language like assist in providing um, and in the draft guiding principles plan for broadband. The statute authorizes the MCORS program to, to actually uh, develop infrastructure and that's absolutely what we should be doing with broadband. Um, and you know, Chris makes some interesting points about federal funding that's available. Um, I know there's also an important perspective of, from the private sector, um, how uh, collaboration is done with the private sector uh, so that we still have uh, private providers as a part of this process. Um, but I, I think the statute puts the funding, makes the funding available, and gives us the goal of providing broadband. That's absolutely what we should be, do, be doing by saying we're just going to plan and assist. We're setting the bar way, way too low. Um, as for the perspective that it's outside FDOT's wheelhouse, a lot of the stuff we're looking at in MCORS is. 
you know, the, the environmental conservation goals are outside FDOT's wheelhouse. Um, you know, we, we, uh, that, that's, we can implement this in collaboration with other agencies just because FDOT is doing the planning now. It doesn't mean that the scope of the, um, the, the goal should be narrowly tailored to, um, to FDOT's expertise in developing and operating transportation infrastructure. Uh, so it, 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 I, uh, that's my perspective, and I would love to hear, especially from elected officials in the corridor, you know, what, what are you hearing from your constituents? Is this, a, is this infrastructure that they want? And do we want to use this state funding that uh, the legislature's made available for MCORS projects, uh, leverage it to help provide these uh, benefits for residents in these areas and businesses in these areas? Thanks. All right, thanks, Thomas. Ask and you shall receive. Um, Commissioner Betsy Barfield uh, from Jefferson County raised her hand. So, Commissioner Barfield. Uh, no. uh, Commissioner Barfield, we have an audio issue. It's saying that you need to enter your audio pin again. Um, yeah, go back to Chris. So, uh, so yeah, Chris Bailey, we'll come back to you with Florida Internet and Television. Thank you. And I just wanted to speak to to Thomas's comments about it being essential. Um, uh, part of the you know the environment that we live in today, you know, for jobs and and uh, innovation and education, I absolutely agree with you. But as far as the the, the state running uh, becoming its own ISP, there are a number of statutes that are in place that actually prohibit that from occurring. Um, you know, we've heard from other panelists where they've had. Uh, within their own municipalities, they've had the ability to go out and create their own uh, and become their own ISP. And essentially, every single one of those has fallen through at, at some point. You know, they start up, they cost millions of dollars, and ultimately they fail. Um, and they're often sold on pennies on the dollar. Um, I think we saw this with a, a northern project that was developed by a number of, like, of I think it was like 14 different consortiums up in the North Florida area and millions, tens of millions of dollars was spent on this program and ultimately it failed. So I think that'd be the worst possible case scenario for anybody to do it. I think this is really something the private sector should be involved in. And I think it's an area where we want to be involved in, we want to expand, we want to expand our footprint and build out into areas. We want to have an impact in rural areas. But when the government gets in the way, I can tell you it's going to be difficult for us to make that investment. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, Commissioner Barfield from Jefferson County, it looks like you're you're back with us. Um, you had a comment? Yes, thank you. Um, in Jefferson County right now, this is our hottest issue: is connectivity. Um, as we develop our guiding principles and we meet, um, your team has um, put in stations throughout the communities to make sure that folks can participate in the meetings. And the reason they're doing that is because there is poor connectivity in many, many places in these rural areas. I would encourage you to leave the language in there. Um, and perhaps we could uh, make it a little stronger instead of uh, instead of assistant providing, um, ensure we provide um, where possible the schools, libraries, and other civic buildings. Uh, it is so important that we pay attention to this broadband and other utilities. This is one of the best features of the added benefit of this toll road coming through and a lot of people are putting their hat on the broadband issue. Um, I'm, I'm just going to go back to uh, several years ago when we had the housing bubble and we had stimulus money. We tried to um, put in that middle mile and that last mile connection that failed. Um, this is not the time for us to um, take our foot off the gas. It is time for us to increase our efforts in this broadband. And it is very important to Jefferson County. Um, I can't speak to the other rural counties, but I would imagine that it, it, it's important to them. That drives economic commerce, that drives schools. It, it, so many facets of that broadband um, that plays a part in our community, in our commerce, and please, leave it in there and, and, and let's, let's move forward. And I mentioned creating a task, uh, a sub task force of uh, making sure it gets done. Uh, I state that again, that 
it being so important to Jefferson County, if it comes down through Jefferson County, that we make sure that this happens in, in our community. Thank you. Okay. So, Chris, if, if the language on that second bullet, you know, in light of what Thomas has shared and, and what uh, Commissioner Barfield just shared, if, if that language, you know, instead of saying like assistant providing, it said something like we, we were talking about, if you recall, like Christian Dozier's question earlier, you know, language where we say like, you know, coordinate with programs such as FEDC, uh, or I'm sorry, E-rate, uh, and stuff like that to, you know, help ensure or, or strive to, or however, I know we've got always, we start stumbling over ourselves when we start using the uh, iffy wording, because uh, I know that's a thing for the task force, but I guess I would just be curious what your your thought is, if the bullet's retained, but if it's changed, instead of saying assist in, it's, it's something like coordinate with I think when we look back, hold on one second, Chris. I think the word assist goes a bit further than we were actually giving it credit for right here. Uh, I, I think the bill intent was not for us to be in the broadband business, but to assist and support those providers that are. Uh, that could be providing that, that utility corridor within right away that we possibly have already owned or have to acquire, and you know, look at possibilities of providing conduits or uh, the uh, section of uh, the uh, the cabling. So I think we, we might want to give it a little bit more credit to word assist. Thanks, Secretary Evans. Uh, Chris? I was going to say, I think when we look at the you know, the overall need here is it's, it's really to expand rural broadband, and that's something that I think we all want to do, and I can completely understand why they want to keep that in the, the draft construction. It's just more of a comment of it may actually conflict with something that's already available. Okay. And then I'd also like to speak to the piece about utility, because, you know, one of the problems that we talk about is what are some of the impediments that we have to deploying broadband in rural areas? Um, one of those actually relates to utilities and in particular pole attachments. Um, as you can imagine, as we go into uh, a more urban area and we're attaching to utility poles, we may attach to one utility pole and serve 10 homes. But as we go into a rural area, it may be the opposite. It may re require us to attach to 10 utility poles to get to one home or to one business. And in every area, depending on who owns the pole, we could be paying anywhere from $3 to $28 a month attached to that one particular poll. So I was going to offer the, the, the task force at least an idea that, that we put in here as a solution or as some sort of instructions to develop some sort of clear and consistent rules for utility poles that are used within the corridors to certainly help mitigate this major barrier to the deployment of rural broadband. Uh, anything that we can do to lower that cost to deploy broadband means there's more likely that we're going to be able to go in and uh, provide those services in those rural areas. And we're also looking at other things as well. There are rural broadband grants that are coming out from the federal government. Um, and obviously, you know, there's actually been legislation passed uh, this past year in House Bill 969 that allocated $5 million towards it. So there, there are other opportunities that we can look at that can help us. But I think this particular one, as it relates to pole, to pole attachments, is something that we can address as they would be uh, located within the corridor. And if we can develop, again, clear, consistent rules for utility pole rates, it would certainly help mitigate that, uh, that barrier to deployment. Yeah, let us jump in here now for the lunch announcement. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, no, this is great discussion. Thank you, Chris, for that follow-up. We, we're not going to cut anyone off, uh, so I know we said we we're going to finish this one up and then go to lunch, but we're just going to go to lunch, and when we come back, I'll open it back up, and if there's follow-up questions or comments, uh, we'll go to that. Uh, Secretary Evans, if you would like to. Yeah, let's let's come back at uh, 1.30, let's say 1.35. Uh, odd number, I know, but uh, we're trying to spare as many minutes as possible for our uh, robust discussions today. I appreciate everyone's in input. Uh, let's pick up a little protein, a little carbs for energy, and we'll be back at uh, 1.35 on, on uh, live. So uh, please keep uh, tuned in to this station uh, <laughs> so we don't have many technical difficulties getting back on. Uh, we will mute everything. Uh, so enjoy lunch. Hold up. Now we're ready. All right. So uh, <clears throat> welcome back, Task Force members. I, I want to take just a quick minute and say thank you for 
uh, the great engagement, interaction, conversation we had uh, for the morning part uh, of today. Thank you again. Uh, so sort of some goals for today. Uh, remember, we have 13 uh, total GPs. Uh, we were able to go through three new ones that we had not been able to visit our, at our last task force meeting. We've got one we're going to revisit uh, being broadband. I think we had like seven people with the virtual hand raise uh, prior to lunch. If we want to, if you want to, uh, to further discuss the broadband uh, GP, we'll do that. Uh, and then we'll move to uh, ag, uh, another new one that we haven't visited. And then for the remainder of the afternoon until 4.30, uh, we'll work on uh, the language of the remaining eight uh, GPs that we had visited uh, at the last task force meeting. So anyone that's had any te technical difficulties through lunch, uh, here's some contact information to get some assistance. And with that, uh, Mr. Greg Vaughn, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we jump back into the broadband guiding principle, I do want to remind everyone uh, regarding the registration for public comment period today. Uh, you must register if you would like to make a comment uh, uh, during the public comment portion of today's virtual meeting. Um, any request on can be made online prior to uh, or to provide comments virtually received by 4 p.m. today or via speaker card at the public viewing locations will be addressed uh, during the public comment period. If you have not registered to provide public comment during today's virtual meeting and wish to do so, please sign up on the website under today's event or by completing a speaker card at one of the public viewing locations. If you need the link emailed to you, please use the raise your hand function and uh, one of our team members will send you the, the, the link to sign up for that. Comments can always be submitted at any time to fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us. So we're going to um, get back into the guiding principles uh, discussion. Uh, great discussion this morning. We were talking at lunch how that it was really good to kind of really have some good dialogue about things. So, so that was great. Um, I would like to just kind of remind everybody that our focus is going to be on the guiding principle language itself. Um, so if you have a, a general comment about this, um, if you could maybe just hold that. Um, we're just trying to make for sure that our, our language in regards to the guiding principles and the draft instructions is really what we're trying to target today uh, during the discussion. So. With that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to Greg Garrett to uh, continue with the broadband discussion. All right. Thanks, Greg Vaughn, uh, Secretary Evans. Um, just pretty much like Greg said, uh, we're going to jump back into broadband. Uh, we had left off, I believe, with uh, Chris sharing some feedback uh, as we went into the break. Um, but I know, like, like Greg Vaughn said, we did have some of the people that had their hands raised. Yep. So let's see what we got. Yeah, let's start off with some more discussion on this. Uh, Thomas Hawkins with Thousand Friends of Florida, you had your hand raised. Uh, comments, questions? Thomas, are you there? All right, we'll circle back. Let's go to, um, we'll come back to Thomas. Uh, let's go to Commissioner from uh, Taylor County, uh, Commissioner Pam Fiegel. Mr. Fiegel? Uh, yes, thank you. Just uh, prior to us taking the lunch break, I was just going to say that I concur with uh, Commissioner Barfield um, in what she was saying about the broadband. And, and Taylor County also has many areas with no connectivity also. That, that was my comment. I got you. Yeah, <laughs> thank, that's you. Certainly, thank you. That certainly is a need within the the area. I think even somebody commented about the fact that's that's one of the reasons why we're offering the, the, the public viewing locations in a couple of places today in Old Town and Crystal River. So um, we're going to now go to. You want to check with Thomas again? Yeah, let's check with Thomas again. Thomas Hawkins, Thousand Friends of Florida, are you there? Okay, we'll come back. Uh, James Stansberry for the. Department of Economic Opportunity. I'm sorry, that's an earlier one. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, 
All right. So does anybody else have any comments? We'll, we'll try Thomas one more time before we wrap this up. Any other comments in regards to the guiding principle or the, the draft instruction for the broadband and other utilities? Um, Charles Shen representing Florida Farm Bureau Federation. You're self-muted, Charles. Very good. Sorry about that. Just want to um, make it known that that uh, agriculture is becoming more and more dependent on broadband uh, because as uh, new equipment is being being uh, manufactured, uh, many times it it automatically talks back and forth with the manufacturer or the manufacturer uh, representative, uh, and and uh, so it's just uh, becoming more critical out in the countryside for uh, agriculture as well. Gotcha. All right, we'll go back to uh, Thomas one more time. Thomas Hawkins, Thousand Friends of Florida. Are you there? Okay. Um, all right, we'll, uh, we'll move on. We can get with them. We can get with them individually later. Um, Greg? Yep, we're gonna move on to uh, the agricultural land use guiding principle. Uh, one thing we also mentioned earlier when we were talking about guiding principles, and just for everyone to keep in mind, uh, you know, if it is, as you're hearing this discussion and you start to have thoughts or ideas on, you know, editorial uh, type comments to the bullets that are there, adding additional ones. Um, if, you know, you feel that the discussion has been adequate for what you wanted to share, but you wanted to just send that in, you can always email that to Ryan uh, or any of us. and and that's how we work with the revision process from this meeting to the next. Um, so, all right, we're gonna move into the agricultural guiding principle. Um, you see the draft guiding principle there on your screen. Uh, it has uh, three draft instructions as well. Um, I, I don't think you need to read it to us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I, yeah, I think you guys are, are, we're at a point now where we can all read together. So um, instead <clears throat> of going through the exact words of it, uh, I'm just gonna, since uh, Charles Shin, since you represent the Farm Bureau, felt that it would be uh, appropriate to ask your thoughts on the language on screen. Sure, uh, thank and thank you very much for the opportunity to do so. Um, I, I think we're certainly moving in the right direction, uh, starting to, I mean, covering uh, the the important issues uh, as they regard as they uh, equate equate to agriculture. You know, one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at uh, when you're thinking about agriculture and in fact, uh, you have on the draft instructions, agriculture slash silvicultural lands. Um, you, it, there's a lot of agriculture that is not assumed in, in, that, in that terminology. Uh, equine is, is a good example of that and, and uh, as well as aquaculture and, uh, and the and a, a big one for the state of Florida is uh, nurseries and horticulture. Um, <clears throat> they, you know, they they typically they kind of get sidelined when when you're talking about agriculture or silvicultural lands because people are typically thinking about either cattle or row crops or something like that. So um, just just want to make sure that that you know, we're we're encompassing all types of agriculture and that and then the the other uh, in, in looking back at the at the guiding principle draft that you that you have down down there I, I think one thing that we need to to really um, emphasize is is that the the connectivity between working farms is is incredibly important and and uh, and, and that connectivity uh, not only between the farms but but between the farm fields themselves. And one of the one of the concerns that we have is the larger equipment that we typically have um, that that needs to go down what are typically backcountry roads, and that's not a problem with the with the right uh, 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 flashing lights and that sort of thing and an SMB uh, uh, a tag. <clears throat> uh -oh. You whenever you get more. Uh, traffic in any particular area of the countryside that becomes that much more dangerous to move that equipment around so that that's a real concern that we have okay thank you for the feedback i appreciate that um was all i guess we'll ask if there are any other hands raised to discuss this one yeah um 
representing the, the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Peggy Hanrahan. Uh, Ms. Hanrahan? Yes, I'm sorry. I was having trouble, I guess, getting recognized. I had been, I'd had my hand up before lunch and then raised it again, but it, it, I think there was a system issue. I just wanted to briefly touch on, on broadband. Um, I, I know we've moved on and I apologize for that, but I think that this comment may be sort of um, relevant for several different areas of um, the guiding principles that we're working on. Uh, there was a statement, um, which I'm sure is very accurate with regard to urbanized areas and more um, densely populated areas about whether or not, you know, the, the proper role of government with respect to broadband, but you could fill in, you know, any any service. I mean, when you have a dense enough population, then sure, you can make it work and there's a profit motive involved. And so the private sector can come in and provide those services. And there are lots of different examples of that where we need um, support. And I think that that um, several of the speakers, I know Mr. Hawkins made the comment, or Commissioner Hawkins to me, he and I serve together, uh, me as mayor, him as a city commissioner in Gainesville, where we provided broadband as a city utility because there wasn't yet the, the profit motive. I mean, this was back in the 90s, actually, but the profit motive wasn't there for private sector solutions. And so that is when you need to have you know, sort of the classic public-private partnership to make it work. And I think that um, Mr. Evans and others spoke to some of the proper roles that DOT can can um, can play with regard to right-of-way acquisition and, and agreements having to do with those kinds of things, regardless of whether or not it's a toll road or regular DOT right-of-way. And so I just wanted to sort of emphasize that, you know, one of the reasons we're even having any of the discussions about public utility issues in these very rural, very uh, agricultural and not very dense counties is because if it made sense for someone to come in and do it with the private sector, they'd have done it. You know, they'd have done it by now. So um, that's why, you know, as the gentleman from the, the chamber or the economic development said, these folks have been left behind in periods of economic growth and expansion is because when you have very low population density, you know, there is not the same capability to make the numbers work. And that's when there's a, you know, a, an overarching, you know, societal need. I mean, you, you know, nowadays the digital divide is a very real issue between those who can um, get access to and afford uh, high-speed internet service and those who cannot. So I'll just leave it there. But I think you could, you know, since we've moved on to other things, I'll say that you could make that leap on lots of the utilities that we're talking about. Certainly on issues around uh, water and wastewater infrastructure, that's also, you know, there are lots of parallels there. So I'll just leave it at that. But thank you, thank you for uh, indulging, indulging me uh, on an issue we already passed by. Well, while we have any comments on that? Yeah, Pekin, uh, uh, did you have any comments on, on the uh, ag as well? I know that uh, this is an area that you'd spoken to in, in prior meetings, so. Um, well, certainly I do think, as I think has been said before, you know, the, the industry itself are the ones who are best capable of articulating their needs. Um, I, you know, as I spoke to Mr. Shin about this uh, or have heard him speak about this, I think that it would probably be difficult to characterize a single position coming out of the agricultural community because it's certainly very broad and diverse. But I think it would be smart for me to defer to those. I mean, I, I believe that, um, you know, the on behalf of Commissioner Freed, she would really uh, want to represent the in, the industry's viewpoints, and I think that you know the Farm Bureau and others are are well positioned to articulate that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. We have other hands. Um, yep, uh, representing uh, Audubon, Florida, Charles Lee. Uh, Mr. Lee, you had a comment or question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, um, I just sent Ryan and Greg a suggested bullet point. Uh, language uh, for the instructions, um, and uh, it's, it's fairly brief. I'll just read it. Uh, recognize that a new corridor within agricultural land 
can lead to land use changes that diminish or preclude the continuation of agriculture. Prioritize other alternatives over options that traverse rural areas and agricultural lands. Um, something's going on in the background there. Uh, uh, in, in, any, in any event, I, I think the bullet points we have are what I would describe as uh, soft or just suggestive. And, and I think we need to be a little more explicit on this one and, and to indicate that uh, it is preferred to go to other options rather than routing new corridors through rural agricultural lands. And uh, the second point that I would make is with regard to the language of the guiding principles themselves. Um, you have um, used the word in the guiding principle, simply the word agriculture. And then you've used working farms in, in the paragraph below that. There is a tremendous amount of confusion by the public as to what is in agriculture. And I think Charles Shin alluded to this a few minutes earlier. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, sort of do not put uh, in their minds silviculture in the same category as agriculture. Now, I know that over in one of the draft instructions, you've used the term silviculture, but I think it needs to be more bright line than that. And I would suggest that in the draft guiding principle, you're a little more explicit and say, uh, agriculture, silviculture, ranching, uh, lay them out a little bit more so that you have a broad picture rather than something that is uh, potentially narrowly interpreted by a reader. That's it. Thank you, Charles. Um, representing uh, Nature Conservancy, Janet Bowman. Janet? Janet, looks like you're self-muted. Yeah. I got it. Um, so I submitted a bullet, a draft bullet to staff uh, regarding prescribed uh, fire and suggesting that, um, let me, I'm trying to find it here. Okay, so on the, the third bullet, it talks about um, coordinating impacts to, to farmland preservation areas and Florida Rural and Family Lands Program, including the ability to burn. And I would just suggest that the ability to conduct prescribed fire is, is important for both public and private silvicultural lands, and not just lands that are identified within farmland preservation areas or rural and family lands. So I, I've already submitted that language. Yeah, thank you. No, it's a, it's a good addition. I think the thought there was to separate the bullet and make it a second bullet. Um, so for clarity. Charles Shin from uh, Florida Farm Bureau Federation. We'll come back to you, you had your hand raised. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I just want to uh, uh, agree with uh, Charles Lee and actually what Janet just said also. Uh, I, I uh, agree with the wording of both those uh, suggested bullets that they, that they sent in to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Levy County Commissioner uh, Matt Brooks, Mr. Brooks. Uh, yes, good afternoon. I just had a question for clarification on the draft guiding principle that states improve transportation connectivity. Are we including on this, say, a uh, privately owned farm that gets disrupted or uh, separated? Are we talking about making sure there's connectivity uh, for that owner? Yes. Because a big concern is not to, you know, break up large tracts of agriculture or land. So I just want to make sure I understand that. Yes, uh, I, I believe so. I believe that was the intent is that if there is an area, if there is um, an impact to a farm and and let's say, for example, that that that, that landowner, that 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 farmer is is agreeable to the to, to, to that and willing to work with the, the project as far as advancing but they're going to be impacted that we would then work with uh, to try to 
accommodate something, whether it be, uh, you know, to pr provide connectivity so that their land is, you know, they're able to access land if it happens to be on both sides, you know, of the of the roadway itself, that they'll be able to access it as, as opposed to being blocked off from one side of their property to, to maintain connectivity for them. Okay, thank you for that clarification. That's something that's very important to our folks in Levy. Sure. It, it might, yeah. Um, Charles Chen, and I was just and I was just going to say to to the last comment, it, it might serve to to add an instruction to. I mean, that's the point, right? Is the guiding principle lends to an idea, and then the instructions are are for further clarification. So, uh, it's a good question. Charles Chen, did you want to? Uh, you have a follow-up thought? No, uh, no, I don't okay. have a follow-up with that. But I do have a, a suggested uh, additional bullet for guiding principles, and I haven't sent it to you yet, but I can I can do so. Uh, uh, but I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just read it right now. Um, Please. Agric agricultural areas uh, provide open spaces for large wildlife, smaller areas for endemic species, and water and wetland stewardship, while at the same time providing recreation and agricultural tourism. Okay, that's, so that's like a, an instruction. No. Yeah, well, it, I I I see it as a guiding principle that you the instructions would go from that, but but uh, you know that's I guess for you all to figure out. Okay. All right, we'll also, look for that. Thank you, Charles. Okay, uh, from Florida Trucking Association, uh, Ken Armstrong. Ken? Yeah, I know that Charles Lee said that he was sending you his instruction, I think it was. Then, you know, I drive this, uh, this route, you know, once a month or something, and I've been trying to picture it in my head. But he says prioritize areas other than agricultural and then this route. Is there anything other than agriculture land along this route? I mean, somebody else helped me here, but, but it would be hard for me to see a draft instruction that said prioritize other areas besides agricultural land along this route. And somebody could show me that there were other things besides agricultural along the route. So I just wouldn't really buy that as a draft instruction just because uh, it was set in. That's all I have on that one. I, I didn't get all that. I couldn't so he was, what Ken was asking was uh, that uh, Charles' language suggested recognize a new corridor within agricultural lands can lead to land use changes that diminish or preclude the continuation of agriculture. Prioritize, and this was where Ken's question was, prioritize other alternative Terms over options that traverse rural areas and agricultural lands. And so Ken's question simply was, uh, are there other lands out there besides rural areas and agricultural lands? So that, that, does that capture it, Ken? Yes. All right. Uh, Charles? Yeah, I, th I think the answer is clearly uh, yes. Uh, Ken, there are others, and the, the one that is the most prominent is the existing uh, almost 400-foot-wide four-lane corridor that constitutes US-98, US-19. Uh, that travels through the most urban areas in the entire uh, study area, um, and uh, it is not a new corridor. It's the use of an existing uh, right of way, and uh, so even though the land on either side of it is in, is agriculture, the reality is using that route uh, will not increase the pressure on those agricultural lands at all. And furthermore, some of the aspects of co-location on that route will serve to actually protect that agriculture. And for example, if part of that highway turns into a limited access highway, there'll be less potential for strip shopping centers and other things that would creep along to potentially invade the agricultural land. So uh, the answer to your question is yes, there's a very clear uh, alternative uh, in co-location that uh, avoids uh, any conflict. 
Okay. Charles, I mean, if you mean to say something, why don't you just say it instead of saying everything else but what I'm really thinking? I mean, it, uh, that seems a little disingenuous to, to come up with language on agriculture when really what you mean to say is just put it on existing highway. That's one man's opinion. Well, it, you know, it, there are potentially some other corridors that don't necessarily invade uh, agricultural lands. And, 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 you know, I think, we, we, you know, it would be real easy to solve this problem if every recommendation we made was co-locate, co-locate, co-locate. The report could be one page long and we wouldn't have to worry about the rest of it. And I think that's, I think it's probably a little too early in the process to, you know, my conclusion is co-location is best, but I think it's a little too early in the process to absolutely put that in writing uh, in, in a way that, uh, you know, you know, eliminates any other consideration. I mean, you know, my thought in going back to that language that I sent and Ken, it may, it, you know, it, it, it may help you, uh, when I said prioritize other alternatives over options that traverse rural lands and agricultural lands, um, what I'm talking about is new greenfield corridors that traverse agricultural, uh, rural areas and agricultural lands. Um, that that we, we may get to those, prioritize things over them, but the first option ought to be avoiding a new greenfield corridor through those areas. If you want to add the words to this, New greenfield corridors. Um, that would be that might might uh, clarify it for you. I just want to real quick. You know, we we've gone down this before, and I just want to remind everyone that the guiding principles are a set, and there is a guiding principle which speaks to co-location. And so the application of the agricultural guiding principle does not happen in a vacuum outside of the guiding principle speaking to co-location, to which the co-location guiding principle or the maximized use of existing facilities, uh, it, it, it applies the point that, that's being discussed now. Um, all right, well, I want to go to uh, Gilchrist County Commissioner Todd Gray. Commissioner Gray? Yeah, I think it was just clarified for the last statement. Um, I understand the co-location is a, is a priority. Uh, in Gilchrist County, it would be very difficult to um, bring a new road through without disrupting our ag lands. We have a lot of pivots for irrigation. We have a lot of new solar fields and even some more on the board. So um, not not saying it couldn't come through, but it'd be much more difficult to bring it through our small. We are geographically, we're a lot smaller too than many of the counties. So it, it, again, it would be difficult, um, but I'm, I'm probably getting off topic. I just wanted to let you know as a, as a uh, just representing my county and my citizens, uh, keeping it closer to existing corridors would be helpful. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Janet Bowman from uh, Nature Conservancy. Janet? Uh, I, I think my hand wasn't put back. I, I have nothing at the moment. Thanks. Okay. Thank okay. you, Janet. Uh, Kent Wimmer, Defenders of Wildlife. Kent? Thank you. Um, I provided some language to staff before that really hadn't been addressed. I, I think you could maybe address some of these comments if you added a new instruction. Uh, minimize the fragmentation of agricultural and forestry tracks and operations. I mean, if you specifically said you're going to minimize the fragmentation of agriculture, forestry tracks and operations, that that would solve a lot of the uh, consternation we're, we're having right now. I got you. And, 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 and real quick, just to say, I, I think I agree, because if you look at the guiding principle, which, which Charles Shin spoke to to begin with, and, and again, we talked about what is the words in the principle, um, and there was some good discussion about adding the different types of ag to help clarify. But then we look at the instructions that speak to, you know, the implementation of that principle. If you have an instruction that speaks to, you know, minimizing fragmentation uh, and, and such, I think it, it steers you know, the application later on uh, to the direction that I'm hearing Charles Lee and Ken and everyone else discuss and Charles Shen. Um, and then again, you put that in partnership with the co-location guiding principle and it, it paints a very clear picture. Thank you very much. Appreciate the consideration. Thanks, Ken. 
All right, that was the last hand we've got. So uh, a lot of good discussion, a lot of good stuff that we can uh, take back to the table and work on, so. Okay, uh, Jason, I think Jason Watts want to share some thoughts. No, no, he, uh, he'll be available as we move into the environmental. Ah, gotcha, thank, thank you. you. Hi, Jason. I am available. Hi, Greg. Um, but real quick, if I could double down on what you just said, I think it's very important before we get into the, the environmental guiding principle. And you have to read them as a package. And I think for, for me going forward as we go into the next steps after the task team, it's really important that each guiding principle be read in conjunction with all the other guiding principles because we're going to apply them all at the same time. You notice the guiding principles aren't in hier hierarchy. There's no, we're not saying the natural environment's better than farmland or conservation is better than um, broadband. We're going to read them all and we're going to give them all weight and we're going to try to come up with projects that satisfy all of them. So the more each of them can stay in their functional area, but at the same time being read with all of them in, in the conglomeration, I think that's very important. Um, if we start taking the same sentiment and put it in multiple guiding principles, then it almost, it, it's going to be difficult to determine whether that sentiment has more weight than other sentiments or whether the task team meant something different. So if we could just, if, um, I, as Greg suggested, and I agree with him, we have to remember that all of these are read together and um, we have to point out when they're read differently. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jason. All right, so uh, yeah, I think you've already got screwed up. Uh, all over it. We're gonna go next to uh, the natural environment guiding principle. Uh, as uh, Secretary Evans suggested that with the agriculture one that wraps up the discussion of all of our new ones. So what you'll be seeing now are, are revised based specifically on the discussions that we heard either at task force meeting six or in information that was submitted to the team or discussed with the team in between the meetings. Um, and this one, natural environment, uh, being the largest change, we thought we would take a big bite of the apple. Uh, so um, I am not going to read all of it because it is quite a bit, but I do want to uh, sort of touch on some of the points. Apologize if I can get my... All right. So what we did, as I mentioned, is we combined the other five guiding principles into one natural environment guiding principle. And the ambiguous language that was expressed in the prior uh, version, Task Force Meeting 6, has been, we've done our best to take it out in completely. Uh, there was also discussions about how it might tie back or coordinate with some of the other efforts that have been done through the task force process. Uh, so it simply states to begin with, avoid adverse impacts to these identified resources. And these are lists that you've seen before. You'll see the will not impact in the no new corridor through resources listed. Uh, it goes on to speak to avoid or minimize and mitigate the impacts of the following resources and to utilize these resources during the development, analysis, and comparative evaluation of the project alternatives, including the no-build. And then it lists uh, uh, another significant series of resources uh, that you all will most likely recognize to be the ones from the uh, task force request list. Um, we have combined all of the uh, instructions from what were discussed and prioritized and revised uh, from task force meeting number six. Uh, and one specific new um, instruction uh, in conversation with some of the agency partners, uh, so uh, Fish and Bar, Florida Wildlife, and um, the water management districts, talking about placing a high priority on the Florida Ecological Greenway Network and the high priority CLIP lands uh, was added as an instruction. So there's a lot to unpack on this. Um, I'm fair certain. I know that a lot of you have, have reviewed these ahead of time. Uh, got some notes here from what you have sent in. Um, would like to open the conversation just by going to our, because these, these, this principle speaks to the natural environment and our water resources, uh, to our task force experts uh, in that area. Um, so I think we'll go first, if it's okay, with uh, uh, Ashley Stefanik from the Water Management District. All right, so um, my comment in here is um, mostly just to make sure that it fits within permitting guidelines um, and uh, to be able to uh, improve water quality and uh, stormwater capacity wherever possible. Okay. 
And I think as I'm looking, you know, there, with the water resources instructions, it, it discusses, you know, working with local jurisdictions to ensure best BMPs and emergency technologies are utilized to enhance water quality within the corridor uh, and to identify and prioritize water resources for enhancements or avoidance. Um, does that seem adequate for as, as you reviewed it through that lens? <laughs> Yes, I think so. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Um, Michelle, you're also from the Water Management District. Michelle Hopkins, um, I want to ask and see if you had any thoughts or comments. Hi, yes. Um, some of the comments I had, I wanted to make sure that we're um, placing emphasis on avoidance um, before um, enhancing. And I, I think some of the terminology had it in the reverse order on some of the draft instructions. Um, and that, you know, that's always critical and, and really looking at true um, and in-depth alternatives analysis on avoidance. Um, and then, you know, from there moving to minimization of impacts and um, providing mitigation or enhancement where needed. So I think that we need to make sure we've got that emphasis and order correct. Um, on the local jurisdictions, I, I wanted to make sure that, I don't know if that's defined somewhere to make sure that that includes the um, water management districts and, and state agencies. I, I'm assuming you mean that any agency with, with jurisdiction within an area um, that you would utilize those best management practices. Um, there are technologies and, and, you know, I like the reference to emerging technologies, but there are ways to minimize um, to avoid impacts and then minimize um, wherever possible. Just uh, so I do like that emphasis on that part of it. Um, do we have? Well, I guess we kind of spoke to, you know, it's important to consider um, co location or shared resource options, um, which I, you know, we've talked about is the co location is covered under the other guiding principle. I don't know if. Looking for opportunities for shared resources um, with the local, um, you know, communities. I guess it might be there might be some value in that. And um, let's say, let's see, get through my notes. I think I think that's really the primary part. I think we've really done a good job of combining it and capturing what those priorities are and you know, the um, no impact areas um, and establishing those priorities. So I'm, I'm comfortable with this. Michelle, I just wanted to ask for clarification, your discussion about, you know, like consider opportunities for shared resources. Is that where you're talking, thinking like partnered solutions for like, you know, stormwater treatment and that sort of stuff? Is that is that where you were yes. targeting that? Um, okay. Yeah, shared uh, partnering on, on some of those and and you know if there are other improvements that are going to happen in the area if you could you know look at those opportunities to um just have a region using regional systems um that would address some of their quantity and quality and have the potential to reduce um, the overall size and impact of facilities that makes sense okay thank you yeah and that's uh, it Okay, thank you, Michelle. Do we have hands up? Uh, yes, we do. Um, so we're going to go to Thomas Hawkins with Thousand Friends of Florida. Thomas? Can, can y'all hear me? Am I unmuted yet? <laughs> you're, yeah, yeah, you're back. Here now. we go. I said trouble last time. I, I didn't know. Um, I, 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 going into the last task force meeting, we had the range of, the range of verbs that were associated with each of the lists of um, environmental resources were much broader than just avoid. We were looking at protection, restoring, and enhancing. And I think that that broader range of, of words matches much better the uh, legislator, legislation's direction, um, which identifies as two of the uh, uh, purposes of the MCORS legislation are uh, uh, related to environmental conservation. One of them is protection or enhancement of wildlife corridors or environmentally sensitive areas. And the other one is protection or enhancement of primary springs, protection zones, and farmland preservation areas designated within local comprehensive plans. Um, 
And so both of those talk about the significance of conservation in the MCORS program, not as mitigation uh, for any construction that happens for MCORS uh, facilities, but as their, uh, in their own right. And so we really, uh, I think we need to do a lot of work on these to identify exactly, um, uh, to, to provide a standard for what the land conservation and resource conservation we're doing through MCORS um, uh, independent of uh, any actions related to avoidance. Right. Thank you. It's a very good observation. Jason, I uh, see that Jason Watts is, would like to Hi. comment on this. Sure, you're going to see me jump in a, a bit here. Thomas, thank you for that. That That's really helpful. Um, I think the point is, and it, I think it goes a lot to um, kind of the list that was um, sent in by the task force, which is the second slide down. Um, and we say we're going to avoid, minimize, and mitigate, but I think what we really mean, and we need to work on this language, is we're going to avoid if all possible. I think when we go through PD&E and we do an environmental review, that is always our first choice, is to avoid any impact at all. Um, if we cannot avoid, then the second thing really should be we look to how we can enhance. We utilize the statute as it's written. We have a lot of great tools in the new statute, and we utilize those tools to enhance the area. Um, I think what keeps coming up in my mind is if we are co-locating a road, we have a lot of opportunities to enhance the existing facility and build a new facility that's going to be good for the environment. So to me, it's avoid first, enhance second if possible, um, and then we, we talk about minimize and mitigate just like we would normally. Um, so I, I agree with your principle. I think we'll look to finding how to fit the, the um, terms enhancement in there and make sure it's in a, a correct priority order, avoid first, enhance second if we, if we have to. Um, I think that'll go a long way to, to satisfying that, that request. I, I want to follow up, Jason. Um, I, I, I appreciate what you said, but I, I, I don't want the point to be missed that under the legislation, conservation not related to corridor construction is its own prerogative. What is our standard for environmental conservation? Throughout this entire process, identifying the regional environmental needs in the study area, it's been my understanding that consistent with the legislative direction, we were gonna set a standard for what our conservation goals were through MCORS. Not related to uh, construction activities, but as their own prerogative. And I, 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 did not, I did not see that change in focus until reviewing the backup for this meeting. I understand your comment, um, and and I, I think there is um, we we'll have to have some discussions on whether or not there is conservation for conservation's sake as a as a tenant uh, outside of the um, construction of an MCOR facility. Um, yeah, if if it's not if it's not your understanding or the department's understanding, it, I mean that that's that's a massive gulf in understanding what the statute says. And um, we've been talking about this for a long time, and this is the first time that I've noted that there wasn't a meeting of the minds there. I mean, I, it, I mean, I, I, I we, we've been talking about this a lot, and I, 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 I maybe my eyes have been closed, but in, in every single meeting, I thought we were talking about uh, identifying resources for conservation because the statute explicitly tells us to, not related to um, avoidance minimization. Jason, and I, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I think this is also another moment where if we look at the guiding principles as a set, right, and we talk about some of the actions that would occur from those other guiding principles, uh, it, it seems to me that both what you're saying now, Thomas, and what, what Jason was saying uh, in his response, those actions are implicit within the differing guiding principles. So when taken as a set, uh, like you said earlier, Jason, this this is an opportunity and environment to give priority to something that is specific to just this re, this guiding principle. But things like the co-location or the high level needs and stuff like that speak to, I think, some of the areas that you're discussing. And I, I mean, I'm just trying to interpret what I'm hearing the two sides here, but just a thought. 
No, and, and I, I, I'll say it this way because I don't necessarily think there, that Thomas and I are disagreeing. I just want to make sure that we uh, articulate it the same way. And I think we're going to have to look at the language. Thomas, I hear what you're saying. Um, to me, all of the actions under the MCOR program further the MCOR program. And I don't think any one of those actions, whether it's conservation or infrastructure creation or broadband or uh, wastewater, whatever, all of those different actions that were kind of listed in the um, statute, I think contribute to the overall MCORS program. And, and frankly, I don't think any of them can stand alone without the impact of the other ones, kind of what Greg just said. So let us take your thoughts back and see if we can work on that language and see if we can incorporate um, your idea a little better. Thanks, and I would be happy to speak, you know, further offline if that's appropriate. Um, but I, this this issue is a, a significant one, perhaps the most. Thanks. Well, Thomas, let me say one more thing to that because I want to make sure, um, regardless of how we end up on this specific topic, understand that as we go through the PD&E process, there's every intent that for any impact that we have caused by the actual infrastructure created, we plan on having a positive overall impact on the environment. And that's kind of the overarching goal from, from my shop and the department in general, is as we impact the, the surrounding environment, we end up leaving it in a better spot than we were before we put any infrastructure in. Um, how we go about doing that, there's lots of details there, but that's, that's kind of the overarching goal. We have other hands. Okay. Um, yes. Um, all right. So uh, Janet Bowman from Nature Conservancy. Janet, you had your hand raised. Uh, yes. Janet Bowman with the Nature Conservancy. I, I really would like to reiterate what Thomas uh, Hawkins just mentioned, and we sent that in as a comment in, in our cover letter. Uh, and you know, I'll point out in in the MCOR statute, um, in the case of Suncoast and Northern Turnpike. Um, there's specific reference to evaluating the need for acquisition and conservation land, um, you know, that that has a positive impact on water quality and quantity of springs, rivers, and aquifer recharge areas, agricultural land uses, and wildlife habitat. And then in the case of the um, Southwest um, Central Connector, panthers particularly, panther um, protection is particularly called out. So, I mean, we view these, I mean, this is above and beyond whether it's, you know, covered as a guiding principle or not. I mean, it's it's a statutory requirement and, um, you know, it's it's something, you know, to, to give an example in the, the Wakaiva context, I mean, there were specific parcels of land that were identified to be purchased in the statute. Now, this obviously doesn't get to that, that level of detail, but it, it's that kind of, of intent that you know this is above and beyond what you would normally do um, to to in the in the terms of mitigation. Um, so I'd, I'd like to you know emphasize Thomas's comment. And then the other thing is I um, submitted uh, some specific language on including on the list of avoidance items um, conservation easements that are held by uh, land trusts, um, you know, which would we hold um, important conservation easements in the Red Hill region as does tall timbers and other land trusts and those should be um, considered as, on the list as well. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Let me say one more thing real quick, if I could, Greg. Um, and and I, I don't want to give the impression that we think only, only the only conservation land we can purchase is in accordance with mitigation needs. That's not what I'm saying at all. I understand that we can go out according to the statute and encouraged by the statute to purchase and maintain other conservation lands as part of the corridor development. And we're all for that. Um, so Thomas, maybe that's where we're, we're not meeting uh, the minds, um, but we understand that we can do that as part of corridor development. We're going to encourage it. We're going to look for all methods to partner with the various agencies that have those conservation lands and, and see what we can do to help. Um, that is a goal of the department and I think that's a goal of, of the guiding principle. Okay. Um, Charles Lee with uh, Florida uh, Audubon, Florida. Charles? Yeah, the first thing I'd like to do is to uh, 
thank you and uh, express uh, congratulations for what I think is the best organization and consolidation of these topics and the guiding principles of any of the three task forces. And I spent some time yesterday recommending to the Turnpike uh, task force that they consider looking at the way this is organized and uh, recasting theirs in the same uh, model. Um, the second thing I'd like to say is that uh, the concerns I have uh, in the uh, instructions language uh, are related to the avoidance first and then uh, the uh, minimization and then uh, mitigation or replacement. Um, the language, for example, in wildlife habitats uh, says continue to identify and prioritize uh, wildlife areas for enhancement or avoidance. It, it suggests that avoidance even trails behind enhancement. So I, I really do recommend that we uniformly use the hierarchy of the duty. The instructions are first avoid, then if you cannot not avoid, uh, A, B, and C. Um, and I hope you will do that in all of these in all of these categories. The second point I wanted to make is also about conservation lands. I too am troubled by the fact that uh, while the statute appears to fairly crisply suggest that part of the duties of DOT in uh, constructing the MCORS projects uh, is going to be to acquire environmental lands, there is nothing uh, that uh, approaches that level of uh, clarity in our recommendations, uh, either in the guiding principles or instructions, I think there should be. And uh, while I haven't sent the words to you at this point, I'll try to do it in the near future, but I think there needs to be another bullet point occurring below the one that today reads with the word leverage. And uh, I believe that that bullet point should indicate that uh, there should be the development of a land acquisition plan uh, that would be that would be a product of DOT working with uh, the DEP Division of State Lands and the Water Management Districts, each of which have land acquisition authority as well as land acquisition project lists, and that um, the outcome uh, should be similar to what the outcome in Wakaiba was, uh, and uh, Janet touched on that a moment ago, but there were actually four parcels of land uh, that were identified not only on the Florida Forever list, but even more explicitly in the statute. Uh, the outcome was that uh, as a result of the project, three of the four are now public conservation lands. Uh, the fourth one, unfortunately, uh, escaped uh, the grasp of uh, the state because the owner, as they were entitled to do, uh, decided they didn't want to be a willing seller. And because the right of way was not going through that property, it uh, could not be uh, taken with eminent domain. And so, uh, but three out of four ain't bad. And if you look at the, um, if you look at the referenced items uh, in, in terms of Florida forever, uh, uh, targeted lands in your guiding principles, um, and you look at the targeted lands and the water management district acquisition lists, uh, there's a lot to work with there. And um, my final point is uh, I'm, I continue to be a little bit uh, concerned about the language of the bullet point that begins with the, le with the uh, word leverage. Um, because it is less than definite about what the financial uh, the financial contribution of DOT will be. Uh, I think the statute uh, suggests very strongly that DOT should be putting skin in the game with regard to dollars on the table to buy environmental lands. And I think this should uh, say that. I realize those dollars are not unlimited, but I think there are strategic opportunities uh, to potentially combine needed Florida Forever land acquisitions with mitigation and offset needs. Uh, we saw that, for example, in the Suncoast uh, 2 project in Suncoast 2, 
Uh, there were uh, about 10 acres for every one impacted. Uh, the impacted acres were in Withlacoochee State Forest. And at the end of the day, about 10 acres for every one of those acres uh, ended up being uh, acquired uh, through uh, DOT acquisitions, uh, first with regard to the acreage of real property affected, and second with regard to mitigation needs associated with the federal permits and the review given the project by the Fish and Wildlife Service. It worked out very well. And so if we follow that same approach here by developing a land acquisition plan, which is the wording I specifically asked be inserted in the instructions, I think we can get there. Let me um let me offer a couple of points, Charles. I I, I agree with uh, with a lot of what you said. Uh, let's start with the beginning part where you talked about um invoi avoiding followed by enhancement followed by mitigation and um, minimization. I think that's that's a very good idea. We'll look at how we can incorporate that in the language. I think that's a solid thing. I think for the group, it's worth talking about conservation kind of in two buckets. The first bucket and is what where you ended on, Charles, is um, when we have a direct impact to land and we go through a, a take of that land and then we have to offset the take with other purchases. Um, we do that on regular projects. We do that. We did that on Wakaiva. We do that all the time. Um, and we work out what that take um, is and what the offset needs to be with the landowner or the responsible party. Uh, we have no intention of not doing that on this project. I think that's great. The other bucket, though, and I think this is what Thomas was talking about, and as I, I read this again after the discussion, um, the other bucket is the statute does uh, encourage the department and embolden the department to talk about conservation just in a general sense as part of corridor development. Um, I think that was the goal of the second bullet under conservation lands. I know you don't love the word leverage, Charles, but it's basically use the statute to deal with the um, parties in order to see where we can help and help, I think, mint funds, but we can we can make sure and we can offer clarity in that to identify and preserve additional land. Um, so all very good points. I think we're gonna take those back and look at it and see if we can kind of incorporate that with a little bit more specificity and see if we can um, come back with some better language. Well, let me just suggest that if you would add to that another bullet that would say that DOT is gonna collaborate with the land acquisition agencies to come up with a land acquisition plan. And uh, the help that DOT can give is twofold. The first is money, because most of those projects that are already identified with willing sellers are sitting there not acquired because there has not been enough money to put them in the Florida Forever Work Plan yet. The second thing that DOT can help with and which it did help with splendidly over in the, as it did the expressway authority, uh, over in uh, the Wakaiva, is that your acquisition machine, uh, which frankly, uh, with, with all due apologies to uh, uh, my friends at the water management districts and DEP, you guys buy land a lot more efficiently and a lot more effectively than the environmental agencies do. And so if, if those, if, if, DOT uh, can provide essentially right-of-way assistance, adding some DOT funds to the pot, uh, making those DOT funds uh, potentially match monies that may be available from uh, the uh, other land acquisition funds, uh, we can really get something going up here. And I think that the, uh, that the goal of it aspirationally uh, should be, we'll look at the lands that are in any way tangent to this corridor uh, within 10 miles, I think a think thousand friends has been recommending, look at the influences of this corridor extending 10 miles. I think that's probably a good baseline number. Uh, if it's within, within that kind of reach of the corridor, uh, then let's get it on an acquisition list and get it into a process where DOT can help with the money and can help actually with the mechanics of the acquisition. Thank, thank you, Charles. And I think that was the, the goal of the second bullet was to articulate that. Um, you, you articulated a different way. Uh, we'll take it back and see if we can offer some clarity or some, some further guidance um, without being overly prescriptive because the goal should be, we should be able to work 
some of this out during PD&E and during design where we can actually deal with the members and we know where the actual road's going. Um, but, but I hear you and, and we'll, take a, we'll take a harder look at it. Thanks. All right, uh, we've got a hand raised by Chris Stahl with Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So Chris. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of good points brought up. And so therefore, um, a couple of things that I had, I'm not gonna go back over them. Um, however though, a couple of things that have not been um, kind of discussed yet is like in the uh, in the revised language and the no new corridor through order forever acquired lands is mentioned but also there's also coral lands out there in preservation 2000 lands as well um that would be good to include those would be definitely one of them we need to we need to make sure and one of the big things that we're really um the, as a department and we're coordinating it and we're working with many groups around the state and all the and virtually every major base and there is and a lot of the small ones are B maps. And it was in the old stuff and um, some of the comments, you know, from meeting six, but it wasn't carried through. And that the B map process, I mean that's how we're starting to work on cleaning up the Indian River Lagoon. Um, you know, it's it's really for impaired water bodies and it's also for, to prevent um, water bodies from becoming impaired. And so we really, I mean, it's such a comprehensive, top to bottom, local, state, federal, um, I guess, effort to plan and to address it. And it goes right into the um to the best management practices on every on from industry from ag and all that i you know it really needs to be put put in in some way or form mentioned in the water resources section of the instructions for project development i don't think it's get you know it's such an overarching thing that, and it's going to be around for a long time it's not a kind of flash in the pan kind of planning thing that is going to go away anytime soon um, it's a good, it's a good program. Every, um, the, the local uh, communities like it, the state likes it, the feds like it. And so um, we're going to be using it for a long time in the future. So I think it deserves a good spot. Um, uh, whether you put it in the existing first bullet of water resources or you create an, it's only, it's standalone one. But I, I definitely think BMAPs need to get further through in the water resources section of this. Okay. Thank you for that comment, Chris. Chris, what was the, what was, you mentioned the Preservation 2000 lands. What was the Carl. first lands that you mentioned? Carl. Carl. Uh, conservation recru and recre recreational lands, Carl lands. Okay. okay. All right. Um, uh, Pagin Hanrahan, uh, representing the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, Pagin? Um, yes, and I, I think if we're going to kind of um, list out different um, programs, obviously there are um, a lot of different state programs, water management district programs. Um, I'm not sure if any of these local governments have active local programs. I'm not aware that they are, but what I was going to suggest is maybe in a few appropriate places using the term publicly owned conservation lands because that would sort of cover the gamut. I mean, Florida, to its credit, has had uh, public conservation programs, including in the agricultural space um, for many decades, going back to the 60s, I believe. Um, the other thing, just to reiterate something that Janet Bowman said, um, there are also privately owned conservation lands in some of these communities. I know that um, I'm on the board of, of a conservation trust, a Lachua Conservation Trust that does own property in several of these areas that is either owned fee simple or it's a voluntary conservation easement that someone has entered into. There are um, uh, 
databases of where there are private easements. I know I had a conversation pretty early on with um, with uh, somebody, it might have been Ryan or JW, but regardless, um, if y'all don't have access to those, I can get them um, and make sure that you have access to those databases. And it's not, I mean, I'm quite certain that if, if FDOT needed property under, um, under eminent domain, it could likely take even, you know, public or private conservation land. But obviously, I think the overarching intent of this is to um, avoid, as we've discussed, and to, you know, work cooperatively with communities and with um, all of the different public interests that public and private interests that exist within communities. And so um, I would think y'all would want to have that mapped uh, as best as you're able. I think that's all I have. Thank you. This is an excellent section. I echo the other comments that have been made. Thank you for your work on it. Thank you, Pekin. Yeah. Uh, representing uh, the Florida Chamber of yeah, Commerce. Jason, Jason, did you have any comments to, to that? No, I, I, I was just going to say those are all wonderful comments. I think if you look at the a no due to corridor list and the list on the next page about task force request. There's a lot of really big buckets like managed um, managed conservation area and then a, a bucket that's just called state owned lands. There's some pretty large buckets that a lot of the different uh, layers that have been mentioned would fall into. I think we can take that back though and make sure we're very clear about what we mean in those layers. Um, and I, I call them layers just because we use GIS tools all the time. But when we talk about those specific areas and make sure we're not missing any, but, but thank you for all the comments that are very helpful. All right, um, from the Florida Chamber of Commerce, uh, Christopher Manuel. Thank you. Okay. I, I echo the sentiments of a lot of the task force members that I think you all did a great job um, putting this one together. I think this is a much more natural place to have the conversation about um, keeping lands together and contiguous as opposed to in agriculture. Um, in my discussions with agricultural folks, sometimes they like their farmland altogether. Sometimes they're very worried about getting their products to a transportation system or interested in changing what they are growing. So um, this, this definitely hits, I think, the environmental impacts that all of us wanted to by protecting uh, large um, tracts of land here. One thing that I just kind of want to mention, um, it seems like we put a lot of principles in place for co-location, and I think that's great. I really, that's probably the, the way that we, this needs to be operated for the most part. And then we're talking a lot about land acquisition for environmental uh, impacts. And I just kind of wanted to throw it out there that they have to be kind of related, and I'm not too sure we'll be able to do much of the land conservation and purchasing if we're not building a new section of the road. So if we preclude one, I think we're gonna be precluding the other, if that makes sense. Jason, you wanna give that a shot? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things uh, wrapped into that. Um, clearly, and earlier I talked about two different buckets of conservation. Um, clearly, if we're building a greenfield road, we're going to have a lot more um, both um, desire and necessity to do conservation and to kind of make up for the the impacts of the greenfield. But that doesn't mean that if we co-locate um, that we also won't have similar um, abilities to do conservation. And I, I don't want anyone to get that idea because sometimes co-location, um, you end up having to buy some right away along the same corridor, you end up building more road beds, you end up having a, a fairly significant impact and we can look at having conservation. And as Thomas pointed out earlier, the statute does allow us to do conservation in the corridor um, in addition to what we normally may do for mitigation. So it, it's a very good point, um, but I don't want you to think that it, we're not going to also look at that. Um, another thought, just so everybody understands, for, for me and how all of these guiding principles will be used as instructions, goes back to the idea that when we talk about the environment, when, when we, the department, talk about it, we're not only talking about guiding principle number eight. The guiding principle number eight is very much the natural environment. Um, I always say we talk about the birds and bunnies and trees and water and air, but we also talk about people and communities. That's part of our environmental assessment and how we're gonna affect the people that both use the facility and the people that the facility goes 
um, through their neighborhoods or around their neighborhoods. Um, that's very important. So to us, a lot of these guiding principles are, are, quote, the environment. So if you hear me say the environment, I'm talking about it holistically, not just the, the natural environment, but also uh, the people in the communities at the same time. So thank you. Um, there's a lot of great discussion uh, about the uh, environmental guiding principle and the instructions that are there. There's also been a lot of consistent discussion saying that uh, a lot of people are very happy with the, the wording and the language that's been there. Um, we've we've kind of weaved in and out of comment and discussion that's specific to you know major concerns or comments as to the language, and some of it has gone back in, into you know just the ideation of discussing the natural environment and uh, linear roadway projects. So I think we have four more individuals that wanted to share something, but I would like to encourage everyone as they consider their comments moving forward. Um, mind you, we have seven more to go. Exactly. That if we could really try and keep them focused at this point towards uh, discussing, you know, changes either to language or additions, those sort of type of um, discussion. All right. Uh, representing Defenders of Wildlife, Kent Wimmer. Kent. Thank you very much. It's Kent Wimmer, Defenders of Wildlife. Um, I want to start with a compliment. I think staff has done a good job in combining these, more, making them more streamlined, making them more pointed. Also think you did a good job in um, looking across the task forces to pull out the best language, you know, the, the most protective language. And, and there are actually a few, a, a few um, elements from actually the north, the northern turnpike that I think that should be added here. And I've provided that to staff. But the, the two, two points I'll make is, um, I, I have strongly said and from the beginning that existing public and private conservation lands should not be impacted by these corridors. I mean, that's that's where we stand, that's that's where we are. And so I think that um, you know, all of our state parks and state forests are water management areas, wildlife management areas, conservation, rural and family lands, conservation. Those areas should be have a big a big red on them that you're not going to touch them, you know, with these uh, with these corridors. Um, second of all, I, I strongly support the other environmental colleagues about um, about creating a commitment to um, to offsetting um, impacts for, to resources and areas. You know, they're going to be compromised and destroyed by development of this corridor. So I, I do strongly recommend that DOT works a little harder and makes that commitment. As I said, um, there, are, there actually is some good language from uh, Northern Turnpike that I think that uh, we could add to here to make them consistent. And even though some other folks don't believe, you know, believe it. You know, we have this 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 study area overlaps two counties with the northern turnpike. We shouldn't have different guidelines in for 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 a single county or two different counties. You know, we, you shouldn't be operating on two different playbooks in trying to route these roads. So I recommend develop strong, consistent language for 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 both of those task forces, especially because they're considering the same geographic area for a portion of their study areas. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kent. And we had, yeah, we do have the, the language uh, that you submitted uh, from Northern Turnpike's instructions. All right, representing the Capital Region Transportation Planning Agency, Commissioner Kristen Dozier. Commissioner Dozier. All right, gentlemen, I hit the wrong button for my mute. Um, thank you. This is a great discussion. I will echo everyone else's comments that you all did a great job summarizing a lot of complicated issues. Um, I'm not going to dive back into this question of uh, the ability to purchase other conservation land, what the intent there is. I appreciate the conversation between Jason and Thomas and others, and I look forward to hearing more about that. Um, but I did have a couple of questions. And for starters, I'm going to go all the way back up to something that Ashley said. I agree that water management districts should absolutely be included. 
Um, and the question about stormwater ponds, and this this actually connects with something you all were saying about purchasing land if the existing quarter is used. Um, if that is the direction we go, there are flooding issues. There are um, a lot of different things that could be improved with that quarter, and that would require other land acquisition. Specifically for stormwater, though, um, I'm glad that we've got a note in here about emerging technologies. I think I and others brought that up in past meetings, but it says work with local jurisdictions to ensure best management practices and emerging technologies. It, this is something that actually does fit within FDOT's wheelhouse. If you are building a new road or expanding an existing, the stormwater ponds are going to come under your scope of work. So should this not just point to local jurisdictions, but also instructions for FDOT to include emerging technologies in stormwater quality and quantity? Commissioner Dozner, if, if I could if I could comment on that. Um, the department currently, as we go through the pd and &E process, um, looks at uh, wastewater treatment and how we're going to store our, our um, water in, in ponds and different things. Um, we're actually working currently right now internally about new guidance that's going to encourage exactly what you just said on all department projects, not just MCORs, but encourage earlier looks at wastewater treatment and how we can handle it and also look at all the emerging technologies. Um, if the task force wants to advise us to do it, I, you're, you're welcome to. We're, we're currently doing it and trying to be uh, at the forefront of those thoughts and make sure that we take a hard look at how to store water and how to treat water before it's released. Thank you, Jason. I I thought you were working on that. I mean, this is something that um, we talk about in Florida Association of Counties with water quality issues in our individual counties. Um, I just want to make sure whomever is working on the stormwater issue that we're looking at those new in emerging technologies. If it's something coming out of the department, that's great. If it's something coming out of locals and encouraging um, individual counties or cities to do it, that would be fine. I just wanna make sure we cover our bases because things are changing a good bit and we know a lot more than we used to, right? Uh, absolutely, and I think one of the reasons that that bullet is written that way is because a lot of the emerging technologies is co-use where, where multiple users will use the same pond. Uh, we do that a lot more now than we may have done in the past and we're encouraging the districts and the state to look to the local communities at how they can enter into agreements to, to make that more beneficial to everybody. So we're not using 10% of a pond where maybe we could use, allow other people to use it at the same time. Um, so we are exploring all of those avenues. Thank you. I celebrate that. And my impression was uh, FDOT and water management districts have been thinking about that. And I'm, I'm really glad you all are doing that. Um, one other question I had, it's somewhat related, it's certainly water quality. Um, Chris brought this up regarding BMAPs, and I could not agree more that BMAPs are a critical element. And I think that's actually a linkage between the question about utilities infrastructure and the natural environment and water quality. Um, for Leon and McCulloch counties, we have gotten into the BMAP process very early on. We have had a great working relationship, I, from my perspective, with the state and really appreciate FDEPs um, working with us locally. But this is, um, it's kind of taken us back to something that I picked up on, it may have been Thomas's comment, during the broadband utilities discussion that broadband is just essential. We just got to do that. But water quality is also essential. And in that sense, we're actually looking backwards and cleaning up a lot of past mistakes, whether it's from groundwater contamination or um, the springs or our drinking water, whatever that might be. So I would be an advocate for BMAPs coming back in and I don't know how to articulate this well for the principles and instructions, but I think there is a connection here for utilities if we can get more people off septics or into alternative wastewater treatment facilities. Is that 
Is that something we could dig into more within natural environments and the utility category? Yes, ma'am. I think, sorry. Right, I think we, we're going to take BMAPs back and look at it. Um, we look at them, we understand, we deal with the water management districts when it comes to uh, permitting of the projects. I, I think what I'm hearing both from FDEP and the, and the rest of the task force is let's figure out how to look at them earlier in the process so we can make some earlier decisions. So let us take back all that information and see where the best place for that is, whether it's here, whether it's in utilities, and uh, see if we can bring something back to you. Okay. Um, I appreciate that, and I'll just reiterate the last point, that moving people off septic tanks or improving those septic tanks and our wastewater treatment systems has a environmental benefit and a utilities and benefits. So I, I would like to see a little bit more understanding of how those things are connected. Um, otherwise, great discussion from everyone. Thank you very much. All right, we have a couple more people as we're kind of wrapping the natural environment up. Uh, so I'd like to go to Chris Wynn with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Chris? How many names you have? Yes. Yeah, let's get them and move on to the next one, please. Okay, Chris. Okay, sorry, I'll try to be brief, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a lot of great conversation here, obviously a lot of passion. Um, I'll try to streamline my thoughts. Again, thank you, DOT. You're doing a great job. Thanks for adding the CLIP uh, data sets. Um, and, and as Jason's mentioned, that'll, that'll obviously, um, you know, uh, be, be, be data sets are used down the road uh, should, should something move forward. Um, as far as um, stretch goals, uh, there's two things I wanted to kind of focus on real quick on the last two bullet points there under ecosystem connectivity. The first, um, while considering wildlife crossing linkages, I, I'd really like for us to, um, you know, do more than just consider wildlife crossings. Uh, kind of thinking back to some earlier conversation uh, around the Osceola River, uh, Charles Lee brought up the importance of wildlife crossings. And I think um, we, we can strengthen that language. I, I'd like to follow up by sending some suggested edits there, uh, things that, that maybe come out of the Wakaiwa report. Uh, and then lastly, um, another uh, there's another um, additional bullet point that um, refers to offering opportunities to view, understand, and access environmental uniqueness of this Big Bend uh, region. Um, I'd like to offer that up as, as a last bullet point here, um, you know, thinking about the importance of connecting the people, you know, with the environment um, as a stretch goal as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, last comment we've got is coming from uh, North Central Florida Regional Planning Council, Scott Coons. Mr. Coons? Yes, uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, we, we talked about this at uh, several meetings uh, over the past year, the importance of the natural resources of regional significance as identified in the strategic regional policy plans of the regional planning councils that cover the study area. And I did not see that in the column under avoid or minimize or mitigate impacts to resources. Okay. Okay. We'll look to add that in there. Uh, 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 yes, thank you. All right, thank you. I think that yeah, it's, it's just a bullet for that. Good point, okay. All right, any, I think that's what we said that was gonna be the last comment on natural. Um, we're scheduled to go on break at 3.15. So uh, let's, talking about stretch goals, let's, uh, let's try and get through one more guiding principle uh, before then. And like we did for the lunch break, um, you know, if it, if it turns out that that's not the case, then we can just take a break and we'll come back and uh, pick back up. Uh, so Alicia, if you can take us up to the consistency with local plans. As I try and meet you there on my screen. All right, so this was the, actually the first one that we discussed uh, at Task Force Meeting 6. Uh, a lot of discussion about, again, you know, what was thought to be on specific language um, and generally named plans as opposed to specifically called out plans. Uh, and so the majority of the revisions that you have seen here uh, is, is addressing that exactly. Uh, and so the guiding principle and the intent of it remains very similar to what you saw previously. 
Uh, however, you'll see that the, the plans themselves are specifically named. And then more importantly, in the instructions, uh, there's been a great deal of detail added in there to try and uh, provide that more specific language. Um, so with that being the case, uh, I think we just want to open that one up. We did have some people if we want to talk to them, but uh, if we have hands raised. Okay, uh, Charles, Charles Lee, Audubon Society. Yeah, w with regard to the guiding principle language, we had a discussion over very similar language yesterday in the uh, Turnpike Extension Task Force. The concern that I've got is the organization um, and it uh, in the listing of specific things, it places the Florida Transportation Plan first. Uh, I think that uh, it ought to be reversed. So we're talking about first the adopted local government comprehensive plans, then the strategic policy plans of the uh, of the regional planning councils, and finally the Florida Transportation Plan. Uh, okay, we can I think reorganize that, those. Yeah, I think that I think that uh, hierarchy that gives a, a bit of a greater emphasis on the local government adopted plans that have gone through the process is uh, is appropriate. Uh, that's right. uh, essentially the input I have to give on this. I think it's pretty well done otherwise. That's a that's a pretty easy uh, change to, but thank you. Yeah, we can definitely reorganize those. All right, uh, James Stansberry representing the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. James, thank you. Can you tell me what is the difference between between be consistent with under the draft guiding principle and under the second bullet respect? Why why aren't those the same? Uh, we could say be consistent with them both. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wait. <laughs> uh, Thomas Hawkins. We get there. Can, can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I just wanted to um, give a comment uh, that um, it, with any interchanges that are built um, are going to have impacts on adjacent land uses. And it would be appropriate as part of this process to develop model language that local governments might adopt in order to address some of the unique needs that come with new uh, interchange development. Um, and I'm kind of thinking that, um, yeah, these would be model policies that, uh, that, that uh, Planners at FDOT, maybe in conjunction with a, a DEO, could develop. Um, but the kinds of issues they would address would be um, uh, maintaining traffic safety, especially for vulnerable road users uh, who might be near a corridor, um, access between and surrounding adjacent developments uh, while minimizing a curb cuts and driveway access on arterials, um, reservation of land. Um, that's accessible from interchanges for those industrial or manufacturing uses um, that are that are desirable. There, there are the economic uh, economically productive land uses that we're thinking about as part of this process, um, and then also uh, ensuring that uh, policies are in place to uh, prevent suburban sprawl or urban sprawl. Um, but it would specifically address the tendency to have sprawl development patterns around new exchanges. And, it, and I, I summarized those comments in writing and forwarded them to uh, Weiwei Shen and John Kaliski uh, uh, with their sort of a more, more well thought out of what I just described orally. Yeah, John called and, and, and shared uh, that they had that language from you as well. So yeah, we'll definitely look for that and see, um, see how we can uh, consider its application here or, or you know, possibly at the where we talk about interchanges with the co-location, the use of existing facilities, kind of principle. But thank you, Great. yeah. Fantastic. Charles Lee, uh, your hand's up. I'm not for sure if it was up from previous or if you had another addition to this. Uh, no, that was uh, it was just left up. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, the bad, thing about, fall asleep, man. the bad thing no about blood. virtual hands is that they don't get tired. <laughs> don't get tired. You know, so uh, it's hard to remember that. 
Um, all right. So, any other uh, any other comments in regards to this guiding principle and draft instructions for the consistency with the local plans and statewide? I mean, local, regional, and statewide plans. Going once, going twice. I mean, job. we we did really good. It's three oh six. Do we do jump we, to the we next one? Do we venture to do, we do another one in five lunch? minutes? If we do this one in six minutes, we're still early for the break. The next one makes me nervous. Uh, <laughs> can we go to technology? Do something. Uh, it's, I don't know. We, we think we think. Time. All right, so let's go to technology <laughs> and uh, try and hedge our bets instead of going to the the maximized use of existing facilities. All right, so uh, technology. Alicia is always is ahead of us. Good job, Alicia. Um, all right, so uh, honestly, there was very little comment from the task force on this between last meeting and this. Um, we uh, received a comment uh, about including instructions to provide EV infrastructure uh, and have tried to do that. Um, and I do know that Kent, you had shared uh, some uh, instruction language uh, on this as well, um, but that's really the only comments that we had received in between. Um, so, uh, if there are any comments on that, or Kent, if you wanted to, I guess, open and share with, uh, because I know you had some language for the draft instructions, we could do that first and then go to the hands. Yeah. Kent, let us unmute you. And if you want to. Sorry, I got ahead of Mandy. I'm sorry, Mandy. There. there we go. All right. Okay. There you go, Kent. You can unmute yourself now. Hello, this is Kent Wimmer, Defenders Wildlife. Um, Having the pleasure of serving on multiple task forces, um, I thought the, uh, the Northern Turnpike had heard some really good language, and they said, but you know, very clear to the point, plan for and provide infrastructure for electric vehicle charging stations. And so I just wanted to um, add that, um, offer that up as an instruction. Sorry for the phone. Great. Um, Charles Lee with Audubon, Florida. Charles? Yes. Um, I believe that there ought to be consideration of a, another bullet point to be inserted here that uh, goes back to some of the discussion we had early on when we had a fairly um, robust panel of subject matter experts. And the topic for the instruction is to develop capabilities within the electronic tolling system that allows for the differentiation between local traffic and uh, traffic that is actually traversing what is built as if it were a toll road. Um, this is intended to avoid the situation that occurred, unfortunately, before this technology was present, back when the Wakaiva Parkway was being uh, designed. And there, in order to deal with local traffic and to deal with toll traffic in the same envelope, it was necessary to build segregated lanes. And the result was somewhere north of $300 million in additional construction expense. Um, now that uh, we've got more sophisticated technology um, and the ability to use either the transponder system or the license plate driven toll by plate system, uh, to uh, create algorithms, it would be very easy uh, to avoid the necessity to put down all that concrete and take up that space and perhaps in a co-location situation impact businesses with lanes that were made wide so you could have both local and tolled lanes. Uh, no need to do that if it can be done electronically. And we ought to have a bullet point here uh, in the instructions that moves in that direction. Agreed. Yeah, that was a point you're right. That was brought up in prior meetings uh, and should have been captured here. Uh, Florida Trucking Association, Ken Armstrong. Ken? You're self muted, Ken. Charles's comment about uh, tolling technologies perhaps should be extended even further to the, to the matter of. Um, variable pricing and variable pricing can be the season of the year, time of day, uh, whatever variables we decided that we wanted to utilize. Um, there, there are 
are different times of day that one would rather pull traffic over here. Uh, there might be variable pricing by time of day for for freight, where you want to get uh, get more trucks onto these roads, and so you lower the prices there. Uh, and and Charles is exactly right that technology of tolling and pricing now enables some of that stuff, and it's certainly all in this technology world. Yeah, thank you. That's a good addition. To, like you said, to, to help flush that bullet with variable pricing and innovative technologies. Mandy, Greg, any other hands? Chairman, I think we're ready to go to our first or our afternoon break. I think our afternoon break, it says 15 minutes. Uh, what do y'all think about that? That's good, 15. Be back at uh, 3.30. And we have how many more to go? Five? Sounds right. All right, we got, we'll have one hour. I believe we can do it, man. See y'all at 3.30. Uh -huh. All right, Greg, let's uh, keep us going. We've got five more to go and we've got uh, 60 minutes. Sounds before good. we move on to the next section of the agenda. So, so we, got, we got 12 minutes per. per <laughs> good math. That's it. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're back. We'll wait for uh, Alicia's screen. There it is. Um, hope everybody had a good break. Um, we're going to go into the next guiding principle, which is discussing maximizing the use of existing facilities. Um, this was another guiding principle where the feedback at the last meeting was to remove some of the ambiguous language um, to more specifically state the prioritization. So putting in this priority order. Um, and so, that's been the changes uh, for the most part on this. Um, I'm not don't have an individual to go to right away uh, to ask questions. I do know that I had some feedback from a couple individuals during our briefings. Uh, so, Ken, Ken Armstrong with Florida Trucking Association, you've got your hand up. I don't know if it's from the previous discussion or if it's something related to this guiding principle. I actually put my hand just before we we went on this guiding principle. Going back to the technology discussion, that through the use of technology and the guiding principle that has to do with safety, we might be able to um, ask our PDME people to build what we would plan on as the safest road in America. And to use technologies and variable pricing and whatever tools exist to uh, make this a test bed for safety practices on vehicles, on parking, on, on, uh, on technology. I don't know exactly what all the ingredients are. You people at FBOT would be way far ahead of me on that. But it would be really interesting to lay out the challenge and for us as a state to be able to work on creating the safest road in America. Sort of uh, would be a fun thing to think about as it overlaps technology and safety and perhaps a few of the other guiding principles. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. It should be a heck of a reach goal. Okay. Um, so yeah, on the, uh, as we're calling it, the co-location guiding principle. Any other hands? No. Time? Unless you want to just comment about any specific changes before we move on. See if it's no, uh, you know, when we, when we chatted with Thomas about this, he had mentioned the, the interchange discussion, but he brought that up uh, during the land use uh, discussion, so. Charles Lee with Audubon, Florida, you did put up your hand, Charles? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think we're, I'm pretty good with this just the way it is. Uh, the only uh, addition I would suggest in the uh, draft instructions uh, would be that co-locating with road right-of-ways is not necessarily the only co-location. Uh, it could be that major power lines are also an opportunity. That's certainly the case in the turnpike extension. Um, with regard to road right-of-ways, I continue to have discomfort that 
the size of the road right of way to be considered for co-location is undefined. And um, certainly the, uh, you know, the entire US 19 corridor is the kind of corridor that would be appropriate for co-location. However, uh, throughout this study area, there are a lot of existing roads, including some that were identified with the colored arrows coming down from I-10 this morning, that if you actually went out there and drove them today, would be a very small width of pavement, pavement a very remote country road. Uh, in some cases, when we looked at those in the turnpike, uh, we actually were looking at canopied roads. And so I think that the type of road right of way to be co-located with needs to be better defined. And I would suggest that a general standard be applied and that the standard be uh, that you're looking at uh, at least a 200 foot uh, four lane right of way. And uh, I think that anything less than that is, is, might still be considered, but you really got to consider it as a greenfield opportunity that just happens to be adjacent to an existing road. It's, it's not a legitimate co-location because the width of the intrusion, if you will, whether it's through agricultural lands or whether it's through natural areas is not large enough that it uh, would justify considering this for uh, co-location. Thank you, Charles. Okay. Kent Wimmer, Defenders of Wildlife, Kent. Kent says it yourself muted. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Kent Wimmer, Defenders of Wildlife. I will, um, I made a comment earlier today about considering alternatives other than US 19. I guess my question is, will staff consider or will will the pd and e process consider alternatives other than us 1998 in this in their evaluations and then i have I'd a like, follow up uh, i'd like for jason watts to chime in on this on uh the suggestion by um charles that would that be overly restrictive for our pd and e process I think you have to understand how the pd &E process, and Greg, thank you for that. I think you have to understand how the pd &E process works typically when it comes to projects. Um, we are going to take our pd &E manual, and we're going to take the guiding guiding principles and the instructions from the task team and meld them together, and that's going to be the instructions for pd &E. um, When we're going through an alternative analysis in pd &E, we look at all, and I'm going to say realistic alternatives. Um, some alternatives will fall off right off the bat because they're not realistic. We're not going to build a floating highway. You know, we don't look at that, but we do look at all of the different alternatives. Through the process, many of those alternatives fall out because they are um, against the purpose and need of the project, or let's say they're against the guiding principle. So as we go forward, you may see PD&E say, here's the 12 alternatives we're looking at. And, and when we say that, you may immediately say, well, that's against the guiding principle. It's just because we haven't removed it. We have an obligation to look at them all and then explain why each of them fall out. Um, so uh, to, to your question, Kent, I think they, they may still show up on a we, we examined them um, uh, document and, and then an explanation that they fell out because of uh, a guiding principle or another um, methodology, either they didn't meet the purpose and need or they were just impossible to build or, you know, lots of different reasons that alternatives fall out. Would, would one of those reasons an alternative fall out because an alternative is not solely captured within, a, within the study area? I, I think when you look at the MCOR program, the MCOR program is limited to the study area and counties and the projects will be contained in those counties at, at this point. I'm not saying that doesn't change, but that would be my reading right now. Well, you know, I, I, I recommend that you consider US 129, alternative 27, and US 41 as an alternative to US 19. I know it's outside the area, but it goes north and south, hits, hits 
you know, hits I-75, hits I-75 in Georgia, but um, no, actually hits I-75 in Florida, but it is still relieves all that pressure on I-75 that you've been seeking to to resolve ever since you had the I-75 Relief Task Force, which I believe is is a serious um, constraint that multiple task forces are trying to evolve and get traffic off of I-75. Thank you very much. You folks still there? I lost audio. Hold on, everybody. We're just trying to get work through some technical issues in Lake City. Testing. Can y'all hear us now, Will? You were back online. Okay, good, good. Um, Will, Will, I'm glad if you could hang on there for a second because I, I did want to to bring some clarification. I know that Kent had mentioned uh, earlier, and he kind of referenced, made a reference to it then, that of of the fact that the the bill language mentioned something about connecting to Georgia. I. I don't believe that that language, I don't think that Georgia is actually referenced in there. Um, and, and, and so I don't know if that's accurate. I just wanted to, to, to find out if I'm the only person who, who, who might have missed something, but I don't believe that in the legislation it actually says, it just says, uh, you know, to, from Citrus County to Jefferson County, and we have shown the, the termini locations, but I don't believe there's any call out for the Suncoast Corridor to go to, to Georgia. Can't hear well. Garbage. Oh well, we can't hear you. 
Will, we can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, the bill is uh, explicit between um, Jefferson and Citrus County and the study area that's within that. I think I-75 relief is certainly a key key component. So Kent brings up some good points um, that you know we do need to try to relieve I-75 traffic. Um, and I think uh, we've certainly got a master plan that involves some widening of 75, but at some point that'll that'll reach its limit as well as far as capacity. So it just further it further uh, perpetuates the need to, to to put some long term planning in parallel corridors. Okay. All right. We apologize about the technical uh, issues we had with the sound. Um, we're trying to trying to. Uh, rearrange ourselves a little bit uh, so we can hopefully everybody can can hear us um, so anyway we are back with uh, trying to wrap up the maximizing use of existing facilities um, were there any other any other comments uh, before we move on from this guiding principle we 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 did Todd Gray. Commissioner, Commissioner Todd Gray from Gilchrist County, I know at one time you might have had your hand raised. Did you still have a, a comment or a question? Give us just a second to un unmute you. Okay, Commissioner Gray? Yes, uh, just, just a quick comment, and uh, again, with all due respect to my fellow task force member, we uh, you know, Gilchrist, and I've mentioned this before, but I just want to I feel like I got to protect my constituents and our residents of our county. And, uh, you know, a, a route of 129 would just devastate our little country towns of Trenton and Bell. It is the main thoroughfare through town now, but it put a interstate through this. It would divide our county in half, and it would just be, uh, uh, in my opinion, a bad choice. But that does not mean if it doesn't go on 19, there's not a, another route that would work. But 129 would be very bad for our little county. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Kristen Dozier, representing Capital Region Transportation Planning Agency. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, sir. Just a quick comment. I um I appreciate how you've summarized our past discussion for this prince for this guiding principle. I think it captures a lot of good um, information. As you all have said repeatedly throughout the day, um, you're looking at the guiding principles as a whole. Um, I think the term holistically has been used to reference the document and it still raises a question for me, particularly with this principle, we have a priority order referenced, um, existing facilities might run into conflict with those guiding principles that reference what to do about an interchange or that speak more to a toll road, a new road. Um, which really has underlined this entire discussion, this kind of tension. And um, I made a note on this one, wondering if it was going to have priority over any of the other principles. It's referenced in relation to all purposes, all high level needs. But I just, I felt like I needed to say this here at the end that y'all are doing a great job bringing all this information together, and yet I still see a tension between looking at this document holistically and some of these like existing facilities, which seems like it should take priority based on the conversation. So that may just be an editorial comment, but if y'all have any um, reflection on that, I'd love to hear it. Thanks. Jason, I mean, I think this is one that you or I could take, um, but if you wanted to have a first go with that, um, be happy to defer. Sure, thanks, Greg. Um, it's a really good comment, and, and I'll just describe the PD&E phase because I think um, through that description, you'll see how these guiding principles are going to uh, affect PD&E. Um, basically, PD&E always, and I'll say the department has some of the best PD&E practitioners in the world. We do a, we they do a wonderful job when it comes to analyzing projects. Um, it's a lot of give and take. It's a lot of um, numerous different um, things that we have to analyze and you're kind of doing a balancing act. That's how I look at the guiding principles. They'll all be given even weight. So for this one, we will make every effort to satisfy all the other guiding principles with a co-located facility. 
if we can't co-locate um, either because of the purpose and need or because of it's impossible to satisfy the other guiding principles, we'll look at something different. Um, and we're going to try to read them all together. And that's why we talked really a lot about, you know, reading them uh, holistically because we're going to try to satisfy them all. And, and when you can't, and there will be situations where you can't, we'll start looking at how do we, how do we satisfy most of them and do the best we can with the ones we can't satisfy. Um, and I think throughout that process, that's how you end up with the best project. Is, is it, is it going to have no impacts? That's probably not true. Is it going to have as, as little impact as we can? Yes. And our goal always, especially with MCORs, is to leave the area in a better um, position than it was when we touched it. So um, even if we have to have impact and we can't co-locate, our goal is to walk away either through conservation or um, other uh, mitigation efforts to leave it in a better spot than we were before. Greg? Thank you. Yeah, very well said. Hmm. Gentlemen, All right, there's... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Greg, just one quick comment on that. Um, just, I, I really uh, appreciate that, and I do understand the pd e process, um, I guess, as well as any uh, informed novice. I'm not in, an engineer. I'm not in your shoes, but I've worked in construction development for a long time before and after I was on the commission. We deal with these things all the time. Um, so I, even in the way you just described that, try to satisfy this principle by looking at, you know, or all the other principles by looking at existing facilities. It is exactly what happens, what takes priority if and when they're in conflict. And I see some language in the principles developing that may indicate points of conflict in the future. We don't have to unpack this today, but I think it's something we should look at as we get to the final report. If there are any of those areas that pose a conflict and if there's any further clarification on the instructions that we as a task force want to include, um, since we are looking at this document holistically. So I get the process, I do, I just want to make sure we're dotting our I's and co crossing our T's so we're giving proper instructions if we think one principle should take priority over others. That's my point here. So thank you again. Are there any other comments on this guiding principle? Thank you, Kristen. All right, the next guiding principle we will discuss is uh, resilience. Um, again, uh, there was uh, some discussion about the ambiguity of the language that was in there previously. Uh, and then there was some specific uh, received comments about just adding two instructions. Uh, we did both. Um, and so uh, the revised one added two additional, it actually removed the instruction that was there previously and added two more that I thought were, that, that seemed to be more specific. Um, so as we've done before, uh, if there was anyone, uh, you know, Janet, this was one that you had spoke to uh, last time quite a bit. Um, so if you wanted to comment on this, uh, otherwise we can open up the task force as well. You're self-muted, Janet. I appreciate the changes you made in response to my comments. Um, uh, one thing I, I just noticed that it's come up and I guess some of the other task forces is, and I've just raised this as a question, the uh, avoiding category one to three storm surge zones, um, you know, certainly in the Big Bend nature coast area, it's very vulnerable. And given the increased intensity of storms that seems to be happening, you know, um, I just, throw out there, or maybe we need to also look at, at uh, four and five. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Janet. We can look to add that to the second bullet. Um, Kent, I also know that you had submitted some uh, draft additional uh, instruction language for consideration. If you wanted to share that. Get yourself muted. Ah, thank you very much. Yeah, I I I agree with uh, Janet. Um, 
you know, with the increasing level of storms, and especially because this highway, if it's on 98, 19, is going to be um, there for 100 years, you know, the sea level rise, as the University of Florida has uh, predicted with its models, coupled with, the, you know, the additional storm, storm surge, puts the majority of the corridor in the southern half of Levy County and also part of um, Citrus County underwater. And so, you know, whatever DOT does, it has, if it's going to, if it's hell bent on um, developing that corridor, needs to develop high enough so, um, so folks aren't left stranded out on an island <laughs> when they're, when, when you're sending them all up from Tampa to evacuate. So that, you know, I very much agree with with Janet that you need to you need to increase the level of storm impact. And I would also say, you know, it's just not evaluate the corridors. I don't think you should be building in them. Period. You, know, should, you should be a, you should be, like I said, considering alternatives that are uplands that are not in the harm's way and not putting people in harm's way in 50 years. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Ken. You have any other? Charles Lee from Audubon, Florida. Charles? Um, I'm about to send you a bit of language, but uh, the bottom line is I think that uh, one of the opportunities that needs to be explicitly explored and I think uh, mentioned in the uh, draft instructions under resilience uh, is the opportunity to, uh, if the choice is made to co-locate with US-19, uh, to elevate that road, uh, elevate the bridges, and otherwise uh, remedy any current deficiencies that are related to flooding, uh, storm surge, sea level rise. And so I would like to see a bullet here that would uh, talk about that opportunity, not necessarily limiting it to US-19, but indicating that uh, the choice of a corridor in a co-location mode may provide the opportunity to uh, resolve uh, those problems uh, through design. Okay, thank you. I think that, that it could be an instruction that in, in enhances or speaks to the, the first part of the guiding principle that talks about uh, you know, developing corridors uh, that are considered vulnerability to the things that you mentioned. So thank you for that comment. No. no other comment. All right, we're going to move on to the next one, which was transportation modes. Uh, this was one we did cover last meeting. There were no comments provided at the meeting or after the meeting uh, on this guiding principle. Um, we did add one additional instruction here uh, to this one uh, to uh, further enhance the guiding principle. It says apply innovative planning and design strategies to accommodate multiple modes of transportation. Um, but again, this was one that actually uh, did not have. I'm sorry, I missed it on a page turn. Sorry, now there's a third, a second, third bullet added. Uh, enhanced mobility and accessibility in areas with high concentrations of transportation disadvantaged populations. So um, I feel like those are both good additions. But any comments from the task force? Um, Thomas Hawkins from Thousand Friends of Florida. Thomas, you're self muted, Thomas. Oh, y'all can hear me now. There you go. <laughs> Looking back again at the, uh, the statute, the, the legislature lists multiple transportation modes, and several of them are, are, road, are uh, transportation modes that would utilize a roadway, um, connected or autonomous vehicles or some that they potentially call out. Um, they call out some others um, that wouldn't, and the most specific one is rail. Um, how, how, this really relates back. I was really surprised to see Will identify earlier this morning uh, these, these uh, origin or destination or endpoints of a corridor. What mode we develop is going to determine where this thing goes. What is our framework for evaluating what kind of infrastructure we're building? We talk a lot about roads. The statute never says do that. At some point, we're going to need to develop a framework um, for, for, for evaluating which modes we're going to build based on, on demand. 
Um, and I, I, have, I haven't seen us do that yet. Can, can you talk a little bit about how that's going to happen or where, if we're going to introduce it in the guiding principles process? I would actually have to ask, I guess, Jason or Will to help with that. Did you sort of summarize what he was saying? I'm so, part of so Thomas's comment was that uh, the Senate bill does not specifically state that roadways is the mode of transportation that will be developed and that there are opportunities or considerations for other modes such as rail or, uh, I guess, uh, transit. Um, and that there's not any guiding principles that speak to how the evaluation as to if the, the improvement would be roadway rail or other uh and if that's something that's going to be evaluated through the process so let's go to jason and talk about the pd process and, and how modes are evaluated in that process sure um so what would happen is as we will develop our pd &E process one of the very first things we'll do is come up with a purpose and need of the project. Um, it is a technical purpose and need. It's a little different than the needs evaluation that the task team is working on, but it'll have a, um, a, a it's some, some of them are fairly expansive and I assume with MCORs, it'll be fairly expansive. It'll include all the needs that the task team talked about. And then it will also include um, uh, any other purposes or needs we may find for the, the project. Um, as part of that, a modal evaluation will take place uh, we'll talk about um, buses and rail and and how projects will be incorporate all the different modes. Um, I see Weiwei got on. Weiwei, would you like to add to that? Yeah, um, Jason, thank you for pointing that out. In addition to what Jason just said, Thomas, I think you had a great point. Um, in the task force report, what we could do is um, provide principles about key issues of importance for other modes such as access to markets and connections to the national rail system, recognizing that in some cases the demand for other modes may not yet be sufficiently large, but the task force could provide some principles regarding future planning, accommodating, accommodating future demand or not taking actions now that could, pre that could um, result in actions that would pre preclude a modal option in the future. So um, these you had a great point. Um, I think we're all we're looking for suggestions as to whether it's a guiding principle or some instruction language that we can crystallize what you're talking about. Okay, um, I, that's something I can think about. Like I don't know what that would be right now, but let me ask one. Your explanation it was very it was very helpful. Um, looking at the specific fact that we're going to definitely have different levels of demand for different transportation modes. Are we gonna develop some kind of a threshold that needs to exist in demand in order to develop any kind of infrastructure? Is it gonna be different um, for different modes? I think um, right now, maybe we should just stay a bit higher level than developing the thresholds, but we can set, the task force can set up the framework. Okay. It's like we don't have specific numbers for the highway demand at this point, um, since we're pre-PD&E, pre-planning, pre-everything. But what we can do is to set up a framework that we don't preclude any other modal options being considered. It could be a guiding principle or it could be some specific instruction. Okay. I, I, I support that. My thinking's not clear enough to know exactly what that is, but I support what you're describing. Yeah, um, let the team work on some language and, and we look for everybody's help as well. If you guys um, think about any good options, email it in to us, but we, the team will work on that and make sure it's reflected. All right, thanks, Wei Wei. Uh, Ken Armstrong from Florida Trucking. My, my comment is along the same lines that we're talking about, um, similar to Thomas's thought and what Jason referred to when he uh, commented for the second or third time on purpose and need. It seems to me that we've got um, two different pathways available to us in more than just the geographic sense. 
uh, if, if what we're trying to do is make it easier for people to move west, then that that tends to give you a uh, a general set of guidelines and approaches to some of these guiding principles. Then, if you're trying to allow people to move north or west as an alternative to uh, I-75, obviously, and um, again, if you're trying to allow people to move north or west or or just north primarily and west secondarily, then it's going to push you in some certain directions when you get into PD and E. So, I, and I'm not sure whether it's our job to uh, to interpret for the legislature or for uh, for us as a planning group whether we're, we're wanting to give ourselves the most flexibility for either northern or westward movement, um, or whether we're just kind of assuming that the legislature was thinking about western and uh, and ignore trying to put people back into I-75 further up into, uh, into Georgia at some future point. So I don't know which point we as a task force or even whether we as a task force are supposed to put our ear in the water on that. But I think it makes several big differences. One of those is not just route planning, but it's also revenue production. You're going to end up with a lot more people on this road if it ties in I-75 somewhere up in Adele or Cordia or somewhere like that um, than if it's only planning to service people who are planning to go west on, uh, on I-10 or hook up to some of the railroad trunk lines that are running east and west through the panhandle. So I, I do think Thomas's point and Jason's about purpose and need are important for us for us to consider or for you all to tell us that we're not supposed to consider them because either the legislature knows what it wants to do or we're just not going to pay any attention until we get to PD and E. Okay, Ken, thank you for the comments. Um, <laughs> it's a lot to unpack, so I don't necessarily have a direct, you know, like a direct response to all that. But I think that the point is well made, and and Thomas's point, as Wei Wei said, is also well made. Um, so it does it does give the team uh, some some challenging concepts to consider and uh, discuss how we would incorporate that either through guiding principle or recommendations otherwise. All right, um, one more comment, or Charles uh, from Florida Audubon, Charles. Yeah, I. I think that in response to what uh, Ken said, the legislature was rather specific when it uh, specified the termination point of uh, this MCORS project being Jefferson County. Um, I think that that uh, argues pretty strongly uh, that the intent was a route that would uh, be on the western side. Uh, with that said, uh, having been on the I-75 review task force and going through the extensive analysis that was done by the consultants and DOT staff in terms of ridership and the likely movements of traffic, we did a lot more of that than we're, we're, we're not really doing that here, but that was done uh, fairly uh, extensively in, and ended up in discussion in the I-75 task force. And we learned a lot about prospective traffic movements. And one of the things that led the I-75 review task force to basically put the idea of a parallel uh, route to I-75 on the back burner and to recommend as our foremost uh, recommendation that uh, all stops be pulled out uh, and there be a full court press on widening and improving I-75 uh, was the likelihood 
that very few riders are going to get off of a toll road, uh, off of a free road and get onto a toll road. And that's particularly true if you look at these uh, alternatives, which would actually not be as direct. It would add more miles to their trip. So we're going to be we're going to be picking, or even if you manage to get back to I-75 somewhere up in uh, the Adele, Georgia area, you're basically going to add 10 or 15 miles at minimum to their trip, and you're also going to probably add. Uh, uh, you know, 10 bucks in tolls to what we take out of their wallet. And so the likelihood a lot of people are going to make that choice, except in an emergency, is probably not high. And so uh, that was one of the reasons that the I-75 task force came out with the recommendations that, uh, that it came out with. But one of its observations was that uh, the uh, opportunity for movement of traffic west on I-10 and, and finding a way to connect to that uh, appeared to have some promise. And I think that's one of the reasons why the legislature ended up with a Jefferson County uh, endpoint to the uh, MCORs uh, in this particular study area. Okay, thank you. Wait, wait, I see you turn on your camera. Um... We've gotten a little bit off of the guiding principle discussion and we're actually getting into more just philosophical discussions uh, about the applications, but uh, Weiwei, if you want to close the thoughts on this. Yeah, just very quickly, Charles and Kent, I think you, Ken, your comments underscore the importance of a robust needs analysis. So far, we've shared the baseline traffic conditions with the task force because we're early in the process, but as we move forward, we, you know, we will do what DOT normally does, but if that's not um, clear enough, and we look for guiding principles and instructions to set to set up the framework for these future analyses. All right, thank you, Weiwei. Wei. All right, we're good. Okay. Uh, I, it, just to wrap up on the transportation modes, I, like Weiwei Wei said, we'll we'll get with the team and discuss language and opportunities for either guiding principle or instruction advancement to capture the discussion that occurred in this area. Uh, the next guiding principle, we've got two left. Um, we're almost on target to get there on the right at the right time. Uh, so we've got community, identity, and character. Um, this was one that there has been some discussion about, um, but there was not a lot of revisions uh, from that discussion uh, from the last meeting. Uh, the biggest addition uh, to the change in the guiding principle was simply adding the word rural into the guiding principle. Uh, so it says seek opportunities to maintain and enhance rural character and quality of life in communities. Um, and then the uh, instruction was revised uh, for the purpose of clarification and specificity. Um, and those were kind of the two comments that were received last meeting about this guiding principle. Um, there has historically been some fair discussion from our uh, local elected officials uh, as it tends to speak to their communities. I'd like to see if anyone has comments or thoughts on the language and the guiding principle or instructions. Okay. Um, Commissioner Betsy Barfield from Jefferson County. Commissioner Barfield. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. I don't have a whole lot of uh, words anything to do with this. Um, I, I, I do, I, I, I track really well with the next two that we're going to talk about on the writing, draft writing principles. We talk about maintain and enhance. If I had to change it, I'd say enhance and maintain. I'd like to see more enhancing happening and um, then maintaining. Um, thank you for the rural character addition. And at the very end of it, when we talk about future vitality, uh, perhaps we can add beauty and identity to that. And those are my only comments on the wordsmithing of that. But I do have philosophical comments. And if we want to move on, we can, uh, or I can talk about those. Your choice. Well, yeah, let's, I, I think maybe let's see if there are others that have comments about the, the guiding principles and instructions. And then if, if, as it opens and lends itself to the end, I think maybe we can come back. That's okay with you, Betsy. 
Commissioner Marco. That is perfect. I am in with that. Thank you. All right. Um, Chris Wynn with Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Chris? Yep, thank you. Um, on the aesthetics and landscaping, we really would appreciate it if we could just add native, quote, native uh, landscaping there, please, as we discussed earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Uh, Janet Bowman from the Nature Conservancy. Janet? Yes, um, I submitted some language suggesting that it might be helpful to be a little bit more specific. I mean, I, I'm fine with certainly DOT working with local governments on identifying and communities, air quality of life sort of parameters, but you know, it might be helpful to, to include things like uh, social and cultural centers, such as downtowns, you know, et cetera. Those, those sort of place placemaking types of areas that are important to quality of life and character. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Janet. Thank you, Janet. Um, Charles Lee from Audubon, Florida. Charles? Uh, yes, uh, this is something that certainly impacts community character and represents a place where we have an opportunity. And I would suggest we look at something for the instructions language. Uh, overall, I think this the, the guiding principle language is good. Uh, the instruction language that I would suggest has to do with billboards. You know, we can drive all over the New England area on their interstates. And unless you're in the middle of a town, you won't see a single billboard. And if we're going to have a new route uh, through this area, I would hope that one of the aesthetic considerations that helps to protect the character of the area and community character is that when the right-of-way acquisitions and access acquisitions are made, uh, that steps will be taken to preclude this thing from being festooned with the ugliness that we unfortunately see along I-75 and some of our other roads that do not have protections with regard to billboards. Here we have an opportunity to build it in. So I'd recommend a, a, a bullet point with instructions language along those lines. Thank you. All right, uh, Kent Wimmer from Defenders of Wildlife. Kent. Thank you very much, Kent Wimmer, Defenders of Wildlife. This is another example where um, I think you could look to the uh, Northern Turnpike Task Force for some, some more pointed language as Janet was describing. It says, plan, design, construct, and operate, maintain corridors of recognize and incorporate the surrounding character while accommodating potential growth and development. Balance the need to move vehicles safely and efficiently while preserving scenic, aesthetic, historic, and environmental resources. So it's, it's similar, but I think it's maybe a little more pointed and direct. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Ken. Good insight. Yeah, Betsy, if uh, we got a little bit of time, if you want to go back to you, if you had some uh, any further thoughts or on the community character. Sure, thank you. Love the comment about the billboards. That would be a really, really uh, amazing not to have billboards along that corridor if it was co-located <clears throat> in Jefferson County. Um. As I listen to the community or in Jefferson County, there's some things that really resonates with us. And um, to me is the preference of an open road. And we all talk about this. I've talked about it already, the, the open toll road. Um, I think that um, perhaps we need to be creative about how we're going to have this co-location look. There's, there are some aesthetics that we can continue to incorporate into it, but closing off um, 1927 uh, is going to be further detrimental to our little towns and communities along the way. Uh, I just don't think that, uh, let me rephrase that, I think we really need to give some huge consideration to uh, what an open access road will look like and, and toll that. 
We talked about branding, and, and this is certainly important um, to us also. Um, we're concerned about the folks that zip right through um, and, and don't stop. Um, I believe with our branding, we'd want to entice these people to stop. We'd want them to interact with our communities, our towns. We want to engage in conversations. We show off our assets. We want to educate them about the North Florida way tell our story and we also want to build on our history we have a huge history in jefferson county and along the corridor and the branding is going to go, going to go a long way with that we can incorporate the chamber the tourist development councils visit natural north florida visit florida i think we all know the organizations that can certainly help us tell our story i've also comment, commented about the aesthetics of the corridor itself and i um, <laughs> I was traveling up to uh, Thomasville, from Tallahassee, on the Marguerite Neal Williams Memorial Highway, and sent a picture and submitted that for public comment. And um, it has your soaring oaks, your long leaf pines, your saw grass, and it breaks up the gray ribbon of the road. And um, it, it, indeed, if we want to be proud of, of of what we are doing, we want to we want it to be beautiful as well as functional. And these are some of the aesthetics, some of the things that I consider and I look at when I am traveling um, throughout. Uh, and that's all I have about comment number six. Thank you, Betsy. All right, we are on to our last guiding principle of the day. Uh, this one's. Um, can I make one point <clears throat> related to the uh, billboards? Uh, that is handled out of our office of right away. Uh, that is a direct report of uh, Chief Engineer Will Watts. Uh, and there's lots and lots of statutes governing outdoor advertising. And we'll have to, maybe Jason and Will could have an opportunity to speak with and, and help us out with, through, through the office of right away. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Yeah, Commissioner, um, <clears throat> we do have existing statutes that covers outdoor advertising, and we can certainly share that with you. I'm not sure MCOR is going to override some of those statutes, but um, we can we can bring that information back to the team. Yeah, well, I was thinking, you know, as we've had a precedence before with language that speaks to, like, coordinate any, you know, considerations for that sort of stuff um, that, you know, instructions that maybe speaks to coordinating with those offices and, and following those statutes um, might be applicable here. Okay. I'm assuming uh, when that comment was made, some hands went up. So I'm assuming it's in regards to that. Charles, did you have a comment real quick? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that DOT needs to look very carefully at the new authorities it has under MCORs uh, and to aggressively take the position uh, until a judge tells you otherwise, that the opportunity to uh, reduce billboards is inherent in the MCORS legislation. I would hope that that would, uh, would be the posture. Uh, I did want to respond to something that Commissioner Barfield said, and, and that is that uh, the issue of open access is a two-edged sword. When you get to communities, uh, along the route, if we're talking co-location, I'm very much in agreement with what uh, Commissioner Barfield had to say. Uh, and I think that the differential tolling possibility is one way uh, that you could allow uh, the uh, road to be something that would look like a traditional toll road with limited access over much of its uh, distance outside of town. But once you get into a point you're coming into the urban area, at that point you lose the limited access and go back to a more open access profile. That will slow your traffic down. There are traffic uh, strategies, traffic management strategies, including the timing of uh, traffic signals and other things that can, can reduce that slowdown. But the grand compromise that may need to be achieved here is one in which if you look at the aggregate miles between I-10 and uh, Red Level, and uh, you uh, add up the number of miles that are outside of town and suitable for becoming limited access, that by doing that, you get a great environmental benefit. Uh, and at the same time, if you have open access, 
inside the urban area, uh, you retain the character of those urban areas and the commerce in those urban areas. So I think I think both are a possibility depending upon design. And I, I do think the grand compromise might be a toll road that goes to the urban area, but then becomes like a uh, a, a divided four lane road through an urban area. Um, and then once it exits the urban area, it goes back to more of a limited access configuration. We're going to move on to the next guiding principle. Uh, this guiding principle speaks to uh, historic and cultural resources. Um, again, the feedback from the last meeting was to remove the ambiguous language. Um, but there was also some questions about you know, how future uh, um, locates and uh, assessments would account for uh, culture, cultural and historical resources. Um, and so this guiding principle is revised much like the environmental guiding principle, uh, where it simply states to avoid adverse impacts to uh, these identified known resources. And they're the ones that had been listed prior um, on the will not or impact or no new corridor through. And then speaks to if new resources are discovered that they will be addressed consistent with state and federal policies and regulations. Um, as a result of that second uh, addition to the guiding principle, uh, we added a second bullet because uh, again there's the guiding principle of uh, what to do and then the second one is how it's implemented um, so we tried to put very specific language in there that spoke to that as well um, and so those were the revisions that we had on this guiding principle uh, Betsy I do know that you had mentioned prior to when we were speaking to community character that you had some thoughts on this one as well so we can go to you first just a second Let's get down. Sorry, I keep doing that to Mandy. I'm sorry. I know it takes you a minute to find them. And, and so. All right. You should be good now, Commissioner okay. Garfield. Thank you very much. I really don't have, um, well, I have one change to, not change, uh, suggestion to the language, and it's in the drafting um, instrument and under the first. Uh, paragraph working with communities um, um perhaps we might want to add and their stakeholders jefferson county's got quite a, a few stakeholders that are very involved in the historic aspects um and perhaps we want to strengthen that language a little bit other than that i do have some philosophical um, comments again and i'd be happy to waive those for other people to talk and if you want me to address them later or now i'm, I'm happy to i'm at your convenience Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, we've got somebody uh, else raise their hand. Uh, Commissioner Dozier from Capital Region Transportation Planning Agency. Commissioner Dozier. You're self-muted, Commissioner Dozier. So. Yes, sir. <laughs> there you go. I'm getting slower as it gets later today. Forgive me. Um, so I, I actually would love to hear Commissioner Barfield's editorial comments there. Um, I, I appreciate how you've drafted this guiding principle, but seeing the language of known cemeteries, known cultural sites, known lands owned by Native American tribes, this may be a little tired by now, but I can't help thinking of Rumsfeld's known knowns and known unknowns and all of that from years ago. We have seen a surge, I would say, in identifying particularly African-American cemeteries here in Leon County, other places around the state, and places that may not be known or identified typically as historical sites. It may be embedded in other historical documents, but we're, we're kind of assimilating more of our history now and we've had several of these cemeteries um, discovered here in Tallahassee, one at a golf course um, owned by the city just in the last year. So I, I, I'm not sure how to do this. If new resources are discovered, that's a good caveat in there. But I think we do need to be sensitive to the fact that this is a rapidly evolving um, issue, or I shouldn't say issue, but just, uh, 
Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. This is rapidly evolving in our state right now. People are identifying and looking for history that has not been recorded or as readily available as it has been in the past. So I think to Commissioner Barfield's point, working with community stakeholders and making sure that's a diverse group of stakeholders may help us look for some of those um, areas that could have for example, a cemetery that has never been discovered before. Um, that could really hold up a project if we got to construction and then something was discovered, right? So, so that, I know Jason yes, wants to chime in a little bit, but I, if I remember correctly, in last year's session, there was a piece of um, legislation that passed that identified funding uh, and uh, resources for search of the African-American cemeteries. Um, I know we've had issues in Jacksonville and, and in St. Augustine, uh, as you have over in Tallahassee. And Jason, would you like to add more to that? Sir, I, I was just going to say that th this is um, something we do in pd and &E. um, We, I think we're focused here on the knowns just because we already have them on a map. Um, but as we do projects through pd and &E, there's an entire technical document that looks for historical and archeological sites, um, including known cemeteries or unknown cemeteries or any type of um, basically history that we as a, as a state want to preserve. And, and I, I appreciate the comment uh, that's, that's um, been broadened and it, it continues to be broadened, but we invite the community to come speak with us and tell us what we think what we should consider. And all of that gets rolled into our cultural cultural effect. And we really try to take, give a lot of consideration to that. So thank you for the comment was, was my only point. And thank you for that. And Mr. Secretary, I, there has been more attention here, yes, by the state for more funding. You all look at this quite carefully. It just, things are very different in the last year or more. Um, on this point, I'll just say we've had some work, um, very few people know this, but the Southeast Regional Archaeological Center, which is the National Park Service um, office that covers the whole Southeast and the Caribbean is located in Tallahassee. And they've um, been very helpful looking at some of these sites. The other point I'm going to make, and then I'll leave this alone. Thank you all for those comments. Um, restoring historic and cultural resources, restoring buildings in a downtown can be an economic benefit. And I just wondered, um, the language here is about avoiding. I think that is critical but there is an economic benefit about lifting up and restoring some of those um, structures and buildings when they're identified, and that can be a heavy lift for communities. So if there was any way to focus on getting partnerships to recognize those facilities, I know we've got that in the signage, but also identify funding and help communities preserve them, that can really go a long way to meet some of our other goals. Thank you, Commissioner Dozier. Um, I think that the instruction which speaks to work with communities and as uh, Commissioner Barfield suggested and local stakeholders to identify needs for enhancement or protection um, might carry that uh, intention. Um, and Jason, thank you for your feedback on you know, the uh, cultural resource assessment process through pd and &E. uh, Were there any other uh, individuals that have comments on this guiding principle? Nope. All right. Uh, Commissioner Barfield, I will beg your forgiveness. We are out of time for the discussion on the guiding principles today. We're gonna to have to move on to our next agenda item. Um, so we'll we'll have to uh, have that conversation uh, about some more of the philosophical ideas uh, with uh, cultural historical considerations uh, at our next meeting. Um, so I think with that, we're going to move into our discussion of the uh, task force report. Greg has walked away so that I can speak to you all without my mask here. I appreciate your social distance, sir. Um, Alicia, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, my intention to discuss the draft task force report, I know that a lot of the individuals who are on our call and on our task force today uh, had the opportunity to discuss uh, this, some of these materials uh, and the framework of the report uh, at yesterday's meeting. Um, so I'm going to do a quick overview of it and then go into the high level needs and just cover the high points of that. And then I'd really like to get out of the way and allow the task force to share their comments and thoughts um, so that we have time to hear their, their feedback. 
Um, so I hope that the task force has had the opportunity to look at the report that was submitted. Um, it does follow the same format and framework as what you've seen from the other corridor study areas. Um, it begins with a discussion of the introduction, which is just framing up the Senate bill, uh, the process we've been through, um, what the statute has asked us to do, um, and then basically sets us right into the task force overview. Uh, in this section, you'll see uh, language that speaks to the task force meetings, what we have held, when we've held them, the number of them, um, our public involvement process and a summary. You'll see there's lots of placeholders still for being able to quantify um, and tabulate the, the materials that we've gotten or the feedback we've gotten back from the public. And then it speaks about the GIS tools and how the task force and the teams have used those um, and will continue to use those uh, as an ongoing tool throughout the MCORS projects. Uh, the next part of the report speaks to the study area overview. Uh, again, this is just a, a high level discussion of the, the uh, counties within the area. Uh, we tried to group it by a discussion of their natural uh, environment first, uh, then into a discussion of the community as a whole and some of the demographics that can be found within there. Um, and then quickly moving to discussion of economy and then infrastructure. Uh, again, would just like to see your, hear your feedback at some point in time, maybe not as a discussion today, but just as you provide comments back to us, if there's anything you'd like to see added or expounded upon more in there. Uh, and there is an intention to include an appendix, which will have demographic profile information for the counties in the study area. Uh, the highlight discussion for today uh, regarding the task force report is gonna be this recommendations and framework. Um, we've seen this historically in task force meeting six and five, uh, as just our high level needs discussion. Um, and so the framework, as you know, and Weiwei has covered this in, in the presentation she's done at the previous two meetings, uh, discuss the high level needs um, with these being key regional opportunities and challenges that corridor investments and related actions are intended to address. They can be transportation specific needs and transportation supported needs. The high level needs are to be informed by the six purposes and 13 potential benefits within the statute. Uh, it then discuss our guiding principles and how we've defined those and what those are. Uh, sorry, Alicia, you got a little bit ahead of me. Um, and then the instructions for project development and beyond. And again, that's been the, the crux of what we've done today is the guiding principles and the instructions uh, for how things are handled in project development and beyond. Um, again, we've said this several times, but just to, to reiterate once more, the guiding principles are instructions and instructions are intended to function as a set of directions to DOT and our other partners as we implement the task force recommendations. So high level needs, uh, I mean, again, Alicia, now we can kind of scroll to that. Um, the quick def definition and description of what those needs are, uh, Weiwei has really shared this with you quite a bit before, um, but what we see here now in the, the black bolded bullets uh, reflects any of the minor revisions that were made from the last task force meeting to this, uh, and then provides some accompanying supporting language that elaborates on that high level need. Um, I do not think anyone wants me to read these pages of documents to you, so I'm just gonna read the, the black highlighted bullets and then open it up for discussion. So uh, our high level needs um, as revised since last meeting state support projected statewide and regional population and economic growth. Improve safety, mobility and connectivity through access to a high speed, high capacity transportation corridor for people and commercial goods. Protect, restore, enhance, and connect public and private environmentally sensitive areas and ecosystems. Enhance travel options and safety for all transportation users. Enhance emergency management at the local, regional, and state levels. Improve access to ecotourism and recreational assets. Enhance economic and workforce development access to education and job creation. Improve connectivity to agricultural businesses, manufacturing, warehousing, freight terminals, and intermodal logistics centers. Expand rural broadband infrastructure and access to broadband services. Uh, and last, to preserve and improve the rural character and quality of communities. Uh, so those are the revised high-level needs statements. Uh, as mentioned, there is some supporting language that expounds upon how that is uh, carried forth moving forward. Um, and I would just like to call to your attention, uh, if we had more time, I would have 
uh, actually unpacked this and read through all this, but um, I think that the inclusion of the evaluation of needs moving forward uh, is critical to the discussions that the task force has had thus far about the needs and some of the questions that have been brought up as we talked about the guiding principles and some of the, I, maybe the, the philosophical ideas um, in the intentions of those principles uh, today. So again, just as you're considering your conversation and some of the ideas and, and thoughts that you've had about what's in this thus far, um, I think if you consider them through the lens of, of what the teams have put together in terms of how those needs are evaluated moving forward, um, that would be constructive. So Greg, you might wanna come back now since you and Mandy are our tag team and we'll go back to there. Um, I do see, Mandy, we're showing, we do have one comment uh, or hand up. So we'll go to Charles Lee from the Audubon Society first. Um, and yeah. then as we get more comments from there. Uh, Chairman, we have until five o'clock, is that correct? Yes, sir, public comments at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. So we've got about 20 minutes for discussion on this. Um, and yep. we will do our best let to me try to, Let me try to go as fast as I can. My, my first point is I would request that an editable copy of these paragraphs, uh, this entire block of material that you've, you've brought to us today, be sent to each task force member, uh, not a PDF, but an editable copy so that we can go through it and make recommendations for edits and send those back to you and then for you to establish a timeline for those uh, comments and edits to get back to you. Um, this is a lot of material, as you've said, um, and it's uh, it, it needs some attention. Um, and it needs attention so that we can address it with, with editable comment forms. The second point I'd like to make is at the very, uh, toward the top of this, before you got to the bullet point paragraphs in dark, you had the word recommendations. Um, the question occurs from a legal standpoint as to what the recommendations of the task force are, because DOT is legally obligated by Senate Bill 7068 to follow the recommendations of the task force. My recommendation on the recommendations is that the recommendations of the task force be constrained to the guiding principles and the instruction language. Um, there's a lot in here, which uh, I certainly can't get my arms around agreeing to. Um, and, and I think uh, we are close to agreement on all the guiding principles and the language. So I would, I, I would be much, uh, I, I, we talked about this in Turnpike. There seemed to be, I thought, a consensus about the recommendations consisting of the guiding principles and the, uh, and the instructions language. And so I'd like to take that word recommendations out at that point, uh, leave, leave the word framework there, but take the word recommendations out and apply that to the guiding principles and the instructions language. The next point goes, if you, if you would, uh, the next point goes to need. Um, I read the provisions of 7068 to instruct us to make a recommendation on need of the MCORS projects. Um, I do not think we can finesse that by inserting the words high level need. Uh, if you were to ask me what my view of need is and whether there is a need, I would say that 330 miles of new greenfield turnpikes through Florida, uh, in no, no way in my imagination is there a need for that. Is there a need for significant transportation upgrades and improvements, primarily to existing roads and co-located facilities? I'm ready to sign on to that, but they are very different things. And so um, I think we've got to be very careful about how we deal with the, with the application of the word need in this. Now, if you drop down to the high level needs section after line 271, uh, and get to the first bullet, bullet point. Um, there, is a, there is a disjunctive feature of this bullet point reading support projected statewide and regional population and economic growth. And at the same time, uh, the guiding principles that we have adopted with regard to comprehensive plans. 
Um, it, it is extremely, you can, get, you can get a variety of projections and argument over projections as to what the population growth of Florida in the future is going to be. Um, what is much more definitive is what each local government has incorporated on the future land use maps of its comprehensive plans, recognizing that local governments going through the process can always amend their comprehensive plans. But the starting point of known, uh, of, of known population growth is what the counties and the cities have already planned for and what appears in the language of their approved plans. So I really think that the target for economic development the target for future population growth needs to be linked more to the plans than it does to more ambiguous projections and surveys and opinions. And, and so I've got a problem with that language the way it is, is word, worded. I won't burden the time anymore with this. I'll just say, uh, please send out an editable document and give us a deadline to get back uh, edits and uh, uh, I think uh, a number of us will go through this and give you some recommendations. Very good. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate your comments and feedback. Uh, Janet Bowman, uh, you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, I, I've submitted some written um, comments, but I think one of the, what I'd like to raise in the limited time we have left is um, Suggest that we need a, a financial feasibility high level uh, guiding principle. And this came up in another task force. I think it's really important, certainly to the extent that that, that core is viewed as our, our core recommendations. Um, you know, that, that uh, is important to be in there. And then in terms of need, um, I think that's an area that just needs a much more elaborate. Um, discussion, either in guiding principles or, or in this um, initial document. Thank you. Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, Janet, I appreciate your feedback as well. And yes, we did receive your, your written comments. Um, we'll take a look at those. Uh, Christian Dozier, Commissioner Dozier, if you have comments. Uh, thank you, yes, I can be very quick here. I agree with um, Janet, on both counts, I think we do need to unpack the word need. Um, there's a couple of places in here it says likely to be needed, in, like increased transportation capacity. To me, that's not a, a need we have identified. It's a need we're guessing will be um, there in the future once we go through the PD&E. So I think a discussion about how we describe need will be good in the future. The financial feasibility issue though is, is a big one for me. It's not one the task force has really jumped into. We've been seeing some recommendations from Thousand Friends of Florida that I very much appreciate and others um, talking about the financial impact. This is something I raised earlier in the meeting, many of us have. Um, this is not just about the existing transportation budgets and how this particular road or all three quarters might impact other projects that have been in the works for a long time, but we have to recognize the reality of the fiscal impact of the pandemic. So I think some recognition of the budget and the fiscal viability, the financial viability of this should be referenced in the document. And if we can have a discussion about that at the next meeting, I think that would be helpful. Okay, way away. Yeah, I've been um, unpacking what uh, Charles, Janet, and C Commissioner Dozier have said. It seems that we uh, probably need to go back and restructure the needs section of this report and, and clarify what these needs are, and then maybe um, be more clear on the language as to what under what framework, what what does it mean? You know, I think yesterday at the TEMPAC meeting there was a question about are we saying that we're endorsing the need for a toll road? No, not that's not what what we're saying here. So let staff um, go back and come back with with a more clear language about the need. 
and maybe separate them out a little bit more from, from the guiding principles and um, the instructions as to how they're going to be carried forward into future steps. And then um, I, I hear you about the financial feasibility, and I think Janet was um, suggesting adding a guiding principle. We'll make sure that we come back with some language that would address that concern. We, we do need to expand on that language. Thank you very much, Louis. Thank you, Lily. Okay, uh, Secretary Evans, we do not have any more hands raised for discussion today. If you wanted to uh, put some closing thoughts on the meeting. Thank you, Greg. And um, <clears throat> I want to start by giving a, a personal thank you to our IT guys. Uh, when we went dark, uh, they brought us back in the light. So, gentlemen, thank you all very, very much. I um, also want to say thank you to uh, the entire task force. Uh, tremendous progress has been made today. Uh, thank you for all your efforts, for your attention, and for the uh, massive amount of engagement that we've had today. It's, uh, it's uh, been a very successful day. Uh, and to, uh, to folks like uh, Thomas and Charles and many, many others of y'all, Hey, it just warms my heart when y'all make complimentary comments of the efforts of, of the production team here. I tell you, I've never seen a harder working group of folks. Uh, they are really committed to this task force uh, and to this program. So thank y'all for those comments. It, it really makes me feel good. Uh, again, I want to mention our community open house. Uh, that will be uh, September 1st again up at the Monticello Opera House in Jefferson County. And Commissioner Barfield is going to sing a solo for us. And uh, that, that will be in a, in a hybrid uh, format uh, also. So uh, just visit the uh, Florida MCOR for additional information of how to attend uh, that virtually. Um, I want to recap a few uh, next steps uh, before we go into public comment period. Uh, first, today's presentation and the, uh, of the task force meeting number seven is recorded and be available on the website. <clears throat> Excuse me. Secondly, uh, the team will record the revisions of the guiding principles and instructions that we've discussed today and provide, and provide an updated draft for circulation uh, in advance of our meeting in September, um, task force meeting number eight. Um, as discussed, if you have additional comments, particularly some of the editorial changes that we did not get discussed today, please send those to Ryan Asmus uh, by Thursday, September 3rd so we can incorporate uh, the next version. So Charles, you, was, you were asking for a, a date. Uh, there it is. And uh, Thomas Hawkins, you were gonna do some more thinking on some modal issues and, and maybe submit those back to Ron so we can distribute amongst the uh, production team here. Um, and thirdly, we'll be available to address any, uh, address any technical questions you have throughout the process. Uh, we'll continue with our one-on-ones with, with you. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one outreach uh, sometimes we can't reach you. Sometimes your voicemail box is full. Uh, I know y'all got personal lives and, and uh, you know, business lives as well, but uh, we, we are doing a good bit of outreach. We don't want to be a bother, uh, but we want to make sure that you know what the next steps are and that, uh, what, and that we are here to help and assist and help you understand anything that we possibly can. Uh, finally, uh, we'll be in touch and uh, for solidifying the timing in the format of the meeting uh, in September. So we are a few minutes early, uh, around, looks like about uh, eight, seven, eight minutes early to initiate uh, public comment. We can do so. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we've got a number signed up and we also have the remote locations uh, in Old Town and also in Jefferson County. It's my understanding that we have had some, some walk-in traffic at those locations uh, Yeah, I said old town. <laughs> That's Dixie. <laughs> Crystal River. I'm sorry, Crystal River. Yep, Citrus. Um, sorry about that. So I'm going to turn this over to a gray. <laughs> I'll be 100% right about this, a gray. Uh, you are correct. You are safe in saying that here. Uh, today. So uh, we're now going to go into public comment period. We appreciate everybody uh, hanging with us. I know that this was a long day, and, but we got a lot of stuff done and we really appreciate 
Um, I don't know what the task force members' thoughts are, but I can just say from 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 my perspective, I felt like this was the most robust discussion that we've had. So I appreciate everybody hanging with us today and, and really giving it uh, the, the old college try. Uh, the comment period today is going to be uh, slightly different because we will be accepting public comments from those who are joining us virtually, as well as those in attendance at our public viewing locations in uh, Gilchrist and um, actually in Dixie and uh, in Citrus counties. As always, we encourage everyone to stay engaged during this portion of the meeting. Requests made online to provide comments virtually uh, received by 4 p.m. today or via speaker card at the public viewing locations uh, will be addressed during this public comment period. Comments will be made in the order of the request. If you do not respond when you're called, we will provide a second chance at the end of the public comment period. When your name is called to actually speak, we will unmute your line in order for you to provide comment within your allotted time of three minutes. You will hear a tone when you have 30 seconds remaining and then another tone when your time is up. So keep, keep a listen to that. Um, the, time, the line will be muted after three minutes. So please keep your eye on the clock and listen for those tones so we can hear all of your comment. If you have more information to share with the group, you can provide additional comments in writing for uh, further consideration, you can send those comments anytime to fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us. Only one person at a time will be unmuted. If you have self-muted, please be sure to unmute before speaking. After completion of the virtual public comments, we will sub subsequently move to our public viewing locations. Uh, the first speaker today is Lindsay Cross, and so Lindsay, we will um, get you unmuted and okay. Good afternoon. This is Lindsay Cross with Florida Conservation Voters Task Force members. Today, I'm asking you not to sign on to a consensus report unless it includes no build. Many decisions are riding on this document. If DOT and legislative leaders respect its findings, it will shape the future of our state. If not, it is a rubber stamping exercise and this whole, sham, this pro whole process will be a sham. I appreciate the concerns that many of you raised about the needs to protect water, wildlife, agriculture, and rural communities. Those are the things that Floridians care deeply about. It was stated this morning that the task force report is the foundation for this whole program, yet the very foundation for this program is not solid. MCORS was conceived not from local communities, but as a political pet project. The legislation is so expertly crafted that the funding, which has increased despite an economic pandemic, is nearly impossible to undo. It plays upon our emotions by highlighting fears like hurricanes or scarcity in our rural communities. We've heard today that a piecemeal approach may be taken if we can't afford to build all these roads. Several of you have expressed concern about funding sources and whether local communities that will bear the direct destruction from these roads will have to foot a portion of the bill. There is so much that has been promised, but if we can't afford the roads, how likely is it that local communities will get broadband or sewer? You heard about hurricanes evacuation this morning, including behavioral elements. However, as Commissioner Dozier reminds us, Florida has not conducted a statewide regional evacuation study for more than 10 years. It would be foolish to invest in new roads until there is data to support this. Despite lip service about letting locals maintain power, the legislation requires local municipalities to change their comp plans to be consistent with MCORS, not the other way around. DOT has been forthright that, that MCORS does not follow its typical planning process, that it has an aggressive timeline, and that they are generally tasked with things outside their normal duties. DOT has not demonstrated the need for up to 330 new miles of roads. DOT has not demonstrated that the project is financially viable, and we know from multiple reports, including Florida Tax Watch and Thousand Friends, that the total project cost could be between 25 and $30 billion. These fundamental questions about need and economics continue to get pushed off to the PD&E phase, yet we've already spent millions of dollars on this process and the public deserves answers. A prudent person would look first for a strong and secure foundation upon which to build a house before investing. This process is attempting to slap together a McMansion on a sinkhole. 
DOT has not demonstrated that the roads are needed or that we can pay for them. Floridians overwhelmingly are against the roads to ruin. Do not sign on to a consensus report unless it includes no build. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cross, for your comment. Up next, Jim Tatum from Tampa, Florida. Jim, you are unmuted. I represent our Santa Fe River, a nonprofit from Fort White. As time progresses and the November deadline draws nearer, the DOT continues to plunge forward amid the COVID crisis with still no proof of need for the roads and no sand sound plan for paying for them. The unneeded roads will promote developmental sprawl and negatively impact wildlife and our water resources. No matter that the DOT appears to ignore the fact that public comments are heavily weighted against the roads, we hope the task force is aware that the city of Cedar Key Levy County and just recently, Alaska County have all issued strong statements opposing the roads. We must end this madness and the sooner the better. Give your no build opinion vote now and save everybody time and money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tatum. Up next is Kim Wheeler from Williston, Florida. Kim, you are unmuted. from Levy County. I'm a taxpayer, a farmer, um, an environmentalist, and a fiscal conservative. The MCOR's legislation requiring these 330 miles of toll roads was not considered necessary uh, by FDO and T FDOT. Recently, a year ago, these roads were a bad idea. Uh, they will further degrade our water resources and compromise human health, damage local businesses, and roll down towns lead to the loss of threatened and endangered species and misdirect tax dollars away from important state needs. Today, toll roads are prosperous. I won't go through all the details of Tax Watch Florida or 1,000 Friends of Florida. I agree with Lindsay Cross. I agree with the Roads to Ruin Coalition, more than 93 groups who've signed on. I agree with the more than 12,000 people who have commented and for the most part against these roads. Um, right now, uh, Charles Lee brought up some good points today, uh, particularly about hardening 1998 and creating it an usable road. It's a, not a bad road, but it does have some issues. We should be spending our money on the infrastructure we have, uh, considering climate change, hurricanes, and uh, our agricultural and tourism base, our natural resources are our economy. Our environment is our economy and we should not destroy it. Um, I appreciate the time everybody's put into this. I certainly appreciate uh, Levy County, um, our commissioners, our task force members. They've been very open to listening to us. Um, Matt Brooks here, Rock Meeks on the Northern. Levy County will be greatly impacted by these roads. At this point, I see no need for them. I say no build. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wheeler. Up next is Amy Datz from Tallahassee, Florida. Amy, you are unmuted. I have been a professional environmental scientist for over 40 years. I'm an activist, not a lobbyist or consultant. I will address the guiding principles social and community context. All buildings and designs should be up to LEED's standards. It's critical that there be open space and very compact development closer to the central towns to maintain their rural character. Include, include forest buffers between the rural and environmentally preserved areas and urban densities. Compact subdivisions generate fewer vehicle miles and therefore less air pollution. Multimodalism, neighborhoods must be developed with interconnected open spaces so residents can walk or ride their bicycles to destinations. Although narrower streets are preferable to reduce speed and preserve neighborhood character, where transit is anticipated, the lanes must be 11 feet wide at a minimum. Water resources, stormwater treatment ponds can become highly polluted with trash and toxic pathogens. Under those conditions, they must not be considered environmental amenities or for open space credit, unless the water going into them is treated first to remove the pollutants and has demonstrable ecological value. Frequent inspections and maintenance should be incorporated as part of the condition of the stormwater facility work plan and permitting. 
The stormwater control design must include runoff prevention. The use of pretreatment methods would clean the runoff before it flows into off-site water bodies. Wildlife and plant habitats. There must be no net loss of trees. Whenever possible, design around strands of old growth trees instead of just plowing through them. If removing trees, fund an aggressive native tree place replacement and maintenance program. It's important in reaching our carbon neutrality goal. Conservation lands. Areas of this project have been or will be legally recorded conservation easements. No connector roads should be designed to go through those easement areas, disturbing their conservation value. Underpasses must be included if land is fragmented. Utilities. No natural gas hookups should be provided. Natural gas is a dying industry and will be obsolete as an energy source by the time this project is operational. It requires the pipe pipelines that may leak and many millions of dollars per mile to install and uninstall. Requiring renewable green electric energy sources are the path to the future. Technology, make vehicle charging stations solar powered and portable to accommodate future needs. To maximize efficiency of travel, please do not dump traffic onto I-4 or I-75 to connect these three corridor segments. Make this southwestern corridor contiguous with this corridor with an exit onto I-4. Develop electric light rail on these corridors to connect to Amtrak. Broadband, the legislation indicated that there are 700,000 citizens without broadband in the area. What percentage of those citizens will be serviced through libraries and schools that the draft inst instructions address? Time's up, Mrs. All 7,000 citizens. We appreciate your comment. Thank you for your comment, Mrs. Dat. Up next is Jenny Welch from Old Town, Florida. Jenny, you are unmuted. You are self muted. Jenny Welch, you are self muted. Last time, and then we'll circle back. Jenny, you are unmuted. You are self muted. Circling back, up next. Michael McGrath from Port Myers, Florida. Michael, you are unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Hello, my name is Michael McGrath, an organizer for the Sierra Club. We are now approaching the anniversary of this task force process with little to show for it. There's been no thorough empirical data-driven analysis to determine whether this project project is environmentally, economically, or fiscally feasible. FDOT has blatantly disregarded the statutory obligations required by Senate Bill 7068 and has wasted an enormous amount of taxpayer money. Adding insult to injury, FDOT has failed to track internal costs associated with MCORS. Indeed, the public will never know just how many millions of taxpayer dollars have already been misspent on the MCORS project. Task Force members. You're running out of time. The public has spoken out vehemently against this process and have called it a sham. It has been overwhelmingly opposed and we need you to stop and not build this road immediately. Do not be complicit in this sham. Do be disruptive. Demand that the, that the dissension on the task force be, re be represented in your recommendations. I'm asking you not to sign any consensus report unless it rec recommends the no build option. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGrath, for your comment. Up next is Richard Grosso from Plantation, Florida. Richard, you are unmuted. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I would seriously ask the members of the task force to consider whether you really are meeting the charge that you were given by the legislation. You were given guiding principles. If the end result of your process is simply coming up with some additional slightly more specific guiding principles. Uh, I don't believe you've met the charge you were given by the legislature. Uh, adopting guiding principles that have no priorities and entering into it already saying you're not going to be able to meet all of them. It seems to be a failure of what you were asked to do. You were asked to determine the need. What kind of facilities over this vast stretch might be needed where? You don't seem to have done that. You were asked to determine 
the impacts, the land use evacuation, the hurricane evacuation, the land use, the environmental impacts, it doesn't seem that you've begun to determine the impacts. You haven't winnowed down any specific types of facilities and any specific locations so that you could even come up with any sort of crude uh, analysis or identification, quantified or qualitatively, what the impacts uh, are going to be. And so it's going to be, I think it's a challenge for you to write a report that explains that you've done that when all you've done is add some verbiage that will be considered in the pd &E process that would have happened anyway in the absence of the idea that the law put into place that you would further refine and define and identify need and identify impacts. Um, you have to ask yourself what would happen differently to the pd &E process as a result of the task force's work and it doesn't look like the answer is going to be a whole heck of a lot because all you're doing is coming up with language guiding principles and you haven't identified impacts and you haven't figured out how you're going to deal with them where the money's going to come from for all of the things that you're that you have to do and if you can't afford to buy all the land if you can't afford to do everything necessary to protect the environment then you probably can't afford this roadway those are the kinds of things that i think um expected the task force to do and, and I have to submit to you that you might be on the verge of failing to fulfill that. Thank you, Mr. Grosso, for your comment. Up next is Arun Kendra from Monticello, Florida. Arun, you are unmuted. You are self-muted. Hello, can you hear me? This is Arun Kundra. Uh, yes, sir, go ahead. I'm good. Um, I have a question for the, uh, why are we not considering the exit 217, which is uh, intersection of Highway 59 and I-10 for uh, the Northern um, to connect uh, the corridor? Uh, I think that's one of the best ones because uh, it uh, doesn't have to go through the middle of the uh, the towns like Monticello or Thomasville later on at some point. And, um, and, and Highway 59 is there. You can connect it to 98 or 27, either one of them. Uh, I think that intersection needs to be considered. And, and we need jobs there. We have a lot of people there who need some good jobs, and this will bring that. And I... Um, I'll just say that. And uh, the second point I have is that uh, I'm a business owner on I-10, a small business owner, and and I think we should be represented uh, somewhere in the task force or or listen to our comments. Our livelihood depends on this, and uh, we employ hundreds of people, and and I think they should be listened to um, by this task force. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Kundra, for your comment. Up next is Shirley McCullough from Denellen, Florida. Shirley, you are unmuted. Hi. Thank you. Um, I kind of had comments in a certain order, but I'm going to change it a little bit. Um, what I want to start with now is when plows start digging, the runoff begins and possible unintended damage will occur. That damage cannot be repaired no matter how much the word mitigate comes, comes up. Dead wildlife is permanent. So Kent, stop with being stuck on 41. That takes out several small towns and puts Rainbow River and its head spring in danger in direct line of danger um you're supposed to be defenders of wildlife you are not okay so i have listened to all three meetings so in the south section meeting a comment was made all roads lead somewhere <clears throat> but we the public do not know or understand what that means for our areas 
in the NTC meeting, which is my area, someone stated that, that the edges should be shown between each section, yet not, of course, interfere with their discussions. I agree with that and feel this is very important to the publics. In the maps from all three sections, many small towns will be destroyed. Don't say they won't, they will. So I cannot determine where rural towns will have benefits rather than bulldozers. This is a planned, very large, high-speed road, including rest areas, plazas, truck stop locations, and charging stations. I don't think the public has been robustly informed at all, because then you would be getting a whole lot more no roads, which I agree with. Um, it was also noted for debris, I'm sorry, debris removal to be easier, so it was said a wide, wider swath would have to be done. With every tree ripped out, it will destroy wildlife habitat, endangered plants, animals. Once gone, it is just gone. There is no fixing it. Loss of habitat, habitat will cause increased wildlife slash human and wildlife, wildlife to vehicle contact, which frankly will lead to both wildlife and human death. This includes panthers. Um, if there is any disbelief, drive along any road and count the number of dead wildlife. I truly feel if these roads all go through, there will be great Thank unfixable you, Nicole, for your comment. Time's up. We appreciate your Thank comment. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Up next is Herman Younger from Gainesville, Florida. Herman, you are unmuted. Hello, my name is Herman Younger. I'm an organizing representative for the Sierra Club. Task Force members, FDOT has failed to show need, provide information required by SB 7068, and implement a decision-making process that is consistent with the Florida Constitution. To sign on to any consensus agreement is to validate and be complicit in the sham process. Remember, you are tasked to represent the public and the vast majority of Floridians who have commented publicly and are vehemently opposed to MCORs. And what meaning do the guiding principles hold when FDOT has fabricated reasoning for this multi-billion dollar project? You should know that encouraging Floridians to try and outrun a hurricane is contrary to the state's emergency management guidelines. This is just one of many examples of how FDOT has continued to deceive you and the public with fallacies meant to protect a project curated by private interests. I believe your hearts are in the right place and you wish to perform your duties as task force members with your constituencies in mind. But the only ethical, financial, and env environmentally sound thing to do is recommend no build. I urge you, please do not sign on to any consensus agreement. Your stamp of approval on a disastrous and overwhelmingly unpopular multi-billion dollar toll road project will forever be written in history. Choose to be on the right side of history and reject any consensus agreement on MCORS. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Youngen, Younger. Up next is Vivian Young of Tallahassee, Florida. Vivian, you are unmuted. Thank you so much. Uh, this is Vivian Young with 1000 Friends of Florida, and it's been a very informative discussion today. I'd like to raise a couple of points uh, with you. First, we urge you to further address the issue of sprawl, which could have very significant impacts on natural resources, as well as rural character and economic vitality. As discussed today, interchanges can serve as a major stimulus for sprawl, which is harmful both for local businesses and economies. New shopping centers at interchanges compete directly with existing local businesses, and providing services for new housing actually is an overall drain on local government coffers. Additionally, the MCOR statute holds the planning process to a higher legal standard. It requires that natural resources be protected and rural communities be revitalized. To this end, we sent a series of PD&E recommendations to you last week. The first recommendation is to meet the MCOR statutory language to protect natural resources from both the direct and indirect impact of MCORs by protecting through purchase easements or acquisition, 
critical conservation lands within 10 miles of each planned interchange before construction starts. Our second recommendation to help accomplish the MCOR's statutory requirement to revitalize community also calls for the protection of certain lands at new interchanges prior to construction. Also, we believe that any new future interchanges should require a higher level of review by the Florida legislature. The second major issue I'd like to talk, relate, talk about relates to determining need and financial feasibility. A fundamental problem with MCORS is that it bypassed the three-step Florida, Florida corridor planning process first established by Governor Jeb Bush in the early 2000s. The first phase includes a requirement for a preliminary determination of need and financial feasibility. And the third phase is the PD&E process, which is where DOT is anticipating doing that determination of need. But what happens under MCORS if tens of millions of dollars are spent on planning to find out that the roads are neither not needed or are not financially feasible according to state statute? We suggest that the task force recommend a guiding principle that the preliminary, preliminary quarter planning a review of needed feasibility be conducted before moving ahead on the PD&E. We appreciate the inclusion of some of 1,000 Friends recommended language on lines 433 to 437 of the draft task report. However, additional language was added to consider the potential for additional population and economic growth. Yes, that this sentence be removed and is as clearly intended to accommodate sprawl that the initial language was intended to Thank avoid. You, Thank you. Comment. Time's up. Thank you. Up next is Adrian Barman from Tallahassee, I'm sorry, Hollywood, Florida. Adrian, you are unmuted. All right, so you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Yes, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I listened to uh, yesterday's meeting and as well as today's, and I learned a lot about our beautiful state and what can get impacted by this project. I'm against the entire project. And today I'm talking about the North section. I'm against that too. Um, we, we really need to understand, and also I want to let you know, I'm from the Broward Sierra Club. So we need to understand what will be Mr. Farman, it sounds, like, well, it sounds like you're having the Broward Sierra Clubs, these words of protect and preserve, they come from my heart. I grew up on the You hear me? Hello? Yes, ma'am. You were having Hello? some you're having some difficulties. Hello, you hear me? Yes, ma'am. We can hear you clear. Go ahead. You hear me now? Is this better? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm so sorry. All right, so I, I don't know if you heard me. Yes, I'm from the Broward Sierra Club and the words protect and preserve come from my heart. I live in South Florida. I could tell you what overpopulation is and, and what has happened to the Florida, the waterways of South Florida. We really need to think about when we're building these roads that we really don't need and that really need to go under a lot more investigation before you, you start to plan them, what the impact is gonna be on the environment. We, we have so much infrastructure right now that needs improvement. Look at Biscayne Bay and what happened there. There was too much building, too many roads, too much dumping of pesticides, and now the bay is, has no life in it. I really hope that you consider really thinking through and, and, and understanding what 99% of the people I'm hearing on this phone call um, are saying. They, they really don't want this and to just improve on the existing infrastructure, widening I-75, raising it in the areas where there could be flood zones. Please listen to these words, protect and preserve what is left and, and, and just improve what remains. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Barman. Up next is Neil Fleckenstein. Neil, you are unmuted. You're self-muted. Mr. Fleckenstein, you are unmuted, but you are self-muted. Okay, is that better? 
Yes, sir, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Neil Fleckenstein, uh, Tall Timbers Research Station. Uh, first, just wanted to thank DOT uh, and all their staff uh, and Secretary Evans for their hard work on this project. Um, we know it's been a, a very, very heavy lift that you didn't ask for. Um, in terms of reviewing the guiding principles, uh, one area that uh, that's lacking, and I think uh, Janet uh, Bowman mentioned this, is a principle that's focused specifically on financial feasibility. Um, the direction from DOT states that the guiding principles are, are values that guide decision making related to a transportation corridor and clearly stating the importance of the fiscal reality of a project that's this expensive um, and the fiscal constraints that the state is facing is, is vitally important, especially in a project that's intended to meet so many demonstrated or so many stated needs. Um, the guiding principle on resilience, um, I think it's important to go beyond uh, just uh, considering vulnerability to risks like surge and sea level rise and instead evaluate locations based on actually avoiding uh, areas that are vulnerable. Um, and I think you noted categories one through three, I would argue that especially these days that should be expanded to categories one through one through five. Um, one of the guiding principles on the natural environment, um, or a guiding principle on natural environment, one thing we recommend is uh, moving the Florida Forever acquired lands and the managed conservation lands, importantly, both public and private, and moving them from the no new roads through category to the will not impact category. Uh, we've looked at all of the acquisitions uh, going back the last 25 or 30 years uh, in the state in that uh, study area. It's more than $418 million in taxpayer money spent, and there was never the intention of those lands being conserved and having roads run through them. So I think it's important that we move both the public lands and the private conservation lands into that, uh, into that will not impact category. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the draft report, um, in the section uh, specifically on infrastructure, I was really surprised that there's no mention whatsoever of US-19 which is the primary north and south highway through the study area. Uh, obviously, there was no mention of how underutilized it is uh, as well. So I think uh, that, that doesn't really provide an accurate picture of the roadway transportation system unless we, unless we include that reference to US-19 and, and frankly, the lack of use on that road. Um, finally, in the section on high-level needs, uh, according to the statute, the task force is responsible for evaluating the need for and the impacts of the corridor. I'd ask the task force to consider if you've been provided clear and compelling information demonstrating the actual transportation need for the road. Has adequate data been provided to outline that need? And if not, I think it's appropriate to note that in the final report. Thank you, Mr. Fleckenstein, for your comment. Up next is Jimmy Carell from Ocala, Florida. Jimmy, you are unmuted. You're self-muted. Jimmy Carell, you are unmuted. You are self-muted. Okay, I'm there. Are you? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, within uh, the conversation today, there's been considerable talk about protection protecting the rural lands and farmlands uh, using the various programs that are available and the dollars that have never been uh, allocated or budgeted to uh, conserve lands. Um, when you take that into consideration as well as the legislation, uh, recent legislation the, uh, that uh, restricts the um, purviews of local governments and citizens to bring suit against developers uh, further restricts what locals can do. Um, in terms of the farmland preservation areas in Marion County, we've seen pressures develop to move the boundaries to make the area different, uh, to put highways through it. Um, so if you were going for, uh, to protect farmlands, farm preservation areas, you're going to have to find better protection methods to do that. Uh, what can uh, farmers bring to the table? Well, they can bring a one acre of wetlands that will percolate 
more water into the aquifer than you could ever dream of. Um, we look at uh, MCORs and we look at the uh, the proposed cross Florida highway to Jacksonville, which there was no uh, solution found. I think that's going to happen uh, with MCORs also. If we're talking multimodal, you're going to have to procure considerable more um, land for easements. If you're thinking rail, anything of uh, multimodal. Uh, for the more uh, populated areas, are you going to look at uh, uh, carpool lanes, for example, uh, dedicated lanes for different purposes, so forth and so on. Um, I think at this point, uh, there are still gaps and uh, holes that need to be filled, and I will provide some more comments uh, in writing, but these are just a few of my observations at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carell, for your comment. Up next is Kristen Rubin from High Springs, Florida. Kristen, you are unmuted. You are self-muted. Kristen, you are unmuted, but you are self-muted. If you'll unmute, unmute. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Excellent. I represent our Santa Fe River in Fort White. And since the first task force meeting in Tampa last year, nothing has changed in regards to what the citizens of Florida that have commented on your website want, which is no build no toll roads. And the reasons are simple. Unnecessary destruction to environment, encompassing the waters we need to have sustainability to live, to farm. Unnecessary permanent damage to our flora and fauna. Unnecessary roads for broadband. Use existing roads and utility, utilities. Unnecessary sprawl, which brings ruin to the landscape for rural and agricultural areas and kills the small towns and communities. Unnecessary use of funds, which could be better used to rebuild and repair our existing roads and bridges. You can have as many guiding principles as you want, but why not make one of them listening to the citizens of Florida that do not want these roads? Make that a guiding principle. There are thousands of us that are saying no build. We're asking you to listen to us. You can use monies for repair and rebuilding that won't have anything near the negative impact that these roads will have physically and fiscally. You can use existing roads and utilities. You can use monies to improve sewage and septic tanks. You can create jobs with solar and money for education. We don't need more toll roads. Please do not sign onto any consensus agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rubin. Up next, we're circling back to Ginny Welch. Ginny, you are unmuted. You're self-muted. I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hello? Okay. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Um, I had a, a couple of comments. Um, one is what is really happening with our public comments other than them being cataloged and organized because they're not being used for the guiding principles and they're not being used in the design of the roads, these toll roads. And there has been little to no discussion about wildlife crossings for the Sun Coast portion of the toll roads. These rural, this rural area has abundant wildlife that needs to be protected by wildlife corridors. And I found it uh, disappointing to hear so many task force members that are against the corridor advisory group. A uh, different way to look at the advisory group is a way of building on what the task force has already done. So I found that disappointing that no one, that so many were against it. And when it comes to hurricane evacuation, so much importance 
has been put on the importance of hurricane evacuation and using Hurricane Irma as a reference. When Charlie Francis and Jean hit, I-75 was a parking lot, yet there has been no, no, nothing done about I-75. No widening, no nothing. So I find it curious that one storm, Irma, is being used to pursue this road to nowhere. Um, and one of the, when you were discussing the hurricane evacuations, one of the main reasons people do not go to shelters is because shelters do not take pets. I will not evacuate because I have four cats and a dog. There's nowhere for me to take them to a shelter. So when you, commissioners, when you are deciding which shelters to open and where and what to do with, with people, realize that, that many people will not go to a shelter because they, the shelters do not take their pets. That's it, thank you. Okay, hey, that concludes our public comment virtually. Now we'll go to our locations. All right, we'll start first with uh, Crystal River. Uh, Crystal River public viewing location, plantation at Crystal River. Good afternoon, Greg, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hey, hey, good afternoon, Greg. Yeah, this is Ron in uh, the plantation on Crystal River. We've really enjoyed the uh, the productive and great conversation today. And we have uh, no members of the public that have registered to speak. So, Greg, back to you. All right, thanks, Ron. Um, all right, now we're going to go to our second public viewing location in Dixie County. Um, and so, uh, David, if you could introduce our speaker there. Yes, I will. We had six people that attended today and were great at listening. And we have Ginger Spinard who wants to make a public comment. Ginger. Okay. I'm speaking for members, uh, for a number of our, my friends and, and neighbors who couldn't make it here today. We live in beautiful rural county, Dixie County. I am voicing our opposition to the planned MCOR toll road, even though I have a feeling it will go through no matter what we citizens say. Some of our concerns, where will the road go through Dixie County? Some people say it will parallel US 1998, just a few miles north and east of, north and east of US 1998 and north of the Cross City Airport. Others say it will go much further east and barely across the northeast corner of Dixie County. If it goes through uh, Cross City, it will be just a few miles outside of Cross City. How will we who live north of Cross City cross the toll road and get into town? How will the people whose property is divided get to their land? In the early 1960s, my uncle's farm in Kansas was divided by I-75. He had to go miles out of his way to get to his fields on the other side of the highway. Is this gonna to happen to our farmers and just people who want to get from one place to the other here in Dixie? How will the property owners be compensated for the land and homes that will be used, how compensated for the land and homes that will be confiscated for the toll road? Who decides what fair market value is? As for bringing jobs and business to Dixie County, what, that will not happen. Once people get on the toll road, they will sail right down or up to their destination. If they need gas or food, they will stop at the service plazas on the toll road. That's certainly not what I've done when I've traveled, that certainly is what I have done when I've traveled the turnpike. Just look at all the small rural counties the turnpike goes through. They have not prospered as we've been told we will. There are no warehouses or distribution centers, et cetera. The toll road will hurt Dixie County economy and what drop by tour, little drop by tourism we currently have. Why isn't the, why, when will we be, uh, why isn't this monetary expenditure being put to a vote to the citizens of Dixie, of Florida, Florida citizens? Thank you for at least listening to our concerns. 
and listen to those great people of the state of Florida who do not want this toll road. And by the way, we only had three days notice of this meeting through, through the email. Thank you, bye-bye. Greg, that ends our public comments. And yeah, thank you, Ms. Benhart. All right. Thank you, David. All right, this concludes the public comment segment for this meeting. I want to thank everyone who uh, provided comments today for taking the time and speaking about this important topic. Uh, public input is uh, vital to the MCORF program, and comments can be submitted uh, anytime to fdot.listens at dot.state.fl.us, and will become part of the public record. I'd like to also thank the task force members for participating and uh, receiving public comments today. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and that concludes this meeting. Thank you.